Hi, I'm Kim Kardashian. For the last several years, I have been digging into a 1994 triple homicide case in Bucyrus, Ohio, the case of Kevin Keith. This case is complex, with many twists and turns, and the story has opened my eyes to the intricacies and pitfalls of the U.S. justice system. At its center is a man who believes to this day in his brother's innocence and a tight-knit community that was ripped apart. You will have questions about this story and may even question me as the one to tell it, but I encourage you to listen. I hope you find it equally as eye-opening as I have. This is The System. The System contains adult content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. casings. In this room we have shards of glass. Boy, we have a blood spot on the floor. Blood spots all over in front of the door. We enter the living room area. In this room we have two bodies. One against the wall, which has been tentatively identified as Linda Chapman. Her top is resting on the feet of another body laying on its front, which has been tentatively identified as Marcella Chapman. There were four other people shot, three of them children. 30-year-old Kevin Keith was arrested at his home in Crestline, halfway between Bucyrus and Mansfield. He is charged with three counts of murder for allegedly killing three members of the Chapman family, including a four-year-old girl. Kevin, you're accused of heinous crimes. Children were shot. Did you do this? No, I didn't, Tanya. I love kids. I could never commit a crime like this. Never. Never. When I talked to you on the phone, you didn't seem nervous, but you look nervous now. You look scared now. Are you sure it's him and you do know why you're not telling? Well, I didn't go to bed last night worried that we had the wrong man. Not at all. Not at all. I don't know that we've got the only man involved, but I'm very confident that we've made a good arrest here. Kevin, you know, do you find it kind of strange that the police haven't questioned me at all about this? What do you think about it? I think it's a frame. They're just trying to speed everything up so the media don't catch up. They're relying merely upon the fact that it was a large black man that they saw in the project area and then being shown pictures of Kevin and a person saying, yeah, that's the person I saw that night. If that's the information they're relying on, that's not too accurate. Three others shot at the South Bucyrus apartment did not die. And now our sources say the survivors, all three of them, have identified Kevin Keith as the gunman. I don't believe he did it. He ain't never been in no trouble like this before, so I don't believe he did it. Do you know who shot? No. I don't know who I did. He was gathering something. You're sure? Is there any doubt in your mind at all?
Hey, how you doing? Hey, Kevin. How are you? Good. Good to see you again. I haven't seen you in a while. It's been a while. I know. How are you? You look great. I'm doing good. Thank you. Yep, I'm doing good. Good, good. I'm so glad they're letting us do this. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. The voice you're hearing right now is Kevin Keith's. At the time of this video call, Kevin is sitting in the Marion Correctional Institution. He's been in prison for the last 28 years. Last time I talked to you, you were, um, I got to meet some of your friends. Right. <laughs> and um, you got to meet some of my sisters. Right. Well, I've been uh, pretty much, you know, doing what I do, and that's programs, mentoring and things like that. Just try to get guys in the right direction and um, keep myself in a good place and that's pretty much my comfort zone when i'm busy and helping yeah. guys out being that shoulder uh, that's pretty much it kevin was convicted of a triple homicide in bucyrus ohio in 1994. Well, i don't get that chance to really talk to anybody because i got to be that guy for so many people my mom i got to be that you know, a guy for family, I gotta be that guy for inmates. I'm just that guy, okay? So I, I go outside and walk the yard sometimes. I'm talking to God, I'm like, God, I just need a minute, okay? I just need one minute. Over the last few decades, Kevin has tried numerous times to get his case reevaluated. But that's what it is, so, you know, I gotta bear that. That's why I'm really hopeful with this podcast just to get your story out there, because I think it's so important for people to understand that just our system is so fucked up. What else can we do? We can just get the story out there and you know, hope that, that, you know, it gives people, um, you know, I don't, I don't know, Kim, right? I'm, I'm just tired. <laughs> I'm at that point to yeah. where I'm tired, and so, I don't know. The case of Kevin Keith and the Bucyrus Estates is deeply twisted and incredibly heartbreaking from all sides. But before I tell you about this case, let me explain why you're hearing it from me. I did the show Family Feud a few years back. And one of the producers came up to me and said that he had a case. People always ask me like, oh my God, do you have a second? Like, I want to talk to you about this case of like a family member or someone that's really close to them. And one of the producers came up to me and they pitched me Kevin Keith's case. It's being described as one of the worst murder cases in Bucyrus history. Six people were gunned down, two died instantly, and a third died less than an hour after the incident. Keith is charged with three counts of aggravated murder, which carry death penalty specifications, and three counts of attempted murder. He said from the beginning he's innocent. I've only been on the case about a year. It really spoke to me. The whole situation sucks, and I, I just don't feel like he was given a fair shot. Sometimes it's like, I, I sound like I'm bullshitting you. Like, I, like I, this is the reason why I'm so passionate about the case. It's like unbelievable to think that all of this exists in a file somewhere. And how come I'm the one looking through it? It's like, no, look at it with me. I'm not, <laughs> I'll show it to you too. I met Lori through the producer at Family Feud. My name is Lori Rothschild, and I am a television producer, and I specialize in true crime television. And so she came over with a huge notebook of details and information all about the case. It seems like she knew this case in and out better than any investigator I've ever met. And so when I sat down with her, I was so into it, and I asked her if I could keep her notebook, which was like her prized possession. Let me just pull this really quick. It's... uh a labor of love, this thing. And I just said, like, can I keep it through the weekend so I can just read through all of the evidence? I really want to like dig into this case. And she left it with me and I gave it back to her on the Monday and I was like, I'm in. I mean, it's still a work in progress. So I think it's six years of paperwork that has been accumulated in this binder. 
There has been so much work put into this. There's been so many people that have tried to help Kevin. I create these big binders to help me because there's so many small details, especially, you know, as an investigation happens. Looking at a police report, if you, if you read it in a linear fashion from top to bottom, page to page, you think you're getting all the information from it, right? But it's like, when did they say that is really important in a case like this. You have to follow the dates, not just the police reporting, but following the dates on all the reports to actually create the timeline for you to be able to see where the mistakes have been made. This timeline sounds straightforward at first, but the deeper we go, the more the reported events of February 13th are called into question. Pay attention to what's said here, because it's the backbone of the case. These details will come up later, and not everyone has the same story. The night before Valentine's Day 1994 in the town of Bucyrus, Ohio, a man approached apartment 1712B of the Bucyrus Estates complex sometime between 8.45 and 9 p.m. Six people were there that night in the apartment. Marichelle Chapman, her four-year-old daughter, Marche, and her boyfriend, Richard Warren, who had been living with her for the past few weeks. Marichelle was also babysitting her younger cousins that night, seven-year-old Juanita Reeves and four-year-old Quentin Reeves. Around 8.45 p.m., Marichelle's aunt, Linda Chapman, stopped by to pick up Quinita and Quentin on behalf of their mom, Joyce Reeves. Shortly after this time, a man started lingering around the door of the Chapman's apartment. Richard Warren opened the door, and the man asked to speak to Linda. Linda let him inside. The man engaged in some brief small talk about the basketball game on TV. Then he asked for a glass of water, which Linda got for him. Richard Warren described the man as having a turtleneck pulled up to his nose, covering his mouth. Warren reported that the man drank the glass of water through the fabric. After finishing the glass, the man pulled a gun out of the plastic bag he was carrying. He ordered everyone to get on the floor. Marichelle pleaded with the man not to hurt them, to which he responded with something along the lines of, well, you should have thought about this before your brother started ratting on people. Then. The armed man opened fire into the small apartment and fled the scene. Richard Warren, though wounded, was able to stand and make a run for it. He ran towards a nearby restaurant named Ike's, screaming for help. The gunman fired at Richard again outside, striking him once more and causing him to fall onto the snow. In her first statement to the police, a neighbor named Nancy Smathers reported seeing a large, stocky black male leave the home in a hurry and get into a light cream-colored car. The man revved the engine and peeled out, attempting to leave quickly. However, Smathers said he quickly lodged the car in a snowbank. Smathers reported seeing him rock back and forth to shake the car free from the snow before speeding away successfully. Smathers said the man she witnessed wore dark clothing, a winter coat, and a hat. She stated that his face was not covered, but she couldn't make out any discernible details. Richard Warren, bleeding from his multiple gunshot wounds, finally reached the nearby restaurant, Ike's. At 9.06 p.m., a 911 call was placed. Richard Warren was rushed to the emergency department of Grant Medical Center, while Juanita, Quentin and Marche were brought to the Children's Hospital. 39-year-old Linda Chapman and 24-year-old Marichelle Chapman were pronounced dead at the scene. Four-year-old Marche Chapman died later that night at the hospital. Police Chief Joe Barron says a single gunman opened fire on the little girl and two women in their apartment complex Sunday night. The shooting, which occurred around 9 p.m., also left three others wounded. I looked inside and I just seen the bodies laying on the floor, two inside, one to the right and one to the left, and the two smaller bodies, one in front of the couch, bent back, and the other one on its side over towards the TV. There was no movement or nothing. It just made me sick when I opened that door, seeing them little kids. Two days later, 
Kevin Keith was arrested at his fiancé's home in Crestline, Ohio and taken into custody. He was charged with three counts of aggravated murder, as well as three counts of attempted aggravated murder. Kevin Keith was never questioned by the police. The protesters lined the sidewalk in front of the Crawford County Courthouse to show their support for Kevin Keith, charged with murdering a Bucyrus family on February the 13th. Kevin Keith's trial began on May 10th of 1994, only three months later. This is unbelievably and concerningly fast for a capital murder trial. Kevin was represented by defense attorney James Banks. Banks had never worked on a capital murder case before. Keith is charged with three counts of aggravated murder, which carry death penalty specifications, and three counts of attempted murder. He said from the beginning he's innocent. Keith, who was accompanied by defense counsel James Banks of Columbus, maintains his innocence and claims its mistaken identity. Uh, how would they come up with something like that then? I don't have any idea. Fair of me to say who you think did all this? I, didn't have, I wouldn't have any idea who would do something like this, especially in this area. You know, I would take somebody who was crazy, and I don't know anybody like that around here that would hurt those kids. There was lack of physical evidence presented during trial that explicitly linked Kevin Keith to the crime, such as forensic evidence or a weapon. Defense attorney James Banks said the state lacks evidence, including the murder weapon. They searched the apartment where the crime was committed, they considered fingerprints, they considered glass samples, fiber samples, and yet not one piece of evidence was retrieved that would point to Kevin Keith. The trial lasted two weeks. Presiding Judge Nelford Kimmerlein will give the jury as long as it needs to reach a verdict in the Kevin Keith murder trial in Bucyrus. Otherwise, you can go for as long as you want to. We're certainly not pushing you to arrive at a decision. Kevin's friends and family expressed concern that the jury selected was all white, especially considering that the key witness, surviving victim Richard Warren, was also white. In fact, Richard Warren was the only victim that wasn't black. Heath's family and friends are still professing his innocence, and some are questioning the decision of an all-white jury. We're very hurt. Banks presented a good case. I don't think they heard, they heard anything. I don't know what the jury heard, what they thought, but we know that this is a racist town. Keith's family chanted, we love you, Kevin, as he was led out of the courtroom and back to the Crawford County Jail, where he's been since his arrest February 15th. If convicted, Keith could die in the electric chair. For Kevin's friends and family, the outcome was the worst imaginable. His execution day is said, how do you feel? We expected how do I look? We expected all this. This is the voice of Kevin's older brother, Charles Keith, Kevin's biggest advocate. And it seems like we went back to Warren's testimony to sink him. When the prosecutor himself said, indeed, he, Warren, cannot identify Kevin with certainty. Now, how can he remember a speech? You're talking about fabrication. They lied. Everybody that got up on that stand and testified lied. And everybody that was in there listening knew that, even including to Judge Kimmelow. Russ, did you expect the outcome today to be what it was? Uh, no, I expected it because there was, no, there was no mitigating factors present in the case. This is Russell Wiseman, the prosecutor who presented the state's case against Kevin. And uh, given the, the manner in which the crime was carried out, the motive for the crime, and the lack of any explanation uh, for, uh, you know, or excuse, I, I really wasn't surprised. Like I say, I, I don't take any joy in these kind of cases. I wish it had never happened, but under Ohio law, I think the jury made the right decision. Keith's execution date is February 13th, 1995, the one-year anniversary of the slayings. Reporting for WMFD, I'm Rhonda Davis. The 
The court ultimately ruled that Kevin should serve the death penalty for the three murder convictions and also serve a seven to 25 year prison term for each of the attempted aggravated murder convictions. Of course, he wouldn't finish serving that time before he was executed. As Kevin sat on death row, he watched his petitions and appeals be continuously denied by the court system. Eventually, he fired his lawyers and took the case upon himself for a while. His brother, Charles, helped investigate. In 2007, Kevin sought new representation in Rachel Troutman, assistant state public defender. In 2010, the year of Kevin's scheduled execution, Troutman petitioned for clemency. Only a higher governmental power could change Kevin's fate and now it rested in the hands of Ohio Governor Ted Strickland. State defense attorneys say new evidence clears him. The Ohio Parole Board must recommend and Governor Strickland must grant clemency for Mr. Keith. Any other result would be irreversible, sickening, and a tragic mistake. Keith's brother Charles helped deliver 10,000 signatures to Governor Ted Strickland Tuesday, urging him to stop next month's planned execution. Finally, Governor Strickland commuted Kevin's death sentence only 13 days before Kevin was scheduled to be executed. Now, Kevin is serving a life sentence at the Marion Correctional Institution. In other words, though Kevin narrowly escaped capital punishment, he is facing life in prison, and in his mind, it's another slower death sentence. Today, Kevin's legal team is preparing to file for clemency for parole, a process in which a higher authority, in this case, the Ohio governor, Mike DeWine, would be considering Kevin's case for a reduced sentence or reinstated rights. Kevin Keith, his family, and his legal team are hoping for a pardon, a commutation to time served, which would release him immediately, or at the very least, the possibility of parole. This case actually is the very first case I ever opened as a wrongful conviction that I ever even considered to be a part of. Again, this is Lori Rothschild. It crossed my desk through another case I was working on. I remember my friend saying, you should look into the case of Kevin Keith. Do you know the Kevin Keith case? And I said, I don't, I don't know. It's a wrongful conviction case. I thought in my mind, well, everyone says they're innocent. And how hard is it to prove that someone actually didn't commit a crime? They were convicted by a jury of their peers. You know, this is the system that I believed in because I came from a law enforcement family. I think the first piece of information that I saw was that a local Cleveland magazine had done an article on Kevin Keith. In this article, they talk about another person being paid to commit this crime. And, and the police knew about it. In me just looking into that part of it, it started the twist of all of the other things that were so wrong with this case. And I also realized that that information about that other person being paid to commit the crime didn't come out until like 2007. Kevin was convicted and the crime happened in 94. And that's how he got his clemency. Why didn't they give him life with parole? You're just basically leaving someone in prison to die. Was someone paid to commit this crime? I was intrigued by this. Like Lori said, that information didn't surface until 2007, over 10 years after the crime took place. We'll get into the alternative suspects later, but there's a lot of ground we should cover first. Hello. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi, Kim. Um, Hi. Okay, so I have another case that I want you guys to look at and see what you think. It's a case in Bucyrus, Ohio, and it's about Kevin Keith, who was sentenced to death for a triple homicide. A family was involved. I have read over all of the evidence his sentence was commuted, so he um, was relieved of the actual death penalty pretty close. Right now, you're hearing me discuss Kevin Keith's case with my personal legal team, which includes attorneys Aaron Haney and Jessica Jackson. 
These are the two same attorneys that I worked with on my first wrongful conviction case that I took on, the Alice Johnson case. And she was in prison, a life sentence without the possibility of parole for a nonviolent drug offense that was her first offense. When I looked at it, I just didn't understand how their first time nonviolent drug offense got the same exact sentence as Charles Manson. Like that to me didn't make sense. And I thought, okay, there's something wrong with our system. So I sent the video to one of my attorneys, Sean Hawley, who actually was an attorney on the OJ case with my dad and we always stayed connected. We looked into it and I thought, well, what can I do? Who can change us? Everyone told me that the president, that Donald Trump was the only one that can commute her sentence and give her a pardon. And so I was advised um, by a friend to call Ivanka and she connected me with her husband, Jared Kushner, who reviewed the case, looked it all over, brought it to the president. And within a few months, we got her sentence commuted. After more than 20 years behind bars, this was Alice Marie Johnson's first full day of freedom. She was released from federal prison in Alabama late yesterday after President Trump commuted her life sentence on a drug conviction. Mr. Trump tweeted today, good luck to Alice Johnson. Have a wonderful life. I'm feeling no handcuffs, mm. nothing on me. I'm free to hug my family. That was just like unheard of that we were able to get that done. And I couldn't just stop at that. I saw how successful we were with that. And I want to just do more. So I figured like Alice was the face to show people, hey, like it's okay if we let people out. See, she's a sweet, great grandmother that like would never harm anybody. And to me, that put the face on reform and why people deserve to be out. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that it would be Kim Kardashian who would take my calls on. In prison yesterday, she got a call. It was Kardashian West. When she said home, just that word, I could go home now. I started screaming and jumping. And... So he he has, I think, right, life without parole, though, right? Yeah. Wasn't that that what they commuted yeah. it to? Which yeah. would mean he would never get a chance to be free. Um, yes. So part of what you're doing, it sounds like, is trying to get enough attention and support so that he would have a chance at justice and freedom. Recording this all, interviewing him, his brother, ev anyone that would talk to us on the other side, all sides, and creating a podcast. Maybe from hearing this, someone will come forward, maybe just by publicizing this. reason to be on the outside right now okay i mean and think think about this this is what haunts me okay this is what haunts me this is where my demons come in is the fact that i could have been executed mm -hmm. in 2010 mm -hmm. september 15th my attorneys rachel and my attorneys came up with all this information a lot of this new information after the fact now they came up with a lot of information before that you would have thanked the court the judicial system would have said wait a minute let's put the brakes on this okay well, okay we'll give them that but since then they've come up with all this information that the state was using against me to prove my innocence and i'm still sitting here so that's the judicial system for me i know and that's the case for so many people and it's so unfair and it like infuriates me i mean i i, I it, I can only imagine how you feel, and I can't even begin to put myself in your shoes. I just didn't think that you could be made a victim by the judicial system. I didn't know the judicial system would actually create a victim. Like, it seems like it's stuff that just happens in the movies. Like, you really don't think exactly. that it's a reality. Exactly. Um, and especially when it's clear. It's just, they, they broke everything down, they exposed everything. I'm still sitting here 28 years later. I probably only told one person and used this word that I'm innocent. And um, the reason for that is because, you know, people don't want to hear 
this person from the outside, they don't want to hear it, but they figure like every inmate running around is innocent. That's what they think. But that ain't the reality of the situation. There's not too many guys I've met over the years say they was innocent. But I say that to say that I can't approach young people and encourage them with the narrative of I'm a victim, even though I'm a victim. Because in order for me to reach them, I could not complain. This is what I mean by sometimes I'm overwhelmed because I have to go with the responsibility. I talk a lot of times to recovery service while I volunteer at and chair meetings and things like that. And so the first thing I do is I take responsibility because I teach this one program called Boyhood to Manhood. And this is a rites of passage program. And so six of the principles that we stress to the guys is, is authority, responsibility, envy, sexual temptations, repentance, and courage. Those are the six principles. And so with those principles right there, I got to stand on those principles and always go back to me. And because of my generation, a lot of young guys that I'm talking about locked up in prison, their fathers are my age. Mm-hmm. So we kind of dropped the ball on these young guys. So the first thing I had to do coming out the box, I got to take responsibility for myself and for their fathers. So now they got a connection because a lot of them didn't have that. So now when they look at me, I don't want them to see a victim. I want them to see somebody that made some bad choices over his life, okay? Taking responsibility for those choices and uh, moving forward. You've heard a lot of pretty unbelievable things about this case by now. How there was a lack of physical evidence, how the jury may have been stacked against Kevin, how a report surfaced later and highlighted another potential suspect, and that's just scratching the surface. There are a lot of details that haven't been available to the general public, and that's my goal, to make sure that you can all hear the facts and make your own determination. Because sometimes, our system is not as trustworthy as we're led to believe. We'll get into all of these topics and more during this podcast. But as I said before, this case is not black and white, and there's more than one side to this story. Talk about them. I talk about them all the time. I talk about them to my friends, how much I miss them, you know, and a lot of the good times we had together and stuff. And that I wish, I just wish they were still here. This is Damon Chapman, victim Marichelle Chapman's brother. When I heard about it, somebody called me, maybe called me or texted me, I don't know, but, and I, they was like, I think there was a shooting at there out there in the United States. And we was like, oh, we're on our way over there now. As soon as we get over there, we see all the police over there by my sister's house. So we run in there. The police tried to stop me from going in the apartment. They wasn't stopping me. I go in there. My sister was laying beside my aunt, and my niece was running up. This, she was running up the steps. She was face down, face down on the steps with two shots in her back. I mean, I would, I'll never forget it. Never. Me and my cousin Charles, London's son, knew who did it as soon as we walked in there. We knew it. We both looked at each other once they made us come outside, and me and Charles looked at each other and was like, Kevin did this. And we knew it. We knew Kevin did it. I'm Kim Kardashian, and this is The System. The System is a Spotify original series produced in partnership with Big City TV and Tenderfoot TV. I'm Kim Kardashian, your host and executive producer. From Big City TV, executive producer is Lori Rothschild and Saldi. From Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Lead creative producer is Meredith Stedman. Production, editing, and sound design by Tristan Bankston and Cameron Taggy. Additional sound design by Cooper Skinner. Production manager is Tracy Kaplan. Music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Voiceover work by Miles Ag. Associate producer producer is Jamie Albright, mixed and mastered by Cooper Skinner and Devin Johnson. The system contains adult content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised.
that at the time I got arrested, I was home watching TV. My fiance, she was lingering around the house and she said she looked out the window and she said she saw a bunch of police officers. So I was headed actually toward the door to open the door up and when they kicked it in. And the first thing that went through my mind was, okay, I'm getting arrested again for drugs, but I haven't sold any drugs since I got arrested and got out on bond. I thought I'd tell them with no drugs in the house because I didn't want them tearing the house up. Because I know how my partner felt about that. And actually, when they kicked it around and broke the door, I'm thinking about what she's going to say. So immediately they threw me down on the floor and roughed me up a little bit and put the cuffs on me. The rough up really didn't bother me. I was just more concerned about the door they just kicked in. I was going to open it for them, but they kicked it in. And so they put cuffs on me and I heard one of the officers say that I don't think it's him. Hey, I don't think it's him. They put me in another police car and uh, we headed off to Cyrus. I was in Crestline at the time, at the home I was living in. And on the way to the Cyrus County Jail, where they took me, eventually took me at, uh, the cop was still telling the other officer that, I don't think this is the guy, I don't think this is the guy. And so when they took me over to Cyrus and the courthouse, uh, I seen a lot of cameras, a lot of people. So the first thing went through my mind is, um, Okay, maybe I got arrested for something I don't know nothing about. And they take me over into county and started processing me. Nobody still told me anything. And then they took me across the street after the media gathered up again. You know, seeing media like I never saw. You know. Charged with murder and three counts of attempted murder. What do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> so they took me in there and, you know, I'm talking about a million dollars bond. And at that point, when they said a million dollars bond, believe me, me being naive, I kind of felt important. A million dollars bond? Okay, the guy is here, this, you know, and they really think I'm, you know, I was naive, I was 30 years old. When they took me back over, uh, but at that point, they told me what I was being charged with. You know, as soon as they told me what the charges was going to be, all of that I thought I was important went out the door. No, they had arrested me for this murder, and I had this unbelievable feeling. I'm Kim Kardashian, and this is The System. Kevin says he wasn't expecting the arrest at all, so much so that he was at home watching soap operas when the police kicked in his door. Supposedly, the police were even shocked to find Kevin there in such an unguarded state. And Kevin wasn't the only one taken by surprise. I was sitting in college in class one day and they were doing a roll call. And uh, the professor got to my name and he called out Keith, Charles Keith. This is Charles, Kevin's older brother. And somebody in the class says, hey, are you related to that guy that was on the news this morning? And I was inquisitive, what guy? 30-year-old Kevin Keith was arrested at his home in Crestline, halfway between Bucyrus and Mansfield. He is charged with three counts of murder for allegedly killing three members of the Chapman family, including a four-year-old girl. And he says, well, his name is Keith. He's from Crestline, Ohio. And when I heard Crestline, I knew it was my family because that's where I was born and raised. I knew the victims in this particular case. I had grown up with the victims, their family. Um, our family were very close knit at the time we were growing up. We played together, we played little league baseball. We all went to school together, high school, elementary, junior high. Uh, you know, they were family friends. There was no controversy. I mean, everybody was young. There wasn't a lot of a very large black population in Crestline. So yeah, everybody was more so family. 
I didn't see Kevin immediately after his arrest. Uh, I didn't see him for like maybe two or three weeks. Uh, there was a lot of things going on. I allowed the, the process to uh, take place. There was a lot of information I didn't have. So I didn't come on the scene as, you know, as the savior. I just wanted to know, you know what was going on and be there to support my brother. I didn't set out to prove his innocence. I just had to find out for myself how could they have found that my brother was guilty so that I could relay this information to my family. Uh, I wasn't convinced at all. I know Kevin's character. Me being the older brother, uh, we were without a father, so I was more so uh, the older brother father figure. Kevin was a jovial guy. He was more laid back, more of a goofy, silly type guy, you know, always laughing. He always had a joke. I can never even recall him being in a fight. Uh, now, if they'd have said that he was talking about somebody or said something about somebody, that would have been more believable. But the hostility, the violence of this magnitude, I knew that wasn't Kevin's demeanor at all. Uh, so when they came out and said that Kevin Keith had done this heinous crime, I knew in my heart right there he didn't do it. I knew he didn't do it. I mean, beyond a doubt. But again, you know, giving respect to the law and the investigation and what the police had, I had to at least pay attention to that. You know, show me, that's all I ask, show me where he's guilty. And, and I would have to walk away from this. Kevin was never interrogated. Uh, I didn't know that until I had talked to him. In fact, the newspapers had covered that. He was never asked, did he do it or did he not do it? Uh, I mean, the police never really sat him down to ask him one single question. He actually didn't even know that he was under arrest uh, for the murder. During this case, they never found any, any evidence uh, of any kind linking Kevin to the case. They checked for fingerprints. They checked blood fibers, they checked the carpet, they checked his clothes for glass fibers. I mean, anything that they could find. Uh, the BCI had stated that there was not anything to tie Kevin Keith physically to this case. He had four alibi witnesses placing him 30 minutes away from the crime scene. They had no physical evidence whatsoever. They found him guilty and he was given the death penalty. I'm willing to accept that he was found guilty, but no one ever proved to me that he did it. Show me that he did it, and I'll walk away. I'll leave it alone. At the end of the last episode, Damon Chapman, a relative of the victims, said he was sure Kevin did it. We knew Kevin did it. There's no doubt we knew it from the jump that Kevin did this. Kevin says he didn't do this crime. His brother Charles believes him. He says, Chuck, I didn't do this, man. He said, I did not do this. Charles mentioned that Kevin had an alibi witness that placed him 30 minutes away from the scene of the crime in Bucyrus, Ohio. The alibi is one of the most important things in a criminal case, particularly when there is a lack of forensic and physical evidence. Ask any defense attorney. Being able to prove that you were somewhere else during the crime is the strongest defense in the courtroom. So... Where was Kevin Keith on the night of February 13th, 1994? Here's Lori Rothschild again, a television producer and wrongful conviction advocate. Kevin has an alibi for that night. He has four witnesses attesting to it. His entire alibi is that earlier he drove Zena to work. His girlfriend's name is Zena. He called Zena his fiance because Kevin actually had another girlfriend named Melanie. So the fiance, even though the ring wasn't on the finger, gave Zena a little bit more status, if you would. So Zena, his fiance, went to work at the factory. She worked at the uh, GE plant in Bucyrus. He dropped her off using her car. She had a blue Dodge Dynasty. He dropped Zena off at work. And he said that he then went home, and then after that, at around 7 o'clock, he went to his girlfriend's house. His girlfriend's name is Melanie Davison, and she lived in Mansfield. He took Zena's Blue Dynasty and drove to his girlfriend's house. He said that he went to Melanie's house and that Melanie cooked him some dinner. 
two, I was always cooking. I had three children. So if I, I, I knew he was coming, it was just one of those things that happened. And I think it was Sunday. He was in her kitchen and they hung out and they had dinner and he specifically remembers standing in the kitchen looking out the window in her kitchen and seeing a drunk driver get pulled over. And he says, I remember this, you know, we were standing there watching because it was kind of funny, you know, it's like this guy, he gets pulled over for drunk driving and he knew it was drunk driving because the cops started putting bottles, all the bottles from the car on top of the car, you know, so they were watching it and the whole thing. And he referenced that the car had a number 10 on the top of it. I see that, I see this, well, he's standing right there and we see this car. He's standing right there. Okay. Next to you. Mm-hmm. And... He, was, he had his arms around me from behind, we were just standing there, and then all of a sudden it happened. We saw the lights, we saw the car, we saw, we saw the car 10, and we're just, we're just watching it. I looked up the police report on the possible drunk driver that was pulled outside of her house. I did a FOIA request for that. Not only did it happen, it was car number 10. They remembered it perfectly. How come none of that was ever listed, was ever brought up into Kevin's case? Never. She was discredited as a witness. What I remember about that night, living single, was uh, having their Valentine's finale show, something to that effect. And we got to choose the date that night. And we watched that with the kids. Living Single was huge back then. It's in 1994. You could actually call up and press a number and you could affect the end of the show. Like it was a call in. I don't remember this ever being done, so it was a big thing. And Living Single was, it was yeah. hot back in the day. Yeah. And this was just one of those things that I, okay, I'm just gonna say, if you were black, you wanted to be in front of the TV watching because it was positive and it was, it was us and it was, we had a say in it. I looked up what was on at 8.30 that night on February 13th, 1994 at 8.30 p.m. Living Single. And I will tell you, it was the Valentine's Day special. It's the exact episode she remembered. In fact, Melanie's downstairs neighbor, Judith Rogers, was also watching Living Single, which is how she knew what time she saw Melanie and Kevin leave the apartment. During Kevin's trial, Judith Rogers took the stand for questioning by Kevin's attorney, James Banks. What you're about to hear is a recreation pulled directly from the court transcript. Please state your name for the record. Judith Rogers. And Mrs. Rogers, where do you reside? In Mansfield. Do you know a Melanie Davison? Yes, sir, I do. And how do you know her? She lives up over me. I would like to bring your attention to the 13th of February, 1994. Do you recall that date? Yes, sir, I do. How do you recall that date? It was on Sunday, and I was, well, I was, I wanted to use the phone upstairs. So I went upstairs to use the phone, and Kevin opened the door and let me in. I went to call my mother about my older son being out, and I wanted to know why he wasn't in preparing for school. What time was this on Sunday? Approximately 8.30. In the evening? Yes, sir. And then what did you do with the rest of that evening? Well, I went back downstairs after I talked to my mother. And about 8.45, I seen Melanie and Kevin leaving because I was watching In the Living Color. You were watching A Living Color? It was Living Single. Do you know what time that comes on? Yes, sir. What time did it come on? At 8.30. Now, you said that you watched Melanie Davison and Kevin Keith leave? Yes, sir. Leave the apartment? Yes, sir, I did. And what time was that? About 8.45. neighbor, Judith Rogers, said she saw them both leave at 8.45, and she testified to that on the stand. So where were they going? 
he said that he wanted to go to his uncle's house, Jeannie Keith, in Crestline. They were in Mansfield at the time, and Crestline is about 30 minutes away from Mansfield. So he and Melanie got in the car, again, Xena's Blue Dynasty, and drove it to Crestline to go see his aunt and uncle who lived in Crestline, Jeannie and Gracie Keith, who are unfortunately have passed away since. His story is he goes in that he wanted to borrow some money, knocks on the door, walks in, and several people say, including Kevin and the witnesses that saw him there, his uncle, his aunt, a guy named Roy Price, who was also there at the time, along with his wife, Yolanda. They all place him there at nine o'clock at night. His aunt, Grace Keith, says he was there around nine, but can't be exactly sure what time it was. You're saying he was with you during the time of the killings? Um, I can't say that because I don't know what time it was, no more than what I've seen on the news and in the paper. That's all I know. Give us the exact times he was with you. Well, really, I didn't pay no attention to that part of it either. But he was at my house, maybe around <clears throat> 9 o'clock when my son said he came in and borrowed $5 dollars from him. His family says there's a lack of evidence in the case, and they're standing by Keith's alibi that he was in Crestline the night of the murders. Kevin was at, at my house at 9 o'clock. Because I was laying down on the bed watching TV. When he come in the door, I looked up at the clock on the VCR. It was 9 o'clock. He come in, he said, hi, Uncle Gene, what you doing? I said, oh, I'm laying here watching TV. And then he went on back in the room talking to my stepson. And he asked my stepson, could he borrow $5 from me? And he came in, knocked on the door, borrowed a couple dollars, chatted with them a little bit left Melanie outside in the car. And the reason why he left Melanie in the car is because his aunt and I believe Yolanda Price knew Zena. According to Yolanda Price, a friend of the Keith family, she was there at Kevin's uncle's house that night. Yolanda Price gave an affidavit stating that she saw Melanie that night in the front seat of the car waiting for Kevin. Lori interviewed Yolanda Price in 2020. Here's what she had to say. When we got over to Gracie's, I remember Kevin coming in. And I remember seeing the car, Zena's car sitting there. And Melanie was in it. Now, I had never met Melanie. So I kept seeing this other girl. I'm like, that's not her. That's, that's not Zena. So I found out she was, it was Melanie. And I remember the car very definitely because I knew Zena. We worked at the same place. So she had a dynasty, a light blue dynasty. And I remember distinctly that was Zena's car that I saw her in. I wasn't there that long before he came. He left out before I did. He went towards Mansfield. I remember I'm coming in asking Ward for five dollars to try to get some gas money up, real cheap back then, because he had to pick up Zena later on that night. That's all I, all I remember is I remember when they came and got Kevin. I was like, he didn't seem to be up to nothing. Very odd, very very odd. So he left Melanie outside, got back in the car with Melanie, and drove back to Mansfield because he had to be in Bucyrus at 11 to pick up Zena from work. So he gets in the car in Crestline and drives back to Mansfield another 30 minutes, around 9.45, 10 o'clock. He stays there for a little bit and then says to Melanie, I gotta go because he has from Mansfield to Bucyrus is another 35, 40 minutes. So he has to leave there to get to Bucyrus by 11 o'clock. And he does and witnesses have said that he picked up Zena from work at 11 o'clock in Zena's Blue Dynasty. And that would have been two hours after the murders. Just so that we're clear on the timeline, the shooter walks into that apartment somewhere around 8.50. Gunshots happen somewhere around 9 o'clock because 9.06 is when 911 is called from the restaurant. Kevin would have to be in 
Bucyrus between 8.45 and 9.06 to commit the murders. And we have him, and he says, and Melanie says, and all the people in Crestline say that between those times, he's either in Mansfield at Melanie's house or he's in Crestline, which is still 30 to 40 minutes away from Bucyrus. And he has all those alibi witnesses attesting to that. There was an eyewitness who stated that they saw a large black man. I believe her name was Nancy Smathers. This is Kevin's brother, Charles, again. Uh, she said that she couldn't identify the man. She wasn't close enough to see any type of facial features or, or anything of the sort. That is another piece that caused a lot of confusion because there was more than one large man uh, on that particular scene. There were reports from multiple eyewitnesses that saw a large black male around the Bucyrus estates on the night of the murders. People that live here have told News 4 and the police that they saw a man fitting Kevin Keith's description using this phone here at the apartment complex the night of the shootings. His name is Kerry Walter. He says he doesn't want to be linked with the horrible crime, but says it was him, not Keith, that witnesses saw around the crime scene after police and ambulances had arrived. Because I was around that area, because I stay around there with a girlfriend of mine, but, you know, I was using a phone at night there, and I was around, you know, as far as being around, walking around the projects that time of night. Keith's attorney says he believes the witnesses thought it was Kevin Keith on the phone because they didn't know that Walter was back in the area. Walter had been in prison himself for three years and was just released four days before the murders. Project, if they're relying merely upon the fact that it was a large black man that they saw in the project area and then being shown pictures of Kevin or him being shown on TV and a person saying, yeah, that's the person I saw that night. If that's the information they're relying on, that's not too accurate. It needs to be made clear that police have not ever implicated Walter in this case. Okay, I do what you're going to do. Carrie Walker actually looked a lot like Kevin. So much so that during trial, James Banks brought Carrie into the courtroom to have him stand side by side with Kevin to show their resemblance. Carrie had recently been released from jail and had just moved back into the area, which James Banks believed made him an unfamiliar face to the neighborhood. This is from a 1994 interview with Kevin and NBC4 of Columbus, Ohio. In this interview, Kevin has recently been arrested. He's wearing an orange jumpsuit and sitting next to his lawyer, James Banks. Though Kevin was never questioned by law enforcement, he was interviewed by the media. Where were you Sunday night at the time of the crime? Well, the newspaper said it happened at about nine or five after nine, and I was at my aunt's house in Crestline. And your aunt can testify to verify your story? Yes. Kevin Keith says he was at his aunt's house in Crestline at nine o'clock Sunday, the same time three people were shot to death and three others wounded in Bucyrus, 12 miles away. Where were you before you went to your aunt's house? Well, I was at home, I was watching TV, I watched the news on up to seven. Then I rode to Mansfield, I was gonna go to a friend's house, but there wasn't anybody there. By his own estimate, it takes only 15 minutes to get to Mansfield. That would put him there at 7.15. Throw in a half an hour trying to find his friend, now it's 7.45. So you were in Mansfield, and then you turned around and drove back to Crestline where you went to your aunt's house? Yes. And 15 more minutes for the drive back to Crestline, and it's only eight o'clock. So where was he for at least an hour until he got to his aunt's house? Is there any possibility that the time frame is off here, that you're wrong about what time you were at your aunt's? Maybe you were there at 8.30 and, and left, or...? No, I'm pretty sure it was close. I'm pretty sure it was about 9. But you're not positive? I am positive. It was about, it was about five, a couple minutes till 9. This interview that Kevin did with News 4 looked particularly bad for his case. The alibi was broadcast on TV and left 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. wide open, a critical time period for an effective alibi. Not only was there plenty of unaccounted for time, but this alibi was also different than the one that eventually came out during trial. As it turns out, Kevin had personal motivations for not giving a full alibi to the media. We asked Kevin's current attorney for her take on this interview. When Kevin first got arrested, they thought this was going to go away. 
This is Rachel Troutman from the Ohio Public Defender's Office. When I watched the footage of Kevin from the news interviews that his attorney let him do, I had a, a lot of thoughts about it. One being, I can't think of any other case in which an attorney voluntarily sets their client up in front of the media. I mean, you have to have a whole lot of faith in your client's innocence if that's something you're going to do. Probably the thing that stuck out to me the most about those interviews is that his attorney lets him answer um, pretty much any question about the, the murders that he was arrested for. And then the reporter starts to ask him questions about the drug charges from the January prior to the, the murders. And his attorney says something along the lines of, he can't answer questions about that because, you know, because of pending charges. If the attorney stops the questioning because he has drug charges pending, so won't let him answer because there are charges pending. But he lets him answer all of these questions about the, the aggravated murder when there are aggravated murder charges pending and a death sentence on the table. I believe that his attorney and Kevin, obviously, they both knew um, he was answering questions about something that he did not do. As an attorney, in my brain, that's the only thing that makes sense. That's the only thing that can explain the length to which he allowed his client to be questioned and then the immediate shift in the demeanor of both of them when drug charges were suggested. I think there's a couple of things that probably account for the wishy-washy timeline. I think that, for one thing, he had no idea that he was a suspect, which is one of the reasons why when they arrested him, I mean, he's just sitting in his living room watching soap operas. He wasn't cataloging where he had been and who he had been with. And I think he was trying to cover his relationship. He knew that Zena was going to see this, this interview and he didn't want to be admitting on TV that he was with his girlfriend, Melanie Davison. I mean, once he realized, once things got real and um, continued down the path towards trial, then he came clean and his relationship with Zena didn't last. I could only imagine what Kevin would be thinking, but I'm torn on this one. I think if he didn't know how serious this was, and in his mind, he thought, okay, I know I didn't do this. There's no evidence that can link me here. So what am I going to save? I'm going to save my relationship. And that's the one thing that he ultimately tried to protect. Someone that's not media savvy and doing an interview about their alibi. I get it for sure, because I understand that he was protecting his relationship with Zena and not wanting his girlfriend to know about this other relationship. But looking at it from like a legal perspective now, you're like, oh my God, just don't speak. Because it ultimately really damaged his whole alibi. I, I mean, I would, I'll never forget it. Never. For Damon Chapman, brother to Marichal Chapman, and uncle to four-year-old victim Marche, February 13th, 1994 is a night he'll always remember. The day that happened, I came there like 15 minutes later. I could go in that apartment till this day and show you every place where my sister was laying, my niece was laying. Evil monsters. I mean, he was, he's evil. And he's really more evil to shoot a four-year-old twice in the back. And I just think about it all the time, man. And what makes it so bad, I work in the fire, so I work like close to that place. And it's like, it just dwells on me all the time. Yeah, you know, I think about before, before that happened, you know, it was, it was, it was fun. We had everybody, you know, I enjoyed being around my sister and now being around my little four year old niece, I enjoyed that. That was like some of the best times of my life. The police tried to restrain me from going in. They tried to stop me from going in, but there was no stopping me from going in. I knew that was my sister's house, and I just, I went in there. Juanita and Quentin was laying right beside each other. And I was talking to Juanita and Quentin because they was the only ones prison because I checked everybody. And they're like, don't touch him, don't touch him. But I was, you know, it was me. And I, I'm like, I want to 
I want to see if my people are still alive. And none of them was besides Quentin and Quanita, and I'm trying to talk to them. I was asking them, like, who did this to you? I was like, who did this to you? And they're trying to speak to me, you know what I'm saying? But they couldn't speak because they was hurting so bad. All they could do was, like, just, like, they was, like, breathe. I could still see Quanita and Quentin's eyes just real big, just looking at me, like, just fighting for their life. Just because they was young, you can't say that, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. No, they know what they're talking about. They know who shot them. Two kids are not going to forget nobody's face who shot them and tried to kill them. It's worth noting there is no documentation in police files that Damon Chapman was at the scene of the crime that night or in the apartment, especially while the victims were still there. If this was the case, the scene of the crime was not locked down by the police as it should have been, according to active crime scene protocol. Two days after the crime on February 15th, Kevin Keith was arrested. Three days after his arrest, six-year-old survivor Juanita Reeves was interviewed by the police for the first time while she was still recovering at the hospital. What you're about to hear is an excerpt from her account of the night. Friday, February 18th, 1994, 11.33 a.m. And with me in the room, and this is Captain Michael Quillen, Captain Roger Blankenship behind you, and your mommy's here. That's uh, Joyce Reeves, and you're Cornito, right? Lead detective Captain Michael Corwin introduces himself, as well as Captain Roger Blankenship. Juanita's mother, Joyce Reeves, is also present in the hospital room. Do you remember what happened while you were there? Can you tell me about it? Okay, why don't you tell me in your own words what happened, okay? Oh, was Bruce. Who was Bruce? Who was Bruce? Bruce. When interviewed for the first time by police, victim Juanita Reeves doesn't say the name Kevin. She says the gunman was someone named Bruce. At the time of this interview, Kevin has already been arrested, but Juanita, one of the only living eyewitnesses, gives a different name to the detective. When the police ask, who's Bruce? Juanita says, my daddy's friend. It's important to note that no one named Bruce has ever been charged with this crime. So who's Bruce? And where did the police get Kevin's name from in the first place? We'll get into that and more next time on The System. The System is a Spotify original series produced in partnership with Big City TV and Tenderfoot TV. I'm Kim Kardashian, your host and executive producer. From Big City TV, executive producer is Lori Rothschild and Saldi. From Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Lead creative producer is Meredith Stedman. Production, editing, and sound design by Tristan Bankston and Cameron Taggy. Additional sound design by Cooper Skinner. Production manager is Tracy Kaplan. Music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Voiceover work by Miles Ag. Associate producer producer is Jamie Albright, mixed and mastered by Cooper Skinner and Devin Johnson. The system contains adult content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Kevin, you're accused of heinous crimes, aggravated murder and attempted murder, children, was shot and one was killed. Did you do this? No, I didn't, Tony. I love kids. This is from an interview between Kevin Keith and Tanya Strong at News 5. It takes place only days after the murders. Kevin has just been arrested. He's wearing an orange jumpsuit and he's sitting next to his defense attorney, James Banks, as he pleads his case to the public. Did you know this family? Yes. What was your relationship with Marshall Chapman and Linda Chapman? There was only no relationship. We had grew up earlier. I haven't seen them in about four or five years. So you grew up with them yes. in Crestline or in the Resource yes. area? Crawford County. Okay. Had you ever been to that apartment? No. 
Were you near there the night of the crime? No. When I talked to you on the phone, you didn't seem nervous, but you look nervous now. You look scared now. I was scared when you were talking to me on the phone. Are you afraid now? I've been afraid ever since I got picked up. Because I wouldn't do a thing like this. I wouldn't hurt nobody's kids. And two of the children who were injured, you say you knew well? Yes. Quentin and Quinita? Yes. How did you know them? Because um, their dad and I spent a lot of time together. We was like best friends. They came over a lot of lot this summer and, you know, I fed them and their dad was going through bad times with a divorce and I was there to comfort him. If you are innocent, then this is certainly an incredible trial to go through emotionally. How are you holding up? I'm not holding up. I'm not holding up. But who can I talk to? I mean, they just came to my house, kicked the doors in, arrested me, burned me here, threw these charges on me. I don't understand what's going on. Is there anything you can say right now in your own defense? I did not harm anyone. And I love kids. I would never do that to nobody's kids. Never. I have a daughter of my own. I did not do this crime. In this interview, Kevin says he knew the families, particularly the Reeves family, and that he babysat Quentin and Juanita Reeves in the past to help out his good friend and their father, Demetrius, while he was going through a divorce. I was shocked to hear that Kevin knew the kids so well and was presumably best friends with their dad. He doesn't suggest that there was any bad blood between them. In fact, quite the opposite. The Matrix two kids, I love them like I love my own, and he knows that. The system contains adult content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Kevin, you're accused of heinous crimes, aggravated murder and attempted murder. Children were shot and one was killed. Did you do this? No, I didn't, Tanya. I love kids. This is from an interview between Kevin Keith and Tanya Strong at News 5. It takes place only days after the murders. Kevin has just been arrested. He's wearing an orange jumpsuit and he's sitting next to his defense attorney, James Banks, as he pleads his case to the public. Did you know this family? Yes. What was your relationship with Marshall Chapman and Linda Chapman? There was only no relationship. We had grew up earlier. I haven't seen them in about four or five years. So you grew up with them yes. in Crestline or in the Residers yes. area? Crawford County. Okay. Had you ever been to that apartment? No. Were you near there the night of the crime? No. When I talked to you on the phone, you didn't seem okay. nervous. But you look nervous now. You look scared now. I was scared when you were talking to me on the phone. Are you afraid now? I've been afraid ever since I got picked up. Because I wouldn't do a thing like this. I wouldn't hurt nobody's kids. And two of the children who were injured, you say you knew well? Yes. Quentin and Quinita? Yes. How did you know them? Because um, their dad and I spent a lot of time together. We was like best friends. 
they came over a lot of lot this summer and you know I fed them and their dad was going through bad times with a divorce and I was there to comfort him. If you are innocent, then this is certainly an incredible trial to go through emotionally. How are you holding up? I'm not holding up. I'm not holding up. But who can I talk to? I mean, they just came to my house, kicked the doors in, arrested me, burned me here, threw these charges on me. I don't understand what's going on. Is there anything you can say right now in your own defense? I did not harm anyone. And I love kids. I would never do that to nobody's kids. Never. I have a daughter of my own. I did not do this crime. In this interview, Kevin says he knew the families, particularly the Reeves family, and that he babysat Quentin and Juanita Reeves in the past to help out his good friend and their father, Demetrius, while he was going through a divorce. I was shocked to hear that Kevin knew the kids so well and was presumably best friends with their dad. He doesn't suggest that there was any bad blood between them. In fact, quite the opposite. Demetrius' two kids, I love them like I love my own, and he knows that. I believe deep down inside, he really knows that. I'm Kim Kardashian, and this is The System. it's like to not have a family member around because they're locked up like I don't know but I can imagine you think that could have been my brother that could have been my father and I could think about my family and think about if one of us made one bad decision that got one of us locked up our whole lives would be different and we would be just a completely different family when someone gets locked up like it changes their whole family it's not just one person so imagine you know, to get locked up for something that you didn't do. The fight of the family is also what I'm fighting for. This is where I was sitting when I interviewed your brother. Wow. On Zoom, though. Well, I've practiced this a million times. Recently, I finally got to sit down face to face with Kevin's number one advocate, his older brother, Charles Keith. Yeah, I like your t-shirt. I stand with Kevin Keith with his big smile on his face. And I have one for you. You do? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. Good. I love that. I smile now. And I, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a smile of joy. I tell people to believe in somebody and not stand. That's not good. You have to stand. If you believe, you must stand. If there's something that you believe in, you must stand up for it. Do you feel like, has there been any point where you've lost yourself forgetting the fact that Kevin is your brother? Yes, uh, I would have to say my first five years, um, I got a chance to see what hate really looked like and it was starting to destroy me. The anger, the why me, and the cries and the scream outs. And, you know, and it was funny because I asked God, why me? And there was a funny voice that came back and says, why not you? The case no longer became a burden. It became something to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't burdensome at all. This is my brother. He's not heavy. <laughs> He's my brother. So, yeah, the first five years were difficult. After the first five, I started learning, I started using my education. It's sad that I had to use my education as a weapon. I couldn't use it to benefit myself, profit, or anything, or to take care of my children, or to take care of my family. I had to use my education as a weapon. You probably had no idea the whole scope of the case or the information on either side, really. Did you ever have, like, inside, deep, deep, deep inside, any secret doubts of, like, well, we're here. He did get the death penalty. The secret doubt was, they got to have something. 
I mean, there's got to be something that drew them toward Kevin. And that's what I thought. I'm like, so what is it? And that's what started me to investigate. Had I believed he was guilty, I would have never done anything. But I was like, well, what do they have on him? So when I got these documents in front of me and I was able to read them, I was like, wait a minute. These documents never made it to court. Everything that I compiled, everything mm -hmm. that I gathered over the years, none of that stuff made it to court. That's why he was found guilty. It's not what the jury knew, it's what they didn't know. Yeah, and I've seen that whole case yeah. book. I mean, that's what made me want to yeah. get so heavily involved. Had any involved. of those documents been entered in court, they would have been no good to me. Yeah. And I didn't know that. So this is what was missing. So you imagine these people, these professionals coming up, telling this story to convict a man, a black man, poor black man, which made it, the target very easy just overwhelm us. I mean, what, mm -hmm. what, what are you supposed to do to defend ourselves? Yeah. Because when you speak up as a black family, he didn't do it. You don't have any, if Kevin didn't have any integrity, we didn't as a family. You're the brother of this murderer and that's who our family became. So we became outcast even in our own community, mm -hmm. and which was even worse. I'm like, you guys believe Kevin did that? Mm -hmm. In the hood, whatever you say about somebody, it's so easy to believe it because look where you're from, you know? And if you were a good person, then you would not be living in the hood. And that's how people think. You know, it's funny because we sitting, we were sitting in Crestline, and you know, I'm just sitting here and I'm laughing and I'm thinking about all the people that were there and we grew up. We used to call it clothesline because everybody just was just hanging. Nobody was looking for careers. It's like you could not get out of Crawford County. Mm -hmm. You know, you just couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So everybody just kept hanging around, hanging around, hanging around. And it's funny because the relationships grew out of the male and females that could not stand each other when they were younger. Now they all have kids together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny. I know you said that all the families were close or connected growing up. What was the family dynamics between the Keys, the Chapmans, the Reeves, and the Meltons? We were all kids together, grew up together, went through elementary school together, and then, you know, uh, some of the Chapmans and the Keefs got together, they became family. We have mutual family members, not with the Melton family, but we still all knew one that we grew up. But yeah, we have mutual family members. So I'm able to talk to my cousins that talk to their cousins, which are the Chapmans. It wasn't just Demetrius and Kevin who were friendly. I was surprised by just how close all of the families involved were. They grew up together and many of the families were not so distantly related in this tight-knit community. Demetrius Reeves was Kevin's good friend. Kevin insisted he never would have done something like this to kids, much less kids of a friend like Demetrius. Kevin also said he knew the kids well. But it wasn't until after Kevin was arrested that the police got a statement from one of the kids, Juanita. Here's producer and Kevin Keith advocate, Lori Rothschild, on the Juanita Reeves interview. Juanita and Quentin were the two kids that survived. They were shot and survived. When police questioned Juanita, they said, you know, who shot you? She said, I'm a Bruce. Bruce? Who's Bruce? Daddy's friend. Daddy's friend, okay. She literally said, my daddy's friend Bruce shot me. She didn't say Kevin Keith. Juanita was seven years old at the time. I have an eight-year-old at home. My eight-year-old would know who babysat her by, by name. And by the way, there's no cross-racial identification issues. They're both black. She would have known exactly who walked into that room if it was Kevin Keith. But instead, she said, it was my daddy's friend Bruce. Have you ever seen this Bruce before? Yeah. Where have you seen him at? Everywhere. Everywhere. He's been talking to you. Not to the apartment. Not to the apartment. To my grandma. Oh, no, your grandma's house. Is that when you saw him? Okay, you're shaking your head again. Yeah. Yeah. And the apartment. Oh, the crest line? I see. Okay, so you During the interview, Juanita says she'd seen this Bruce before at her grandma's house in Crestline. 
she wasn't sedated in the in the interview. She sounds completely lucid. I mean, she sounds like she I mean, she sounds like a 7-year-old little girl. You know, she sounds like a she sounds like a child. She sounds like a an innocent kid who just saw a horrific scene happen in front of her. And she was lucid enough to say my daddy's friend Bruce. Did he say anything? The police arrested Kevin. They decided Kevin was the, the perpetrator and arrested him before they even interviewed Quanita Reeves. This is Rachel Troutman again, Kevin's current attorney from the Ohio Public Defender's Office. It was a, the nurse from the hospital that, that was taking care of Juanita was the one who reached out to the police because uh, Juanita had told her nurse that it was her daddy's friend Bruce and that she was afraid. So that nurse called the police and that, at that point the police came and interviewed her and she told them the same thing. So after she tells them the same thing, they showed her the, the lineup, the photo lineup. Okay. If I show you some pictures, and if these pictures are, you think you'll recognize it? Yeah. Okay. Here. See, I got six pictures. Yeah. Right here. Okay. I just want you to look at them. If you can't see, that's okay. But if you see, you just point at you and tell me which one he is. Nah. You got a little junior? I got a shirt. What do you mean you don't have it? Michael Corwin pulls out six pictures for Juanita to pick from, but she says that none of them are the gunmen. Then she points at picture number five, and though it's hard to hear, she says that he doesn't have that lump on his head. Remember, Kevin Keith babysat Quanita and Quentin. She knew the, who Kevin Keith was. And his picture was different from the other pictures on the lineup. His was a little bit closer. His was shown to be bigger. He looked like a bigger black man. And Juanita points at Kevin and says, it looks like him, but it's not him. Because Kevin, if you look at his face, Kevin Keith, he has a knob on the top of his head. The one thing that you can really tell is the shape of his head. It is, it's, it's unmistakable. I have never seen a more... Um, biased photo lineup for somebody to pick Kevin in this case and she did not she instead the, the one thing you can tell because the features of that of the lineup you know Kevin's features are very darkened it doesn't even look like him but he is set much more prominently towards the front of like towards the camera whereas everybody else in the lineup is set back so he, it is it is very much created in a way that emphasizes him well let me ask you this is that the guy that that you know, that's not the guy you know his name is. No. You know who that is? No. You know, you've never seen him before? Okay. So when they showed her then the, the photo lineup and um, they said, do you call him Bruce? She said, no. And she said he doesn't, he didn't have a head like that. And so she excluded Kevin's picture based on the shape of his head and also said that no, she did not call that person Bruce which became the issue at trial. Her mother, despite that recording, her mother then testified that Juanita called everybody Bruce, essentially, that that was just this, her, this seven-year-old little girl called people by the wrong name. Do you recognize any other pictures? No. Okay. Do you know who that is? No. Have you seen any news or anything? Do you have it? Corwin also asks if she recognizes any of the pictures, to which she also replies no. 
He then asked if she had seen any of the news since she's been in the hospital, which she denies. Are you scared? Yeah, I still would be too. Your father? Well, we've got somebody in jail. We're trying to make sure we've got the right somebody in jail. We want to make sure. Okay? Yeah, I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. Juanita asks, you caught him? Michael Corwin says that they have someone in jail, but they want to make sure they have the right someone. I can't think of anything else I want to... No, let me ask you one more time. You say, that looks like him except for the head. Yeah. Number five, this guy right here. But it's not him. But it's not him. No. Juanita didn't attend the trial presumably because she was so young or still recovering from the traumatic event. Instead, the recorded police interview was played and her mother, Joyce Reeves, testified in her place. During the rebuttal examination of Joyce Reeves by prosecutor Russell Weissman, Joyce said that her daughter had called Kevin Keith Bruce before. When Weissman asked, did she call other people Bruce? Joyce replied, yes. Then Kevin's lawyer, James Banks, objected, saying, Objection to what she called other people unless he's bringing the young lady in. He can bring her in. The court sustained the objection. Prosecutor Russell Weissman said, No further questions. Thank you. Juanita was never called to the stand. People don't really understand how memory works and how easy it is for someone's memory to trick them. This is Dr. Scott Gronland, a memory expert and professor of psychology at the University of Oklahoma. He has studied Kevin's case for years. Rachel Troutman, Kevin Keith's attorney, she contacted me and uh, asked me to write a report and I wrote a report that went to the Ohio Supreme Court and to the U.S. Supreme Court in the hopes that they would take up the case, but they also did not take up the case. We wanted to talk to Dr. Gronland about the identifications made by the three key eyewitnesses, Nancy Smathers, Juanita Reeves, and Richard Warren. Dr. Gronland is an expert on how memory might affect reporting in a criminal case. We've already heard Juanita's interview and we'll hear Richard's account later. How could these three eyewitnesses with varying stories have all eventually pointed law enforcement towards Kevin Keith? And what's important to keep in mind about their different experiences on that night? These eyewitnesses, really, any of the eyewitnesses in all these wrongful conviction cases, they're not lying. Uh, they honestly believe what they're reporting. But if you understand how memory works, you understand how easy it can be for your own memory to trick you. We're actually pretty bad at keeping track of what we actually experienced in an event versus what we uh, added to that event. Did, did I really remember that the robber had a crooked nose or was one of the other witnesses who commented to me, remember that guy had a crooked nose? Well, I might not remember that, but I do now that you've mentioned it to me. And so our memory for everyday events, for eyewitness events, for family vacations that we took uh, last year, 10 years ago, are a combination of things that actually happened, things that were suggested to us, things that other people reported to us about what happened, that all gets mixed up. And we're really bad at keeping track of the source of where the information in our memory came from. The three main phases that any sort of memory task entails, the information has to be encoded, right? It has to be incorporated into memory. The information has to be stored, has to be maintained for some period of time. And then the information has to be subsequently retrieved. And so look at the conditions for the eyewitnesses when the crime was taking place, right? When they were encoding the information about what happened, about what the perpetrator looked like. I think the encoding phase is very important to consider here. Keep in mind the conditions for each eyewitness as they experience this horrific night. 
In the timeline section of episode one, we mentioned that the perpetrator was reported to be wearing a mask. The victims were also under an extreme amount of stress. Details like this can affect encoding. Listen for those moments as we continue. Then you can look at, well, what happened, you know, between when the crime happened and when they got tested, right? So that's the storage time. And that's a time when they might be exposed to seeing something on the news. They might be exposed to another witness making suggestions to them. And then the last phase, typically in an eyewitness situation, would say be a lineup, right? There's the test uh, of, of someone's memory, the retrieval phase. I guess the first step is to figure out who the eyewitnesses are. In this case, there were three of them. Uh, there was Richard Warren, uh, who was shot uh, three times, uh, played dead, and then heroically took off after the perpetrator and was shot again, but uh, you know survived. So he's maybe the main eyewitness. There was a neighbor, uh, Nancy Smathers, who heard something and saw someone get into a car from some distance away. Not sure how far, but it was night. The perpetrator got in a car, uh, ran the car into a snowbank, had to stop and rock the car, you know, trying to get the car out of the snowbank. Nancy Smathers gave statements to the police several times leading up to trial. Smathers was a Caucasian neighbor who lived across the street from the Bucyrus Estates complex. Her first statement was recorded in the initial police report. The report states that Smathers heard gunshots, then saw a man running towards a car in the parking lot. He peeled out but slid on ice and got lodged in a snowbank. The report says Smathers could hear him cursing as he shook the car free and sped away. She described the car as light, cream-colored, short and compact, make and model unknown. She said the man had dark clothing, a large winter coat and a hat, and that his face was not covered. So I'm willing to agree that the person she saw was the person that committed the shooting and uh, you know, was trying to flee the scene. But you know, we talked about these three phases of memory, right? This encoding phase, when the police asked her later, you know, soon after the event, when your memory's gonna be the best, <laughs> you know, when the police first show up, they asked her to describe the guy. And her description, I think, essentially was big black guy. So that tells me that she didn't get much of a look at who this was. So encoding, you know, I argued, not very good. It was night. She was some distance away. I think she saw the guy from the back. I believe the police asked her, could you think you could make an ID? She said, well, I can't. I didn't get a very good look. But Kevin Keith uh, very quickly became a suspect and very quickly was arrested and appeared, I believe, on the television. You know, I was just finding it kind of strange that the police haven't questioned me at all about this. What do you think about it? I think it's a frame. Nancy Smathers saw him on TV and then she told the police she could make an ID. Well, anybody could have made an ID after seeing somebody on television. The police should not do that. And I argued in my report that police should not should not have shown her a lineup after she saw his face on the television because that becomes her memory, not because she remembered him from that night. Because she told us what she remembered that night. She told us soon after the event, a large black man. That's not a very detailed description. We can't encode everything. We fill in details and then we can't keep straight where those details come from. So I think that her identification should be dismissed. Let's deal next with uh, Quanita Reeves, the, the little girl. She also had a, a little brother who was four, who also survived. He could have been an eyewitness, but I believe they judged him to be too young, I guess, and so they never uh, tested him. She was shown the lineup. She pointed at Kevin Keith's photo in the lineup, and she said, uh, that looks like the man that shot me, but that's not the man that shot me. I argued, and there is research to support that, at least in a laboratory setting, when you have control of 
everything. A non-identification, which is what her identification was, right? She didn't pick Kevin Keith. She said, that's not him. That looks like him, but that's not him. Uh, that non-identification, uh, research shows, is actually indicative of innocence. And so I argued that her identification actually lends support to the idea that Kevin Keith was not the perpetrator. Kevin Keith had babysat for those kids. You know, the Chapman family, the Keith family, they, they kind of knew each other. But even, you know, that notwithstanding, the fact that she did not make an identification is an indication that the guilty person was not in the lineup. But in 1994, that's not what happened. Kevin was arrested even before Juanita gave her interview to the police. And her non-identification didn't change that. Nor did her mention of Bruce. To me, this seems like an indication of a rushed arrest. Not all of the witnesses had been interviewed. So how could all persons of interest be thoroughly investigated and cleared? Quentin and Juanita Reed, they are my cousin. This is Damon Chapman again, victim Marichelle Chapman's brother. Damon says that despite Juanita's first interview with the police, Juanita and Quentin are now adamant that Kevin is the one that shot them. They, you know, they try to twist their words and try to say that they said it was somebody else, but they know who Kevin was from the jump because Kevin used to hang out with their dad all the time. Demetrius Reeves. Kevin used to hang out with Demetrius all the time. And so Quanine and Quentin seen him at their house so many times. Quanine and Quentin, they're doing fine right now, but they're just, they're having a hard time dealing with this still. You know, they still, they go to counsel, you know, because they can't get over it either. Especially Quanita, it breaks her down a lot. When Kevin comes up in the situation, she don't even want to hear his name. Richard Warren is one of the victims that got shot. It was my sister's boyfriend. And he was a he was a good guy. He treated my sister good. There's nothing bad I really could say about Richard, you know. Him and my sister met and they lived together out there at Desires State. He didn't know nobody around here. He didn't know nobody in Crawford County area. He didn't know nobody. Apparently, Richard Warren had only lived in Crawford County and the Bucyrus Estates complex for a couple of weeks. Being so new to the area means he likely wouldn't have known the gunman that shot them or any backstory on motive. He never knew Kevin from anywhere until the day he seen come in my sister's house with that trash bag with that gun in there, then sat there and watched my sister shake for her life and he shot him anyways. The following police interview took place on the 14th, the night after the shootings, and four days before Juanita's interview on the 18th. This interview is between Detective Michael Corwin and surviving victim Richard Warren. This is the most complete first-person account of the night of the murders, and the only one from an adult survivor. <laughs> Seventeen twelve B Marion Road. That's in Bucyrus, Ohio. Right. How long did you live live there? Right oh, here? Like two or three weeks. Why were you living there? I was with my girlfriend. And who is your girlfriend? Who was my girlfriend? Why she on town? Yeah, there's. I mean, we have a bunch of names, and we're trying to see who is with who here. Okay. Michael Corwin asks Richard Warren, "Who is your girlfriend?" And Richard corrects him, saying, who was my girlfriend? Okay, Richard, let's go back to February the 13th, which would have been yesterday, at around 9 o'clock p.m. last night. Uh -huh. You were obviously involved in some kind of a shooting incident, correct? Uh-huh. Okay. And the shooting incident took place at 1712B Marion Road, Bizarro, Ohio. Uh-huh. Who all was there at the time? 
Richard Warren goes on to list everyone that was in the apartment that evening. At around nine o'clock, there was a shooting in the apartment. Yes. Do you know who shot? No. I have an idea. That was kind of something. Uh, he came through the door looking for Linda. Michael Corwin asks, do you know who shot you? Richard Warren responds, no, but I have an idea. His name was Kevin something. Okay, let's hang on me. This Kevin something uh -huh. came in looking for Linda. Uh -huh. Okay. Why was Linda there? Pick up the kids. Pick up the niece and nephew. The niece and nephew, okay. She said somebody had been following her. Said somebody had been following her. Yeah. Richard says that Linda Chapman thought someone was following her that night when she arrived at the apartment. Did she say who? No, she didn't know. Okay. Well, first of all, Linda and Marcel was in the kitchen, I was sitting on the couch. Okay. And I said, this guy come to the door. And this guy just came in? Well, he just came to the door. And then... And that's Kevin came to the door. Yeah. We're calling Kevin, okay. Yeah. Kevin came, came to the door. door and turned around and walked off. And I didn't know who it was, so I went and opened the door. And he said, you see Linda? I said, yeah, she's in here. And, um, Okay, let, let's stop right there for a second. Go ahead and clear your throat. During this interview, Richard Warren is lying on a hospital bed after undergoing surgery for gunshot wounds to the face. He's on oxygen and due to the damage to his jaw, periodically needs to pump out excess saliva. Can you describe him to me? Fat black guy. Yeah, fat black guy. Yeah. Okay. What was he wearing? I don't remember. You remember about how tall he was? About six, six, two. Six foot to six foot two? Yeah. Okay. Probably 250. Around 250? He had a, uh, like a turtleneck shirt on. The neck pulled all the way up over his, to his nose. Turtleneck shirt on with the neck all the way to, pulled up over to his nose or over his nose? his nose? In her full statement to the police, Juanita also mentions that the assailant was wearing a mask of some sort, pulled up over his mouth. Okay. You went the last side and they found fucking this. Okay, hang on a minute. So he walked away the first time. Yeah. Then he came back. Uh -huh. Did he just ask, did he come in or did he ask you through the door if he knew first where thing, Linda was? Yeah, through the door. Okay. And Linda, and I said, Linda, someone's here for you. Okay, so he asked through the door if Linda was there. No. Yes. And you told Linda somebody was there for you. Yeah. So she came to the door. He said, Linda, can I talk to you for a minute? Okay, Linda came to the door and this guy asked to talk to her. So she went outside. While she was outside, and when I asked Marcel who was that, she said, Kevin Sum is involved in a drum bus. Richard says that the man went outside to talk to Linda for a few minutes. During that time, Richard says he asked Marichelle who the man was, and she said his name was Kevin something but he can't recall the last name. Richard says that Marichal also mentioned that the man was involved in a recent drug bust. Linda came to the door and he asked her to come outside uh -huh. and she went out and talked. Uh -huh. Okay, and then you asked Marcel who it was and she said, did she mention Kevin's last name or she just said Kevin she something? She mentioned his last name. She said Kevin I can't remember. And the last name, but you can't remember it. Okay. And she said he was involved in a big drug bust where? In the same way. How long was Linda outside with you? About five minutes. About five minutes. Then what happened? He, he got a glass of water. My shell got it for him. Okay. Came in and asked for a glass of water. Uh -huh. And Marshall got it for him. And he drank it through the mask. He drank it through his shirt? Uh-huh. And he had a trash bag with it. Three trash bags. A green? And uh, I was still sitting on the couch. Marcel and Linda were standing over there by him. And then he went in the trash bag. I pulled out the Tech 9. Okay, let's stop right there for a second. 
Richard describes the perpetrator finishing his glass of water and then reaching into a trash bag, pulling out a gun, a Tech-9 to be exact. What is a Tech-9? You have a gun. But I mean, you know what the caliber it is or anything? Nine millimeters. Nine millimeters. It's got a, uh, a heat mark around the end and an extended barrel on it. Okay. What color is the gun? Um, the, the, the body of the gun was chrome and the extended barrel was black. Is this like a submachine gun or a handgun? Or? It's a handgun. It's a handgun. Yeah, they're legal. Say they're legal? Yeah. Okay. He pulled out the gun and he cocked it and he pointed at me. He said, get over there. I just looked at him because I was fucked up because ain't no shit ever, ain't no shit like ever happened to me. So, you know, I didn't know what to do. Okay, now when you say you were fucked up, you, you mean you were drunk or no, drunk I mean, or anything? No, or? I mean, I was just like, in awe. Richard says that the man took a Tech-9 out of the trash bag. A Tech-9 is a semi-automatic weapon, which Richard recognized from working at a pawn shop. The masked man pointed the gun at them and started giving orders. Richard says he was fucked up over this, not drunk, but just completely shocked by what was happening to them. Scared? Yeah. Okay, I probably don't blame you there. I imagine I'd be just a little concerned too. And um, he said, I ain't both sitting, get over here. Now I went over there to get down on the ground. They told everybody else to get on the ground too. Okay, so he had you get off the couch and come over to towards the door. Uh huh. And he made you lay down. Uh huh. He made Marcel lay down. Uh huh. And Linda lay down. Yes. And all three kids, he made them lay down too. Uh -huh. What did he tell them? And they just lay down. Okay, they didn't ask yeah. any questions or anything. Man, um, I see all the same. What are you doing? We don't have anything. We don't have anything. Kevin, Kevin. And he kept on saying, don't say my name. Don't say my name. So she called him by name, huh? Yeah. Kevin? According to Richard, the gunman repeated, don't say my name. Don't say my name. She said, you she said, ain't going to shoot anybody. I don't want nobody getting hurt while these kids are around. I don't want none of these kids getting hurt. He said, what the fuck would I do that for? And then she said something. And he said, shut up and put the gun to her head. To who's head? Marcel. Okay, this he's talking to Marcel this whole time. Yeah. The rest of you are being quiet. Yeah. Linda was like leaning to the side. She wasn't all the way to the ground. She was leaning to the side, smoking a cigarette. Then um, he said um, you should have thought about that before your brother started riding on people. All right, hang on a minute. In case you didn't catch that, the gunman allegedly said, "You should have thought about that before your brother started riding on people." This is something we want to cover, okay? Uh -huh. This is Marcel talking to Kevin. Uh -huh. And she calls me by name Kevin. Uh -huh. And Kevin tells her to shut up. Uh -huh. And why did he say she, she, you just said that she, you should have thought of that before what? Before the brother started riding off people. You know what he meant by that? Okay, do you know who, who her brother is? Uh huh, Damon. Damon Chapman. Damon Chapman? Yeah. You know if she has any other brothers? Okay. Corwin asked Richard, who Marshall's brothers were, to see who the gunman might have been referring to. Richard says Damon Chapman and Rudell Chapman. You've heard Damon's voice a few times by now on this podcast. Do you know which brother they were talking about? You're no. shaking your head. You mean no? no? As far as I could tell, it was Damon. Okay. okay. Around and, and that kind of shit. Rudell doesn't come around there much? No, he lives with his uh, girlfriend and two, two kids in Christ's life. Ah, okay. At this point, Richard believes that the gunman was referring to Marshall's brother, Damon Chapman. He thinks that Damon was more involved in, quote, that kind of shit. And he also says Rudell wasn't really around. And she said, well, my brother didn't tell on you or something. And then he said, shut up, put the gun to your head again. And then next thing I know, he shot it. He shot Marcel? Yeah. That was the first time he shot the gun? Yeah. Then he shot me in the jaw. Okay. Shot Marcel in the head first. Uh-huh. Then he turned the gun to you and well, shot I guess he shot in the head. I didn't see where he shot Okay. Him. You're just guessing that. Last you saw, the gun was pointing at her head, so you're just 
finger and that's where he hit her. Yeah. Okay. And then when he shot me in the jaw, I turned my head around, act like I was dead. Okay. And uh, I just heard the gun going off about 10, 12 times. Maybe more. Okay, so you didn't see anything from there. Uh -uh. And then I know I got hit two more times. Okay, first time I got hit in the jaw, you know where he got hit the second time? Um, no. Okay. I got four shots, but okay. Um, then after he shot me two more times, I heard the door close, so I figured he left, ran out. When you got shot, you just laid there and played dead. Uh huh. And while you were playing dead, he shot you two more times. Uh huh. Then you heard the door open. Uh, yeah. Did you see whether he went out or? Well, I guess he did, because I turned around and he was gone. Okay. So I got up and I ran outside. Richard describes the horrific attack. He was shot in the jaw, and then he attempted to play dead. Meanwhile, hearing what he thinks was 10 to 12 more gunshots. While playing dead, the gunman shot him two more times. Then Richard heard the door open, and assuming the gunman left, he made a run for it. I ran straight out the door, and started going straight across over the ice, screaming, help, help, help. Okay. Screaming as loud as I could, help me, help me, help me. I did shot, help me. And then I probably got about 50 yards and I heard him shooting some more. And I got in the ass. I fell face first and then so as soon as I fell, I jumped right back up, took off right again. And the whole time he was still shooting. And I just think to myself, please don't let me get hit anymore. Richard says he ran outside toward the nearby restaurant Ike screaming for help. He got about 50 yards before the gunman shot at him again, striking him and causing him to fall. Well, how many times did you guess he shot outside at you? Six, at least 10 times outside too, huh? Yeah. So we're, we're guessing, you guessed 10 to 12 times inside. Which hand did he shoot with, do you remember? His right hand. Right hand. Okay, I'm gonna stop here for a minute and flip this tape, okay? Okay, still with me? Yeah. Okay, we're back on tape now, okay? You think you can recognize this guy if you saw him again? I'm not sure. This Kevin? I recognize him by Bill. That's a guy. Okay. Well, I've got some pictures here of some people, okay? At this point, Michael Corwin pulls out the photo lineup. He asks Richard if he thinks he could identify the man who shot him. Richard says he could recognize him by his build, but that's about it. I'm going to show them to you. There's six pictures, and you, and we're going to see if you can pick him out. Hold it over here, son. Bottom in the middle. The bottom in the middle. This yeah. one right here? Yeah. This one where it says five above it? Yeah. Corwin shows Richard the same photo lineup as Juanita. Richard picks number five, which is Kevin. But then Richard says he's not 100% positive. You're sure? Is there any doubt in your mind at all? Oh, I guess I'm 100% positive. Oh, okay. That's okay. You're sure that's him, but you want to see him in person. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, okay. I understand now. From the picture, that looks, you're 95% sure it's him. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do due to your condition. I'm not going to go into any more detail tonight, okay? Here's where things get a little strange. Class question? You sure can, sir. What is that guy's name? Well, I, Kevin, you got the right first name for right, okay? But I don't really want to tell you the last name because oh, then you, if, if you remember it, yeah, that's fine. you know, I don't want it to look like I planted it in your mind or yeah, anything. I understand that. I will never forget anything about that. Name. Okay. At the end of Richard's interview, he has one question. What's the guy's name? Michael Corwin says that Richard got the first name quote right but he says he doesn't want to tell him the last name to make sure he doesn't seem like he's planted something in his mind. He says maybe Richard will remember once he's feeling better. Then the tape ends. Very good. This is going to conclude the tape. Again, this is Monday, February the 14th, 1994 at 7.30 p.m.
The last identification, uh, the last eyewitness was Richard Warren. He was obviously taken to the hospital in, in very serious condition. And a day or so later was shown this lineup. Here's memory expert, Dr. Scott Gronlund again. So when he was shot that fourth time, he was near Ike's restaurant. And patrons in Ike's restaurant came to assist him and reported asking him, who shot you? Who shot you? And he said, I don't know, I don't know. And the police arrived shortly thereafter and they asked him, who shot you? Who shot you? And he reported, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, which is interesting because in court a month later, he reported that he knew that someone named Kevin had shot him. Never makes sense to me why he's not telling people Kevin at that time. His answer was that he didn't know Kevin, but I think if you've got a name at that time, you should say it. And so I believe he learned that name later. He reports he was watching the NBA All-Star Game, and this man comes into the, into the apartment. Uh, Linda Chapman, I believe, led him into the apartment, and uh, he's got the turtleneck over his face. And then, of course, he gets shot. Um, so I, again, argued, you know, about this first phase of memory, the encoding phase. You know, he doesn't have much of a memory for the face. Didn't get to see it. Didn't get to see it very long. Stress is bad for memory, and this is clearly... It doesn't start as a stressful situation, but it quickly turns into a stressful situation. And, um, you know, when asked to describe him, he just said, you know, big husky black man. That's, again, not much of a description. He did subsequently in the hospital make an identification. And I laid out four possibilities that I thought might be true about this identification. Um, one is it could be accurate, right? It's possible this is an accurate identification. The biggest issue for me had to do with the lineup. Uh, the lineup is very unfair. Every time I teach this in class, every time I give a talk that involves this case, I, I read for them the description from Nancy Smathers and from Richard Warren, you know, big husky black man. And then I show them the lineup and I ask them, pick out the big husky black man. Now, of course, they have no idea what Kevin Keith looks like, but I've shown this lineup now dozens of times to hundreds of people uh, classes, talks, and I would estimate 75% of the time or better, people choose number five, Kevin Keith. Um, and then we discuss, especially in class, what that means, right? What should happen if this lineup had been fair? If the lineup had been fair, then all six of these individuals in the lineup should have got some votes, right? I make them choose because, of course, they have no idea, in a, you know, they would be hesitant to choose anyone. But I, I you know, you got to pick someone who best matches the description. And 75% or more of them pick Kevin Keith. What should happen is that three, four, five, ideally, all six of these people should get roughly equal number of votes, or at least three or four of them should get a substantial number of sort of nominations, but no, people that are naive to what he really looks like, going but just based on the description, are drawn to that face. It would be nice for people to see this, you know, on a, on a website or something. We've included a picture of the lineup on our resource page hyperlinked in this episode's description. All the men are black, all the men are big, but Kevin Keith's face is cropped so that he's the biggest. He is the closest, right? That's most zoomed in on him. He's the blackest in of the individuals. And people are just drawn to making that choice, right? People that can't possibly have a memory for the event are drawn to that face. So I think there's a very good chance that Richard Warren, with a very poor memory for what happened, and the police telling him to pick him out, Right? The police didn't say, hey, we may have the right guy, we may not. You know, if you see him, please pick him. But you know, it's important to not pick someone unless you're sure. The police said, pick him out. Well, I already demonstrated that if you tell people with no memory to pick out Kevin Keith, they're going to be drawn to Kevin Keith 75% of the time or better. So it's not a fair test. Right? We talked about that third phase of memory, the retrieval phase. This was a biased test. 
this did not allow someone to properly evaluate their memory with six reasonable choices. But anyways, that's the second uh, reason that I laid out for why Kevin Keith was chosen, right? Number one, could have been correct. Number two, if you're going to force someone to choose that doesn't really have much of a memory for the event, they're going to be drawn to that Kevin Keith uh, photo. As I discussed a moment ago, the Keith family, the Chapman family, I mean, uh, the Keith family lived in the area. It's possible Richard Warren had seen Kevin Keith in other situations, even if he didn't know him. Um, you know, somebody can look familiar for other reasons. And you're trying to make identification of someone from a lineup. You want to help the police, right? You want to pick someone. In fact, the police told you to pick someone. And that one face might look familiar because you saw him in the parking lot. You saw him at the grocery store. So that's also possible. And finally, let's pretend Richard Warren had a good memory for the face, despite what he told the police, <laughs> despite his vague description. Um, Kevin Keith's face would be the only one he couldn't eliminate. Um, that face is so dark, you can't see the facial features. And if you had a decent memory for what the person looked like, or at least some aspects of the face, you could look at the other faces because you can kind of see them. And you say, well, number one, well, that's not the guy I saw. Number two, that's not right. Number three, you know, number five, that could be him, I guess. And number five could be almost anyone. You can hardly make out any, any features. And so final possibility is that Richard Warren has had a decent memory and Kevin Keith was the only one he couldn't eliminate. And since the police wanted him to pick someone, he might have felt compelled to pick that as the only face he couldn't eliminate. The biggest problem for me, though, is that uh, lineup is just not fair. People are just drawn to that, to that face. Again, unlike Juanita's interview with the police, this one took place before Kevin's arrest. However, the tape suggests that this is still not the first time Kevin's name has been suggested. When Detective Michael Corwin says that Richard got the first name right, he's implying that they got Kevin's name somewhere in the last 22 hours since the shooting occurred, from someone that wasn't one of the victims. Richard Warren jets out of the apartment and runs to a nearby uh, restaurant where they call 911. Uh, they call 911 and they ask Richard, "Who? what happened? Who did this to you? What went what, what on? And he said, I've been shot, I've been shot. And um, at the time, he said he didn't know who shot him. And he was taken to the hospital. A day later, I have a report from a, uh, a therapist, a, a psychologist that comes in to talk to him. He still says he doesn't know who the killer is. He still doesn't say the name Kevin. Yet, we have a recording from Captain John Stanley, who claims he gets a call from a woman named Amy Gimmitz. So we have a recording of a telephone call that comes in. Captain Stanley records the call, and sh this woman identifies herself as Amy Gimmitz, and she is the ICU nurse taking care of Richard Warren. And Amy Gimmitz says, hey, you know, I just wanted to let you know, Richard Warren, he was just extubated, tube out of the throat, and he's saying that a guy named Kevin is the one who shot him. And she then transfers Captain Stanley's call into Richard's room, where Richard picks up the phone and then tells the story about how Kevin is the one who shot him. And how Kevin, the whole story that I told you about the, the mask over the face, the drinking the water through the mask, the gun being in the trash bag, 
all of that information comes from Richard Warren at that moment. Now, here's the problem. Later on in at the trial, Amy Gimmitz was never called to the stand. John Stanley, Captain Stanley, reads a transcription of that audio file referring to the Amy Gimmitz telephone call, which we have. I have a copy of that phone call. And she clearly says and identifies herself as Amy Gimmitz. The problem is that there is no Amy Gimmitz that worked at that hospital at any time, number one. And number two, there was no Amy Gimmitz in the state of Ohio. So who is Amy Gimmitz? Who's Amy Gimmitz? I went through every record to see if anybody was named Amy. This is Rachel Troutman again, Kevin's current attorney from the Ohio Public Defender's Office. She never located any person by the name of Amy Gimmitz in Ohio, much less connected to the case. Rachel did find one nurse referenced in Richard Warren's medical records who had the first name Amy. However, this Amy has a distinctly different last name and had never been mentioned by the police or prosecutor or listed on any witness list. I called all the hospitals to see if there was anybody named Amy Gimmitz. I checked all the records in the state to see if anybody's ever lived in Ohio named Amy Gimmitz, and there was nothing. And so when we found the only Amy that was in Richard Warren's medical records, I reached out to her and she provided me an affidavit. I actually hadn't even met her in person. We were talking over the phone and then through email. She told me she did not recall um, that she did not have a name Kevin and she would not have wanted to get involved. And so I said, okay, well, can you put that down in an affidavit, which she did. And then she on her own got it notarized and then mailed it to me. So never, never even met her face to face. Years after she provided me that affidavit saying that she had never gotten the name Kevin, she met with the attorney general on the case and provided her with an affidavit saying that it was her and she did get the name Kevin. If anything, the most troubling aspect of Amy Gimmitz to me was there was a confrontation clause violation. You know, you have a, a police officer testifying about what she had said and, and, and this incriminating information about Kevin where she never even came to court. You know, we don't know who talked to her ahead of time. We know nothing. It's so frustrating with the way memory works as well. Like there's no way now for anybody to find out exactly what happened because memories have shifted and because Richard Warren was under a significant amount of medications. He was under anesthesia, he was under you know pain medications. It's very troubling that nobody can pinpoint exactly when and how the name Kevin came into the case. This is confusing and more than a little concerning to me. I mean, a nurse with a different last name has signed two different affidavits saying two different things. And yet this recorded phone call made it into Kevin's trial as part of the case against him. This makes it all the more complicated to pinpoint the first recorded mention of Kevin Keith's name. Why didn't Richard Warren, when he went in and he went into that restaurant, why did he say, they said his name is Kevin? They said it over and over again. He heard it because that's the story he gave police later. Why did he say it then? Wouldn't it have helped them catch the killer at that very moment? Just doesn't add up. And no, no physical evidence. There was never any physical evidence tying Kevin Keith to this crime. So it's questionable how the name Kevin Keith gets into the case. Did the chief tell you that Rick Warren had identified Kevin? No, he didn't tell me that. He just said, how about if he did say it was Kevin? Well, he, he raised a hypothetical he question. Hypothetical question. Keith's fiance couldn't imagine it. He wouldn't do that. What if they show up during the trial and they say that they've got a witness? What if the wounded guy says, yeah, it was Kevin? I'll just die. I'll just die.
The System is a Spotify original series produced in partnership with Big City TV and Tenderfoot TV. I'm Kim Kardashian, your host and executive producer. From Big City TV, executive producer is Lori Rothschild and Saldi. From Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Lead creative producer is Meredith Stedman. Production, editing, and sound design by Tristan Bankston and Cameron Taggy. Additional sound design by Cooper Skinner. Production manager is Tracy Kaplan. Music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Voiceover work by Miles Agee. Associate producer is Jamie Albright. Mixed and mastered by Cooper Skinner and Devin Johnson. The system contains adult content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Is there anything you can say right now in your own defense? I did not harm anyone. And I love kids. I would never do that to nobody's kids. Never. I did not do this crime. I have never seen a more biased photo lineup for somebody to pick Kevin in this case. And she did not. The fat mask, that's not him. That looks like him, but that's not him because the, the guy you saw doesn't have a lump on his head. Non-identification, research shows, is actually indicative of innocence. And so I argued that her identification actually lends support to the idea that Kevin Keith was not the perpetrator. When I asked Marcia who was that, she said, Kevin Summers. She said, um, she said, um, she said, um, she said she thought about that before your brother started writing on people. Captain Stanley records the call, and this woman identifies herself as Amy Gimmitz, and she is the ICU nurse taking care of Richard Warren. And Amy Gimmitz says he's saying that a guy named Kevin is the one who shot him. The problem is that there is no Amy Gimmitz that worked at that hospital. Can I ask a question? What is that guy's name? Well, I think that, I, Kevin, you got the right first name. It's very troubling that nobody can pinpoint exactly when and how the name Kevin came into the case. So far, we've heard Richard Warren say that his girlfriend told him the name Kevin before she was shot that night. We've heard Juanita say that the shooter was someone named Bruce. The police didn't interview Juanita until after Kevin was arrested. Over the course of several years, while investigating this project, the team reached out to the surviving victims, Juanita Reeves, Quentin Reeves, and Richard Warren, who politely declined to be involved with this project. And we totally understand given the horrific circumstances. I really used to think that justice was black and white, and that if someone did something heinous, the truth would be revealed and the right person would be held accountable. But now, I don't think it's always that simple. I'm Kim Kardashian, and this is The System. Three members of the Chapman family were killed, including four-year-old Marichay Chapman. Three others were shot several times each, but surprisingly did not die. What if one of the survivors from the shooting says that you did this? And I can't believe that, because I wasn't there. Now we're told that's exactly what happened, all three, with the two kids identifying him as Uncle Kevin. We're told Keith shot the kids he once babysat for because he didn't know they were going to be there, but couldn't risk leaving any survivors as witnesses. Our sources say the only part of the plan that backfired. This is the Bucyrus police chief the day after Kevin Keith was arrested. Well, I didn't go to bed last night worried that we had the wrong man. Not at all. After Kevin's arrest on February 15, 1994, news outlets began to report that all three surviving victims had pointed the finger at Kevin Keith. This, in fact, wasn't entirely true. Richard Warren had given the name Kevin, but as you heard, Juanita identified the shooter as Bruce. 
Also, when shown the photo lineup with Kevin's picture as number five, Juanita denied that number five was the gunman that she saw that night. Richard said that he couldn't be 100% sure. motion for a change of venue was filed eight minutes before the trial was set to begin. Keith's attorney, James Banks, called the article which appeared Monday inflammatory and said his client was being denied a fair trial. The morning of the trial, a local newspaper, the Mansfield News Journal, ran the headline, Three Survivors Finger Keith. Police Chief Joe Barron has been interviewed for the article. James Banks brought a copy of the newspaper into the courtroom and presented it to the judge as an example of the media strategically influencing the trial. He argued that the jury might be unjustly influenced by the release of this headline, timed with the beginning of the trial, which was just starting three months after the murders. This man has been tried and convicted uh, in this town by the Mansfield News Journal uh, through information given by the police chief. Uh, through my investigation, and I only had a short time to do it, uh, I found that not only did the chief give this information, but he also called the Mansfield News Journal editor and requested that he run the article. And here it is on the front page headline, the morning that we're to go to trial, uh, stating that the survivors have fingered Keith. And he alludes to fingerprints. There is no lab report whatsoever with fingerprints of Kevin Keith on any type of evidence. This wasn't the first time Banks raised an issue with Kevin's trial. Still, of all the jurors that we've seen thus far, there have been no minorities. Not to suggest that the, the system is not fair or adequate, because we understand how it's done, and it's done through computer and numbers. But when the court has the discretion uh, to increase uh, the number of jurors that can be used as preemptory challenges for our side, we would respectfully request the court to increase that to 12, and um, so there is no question uh, on the defense's side about his ability to be able to uh, pick a fair jury. To help mitigate the defense's concerns about the jury pool, Banks asked the judge for 12 peremptory challenges instead of six. This would allow both sides to reject 12 jurors prior to the start of the trial without having to state a reason. Judge Kemmerlein denied this request. Despite all of these concerns, the trial proceeded and Crawford County is scheduled, leaving Kevin Keith to be tried by an all-white jury. Keith's family and friends are still professing his innocence, and some are questioning the decision of an all-white jury. In Richard Warren's recorded statement, he says that the night of the murders, his girlfriend, victim Marichelle Chapman, mentioned Kevin was involved in some recent drug bust. So if this was true, what was Marichelle talking about? What exactly was Kevin's criminal history? And what would be the motive for this crime? For anyone? This is Chief Joe Barron back in 1994. Well, I don't believe we were looking at any kind of a robbery uh, motive, so I would say that a, a random attack would be, well, I think we've pretty clearly eliminated that as being the motive. So that whoever killed them was trying to kill them? It appears that it was directed towards these people, yes. So if you look into Kevin Keith's past, Kevin Keith was a drug dealer. This is Lori Rothschild again, a TV producer and innocence advocate. He, you know, he was, he's not shy to this day to tell you that he, he didn't have a perfect life. He wasn't, he wasn't a, a, you know, a clean, upstanding citizen. And he wasn't trying to put food on his table. He wasn't trying to feed his kids. He liked the power of selling drugs. That's who he was. And he ran with his family and dealt drugs. But we're not talking really, really big time drug dealer. We're talking about a small time drug dealer, you know. The following interview is between Kevin and Tanya Strong at News 5. 
This interview was conducted while Kevin was in custody. Kevin, you were recently indicted on a cocaine trafficking charge. Yes. And you do have a prior conviction for robbery, I believe a purse snatching from a few years ago. Yes. Someone looking at this might say, well, he has a prior record. What's to stop him from going to the next step and actually killing somebody, especially if he's been involved with drugs and perhaps was not thinking properly, was not of sound mind? I couldn't hurt anybody, Tanya. I don't want to shoot somebody. I couldn't do it. Well, I'm playing devil's advocate here. You stole somebody's purse. I was younger. It was stupid. Detectives are also saying that this is drug related, yet they say the victims were not involved with drugs. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't know anything about that. How have the last 48 hours, last 72 hours been for you? I haven't slept. I laid down, but I haven't slept. I just can't just believe that they would even think I would do a thing like this. Who's they? The police. Why can't you believe that the police would believe you would do it? Because I haven't done anything. Well, I had that one robbery when I touched that purse, but I, I paid for that, and I wouldn't do a thing like that. The only violence on Kevin's record was a robbery. He had previously been charged with pushing down a woman and stealing her bag. The other crimes on his record were thefts and a failure to pay city income tax. In the last episode, we played Richard Warren's interview with the police. In that interview, he stated right before the shootings that Marichelle told him the man in the apartment was named Kevin, but Richard couldn't remember the last name. Richard also stated that Marichelle said the man in the apartment was involved in a recent drug bust. Later on, Richard remembers that the gunman told the family begging for their lives, you should have thought about that before your brother ratted on me. I had a few questions about this. What drug bust was Marichelle referencing? Who was supposedly the rat? And who did the rat tell? People was drug dealing. You know, that's like when, when crack cocaine hit the scene around in like the 80s, but then it kept getting bigger and bigger. So that's what everybody was dealing with, crack cocaine. And Kevin was dealing crack cocaine and my brother was hooked on crack cocaine and he got in trouble with the police and wore a wire on Kevin and his family. And that's how this all happened. That's why this all happened over some drugs. This is Damon Chapman again, victim Marichelle Chapman's brother. Their other brother is Rudell Chapman, allegedly a local drug dealer and at the time a police informant. Because we already knew that, you know, what, what's going on that about the snitch and stuff and they got his family put in jail and stuff and he was the one that wanted revenge on uh, on my brother and like I said he didn't have to shoot no innocent people that didn't do nothing to him even if you know my brother snitched on him or whatever he still didn't have to go there and kill my people but they didn't have nothing to do with it they didn't know nothing that was going on not a dang thing they would still be here if it wasn't from him snitching on Kevin Keith Damon says that he and his family partially blamed his brother Rudell for the murders of Marichal, Marche, and Linda. Damon said his brother Rudell was involved in drugs at the time and had accepted a deal from the police in exchange for ratting on other drug dealers in the area, including Kevin. Again, this is Damon's personal belief. I told him straight out, you, you got my sister killed, you got our niece killed, you know? For the stupid things that you did because you wanted to run around here and be in some on drugs and messing around with these messing around with kevin and all them people you know and i don't care what nobody say he he did that to kevin and kevin then kevin turned around and got revenge by killing my family all over some drug stuff which neither one of them was a man to me Kevin Keith was in fact drug dealing around this time in 1994. A group of dealers, including a few members of the Keith family, had recently been arrested during a drug bust in January, which we'll go into later on. But it's important to note that Kevin was not the only one arrested during this bust. 
Kevin was out on bail for these drug charges when he was arrested for the Bucyrus Estates murders. So why you? Why do they arrest you as the suspect in this? Because I'm black. Again, this is audio from Kevin's interview with Tanya Strong. During the interview, Kevin sits next to his attorney, James Banks, who allows him to answer Tanya's questions. But occasionally, Banks steps in. Think about some of the coincidences, though. You know this family. They say it's drug-related. You have a recent charge against you that involves drugs. So does 20 other people were involved in this same bust recently. And certainly it'd be important to try to think about who all would have a motive instead of just one particular person. Well, let's get back to motive. Uh, there's something else that you told me. When you heard about this crime, you weren't necessarily surprised? No, I was surprised, because I had picked my girl up from work and she came out crying and I was shocked, because I thought it was my, my two nephews in it too. You've been charged with trafficking. Were you trafficking? He can't answer that right now because of the pending litigation, so. The Crawford County prosecutor confirmed Keith was convicted of a theft almost a decade ago. But more importantly, Keith is currently under indictment for cocaine trafficking and was out on bond at the time of the shootings. And other sources tell us the victims were friends of a witness scheduled to testify okay. against Keith in his drug trial and that the shootings were designed to persuade that witness not to talk. The prosecutor would not confirm or deny this. I really don't want to you know, affirm or deny that at this point for reasons that uh, I have to keep kind of to myself now. There's a lot of people that we're interested in protecting, and again, I don't want to try the case in the media. Once I got further into the case, I realized that what everyone believes to be the motive of this case is that Marcel's other brother, one brother, Damon, who ran into the apartment that night. Her other brother is a guy named Rudell Chapman. Rudell Chapman was a known uh, confidential informant for the police. He was known to snitch on local drug dealers um, to keep himself out of harm's way. And it is very common knowledge now that the motive of, the, of this case, regardless of who went into that, apartment and shot those people was because of Rudell's being a confidential informant and snitching. The problem is, which case was he snitching on that would cause a murder, right? That would cause not a murder, but a gruesome murder of women and children. So when you look into Kevin Keith's past, and this is what the cops did, right? So now they have the name Kevin Keith, now they need a motive. And the motive is, okay, well, we know that the killer was after Rudell, but why? Why would he be after Rudell? Well, Rudell just snitched on the Keith family two weeks before when there was a drug raid in Crestline, Ohio. And two weeks prior, there was, right before this, you know, this um, awful massacre happens, the Keith family is caught dealing drugs. And Rudell was the snitch. So to the police, that was enough for them to say, well, he, they're pissed at Rudell, the Keith family's pissed at Rudell, and Kevin being this big drug dealer, took it upon himself to go find Rudell and make him pay for this, right? Other people say you were trying to get back at one of the Chapman family members for being, in essence, the stool pigeon in this drug case. No. Does I that never hurt those kids. Does that motive make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. That was, even if I was charged with a drug crime, that would, it wouldn't provoke me to do something like kill up a bunch of women and kids. Well, you are charged with a drug crime. That wouldn't provoke me to do anything violent like that. And again, if you look at that crime and you look at those drug raids, what was Kevin facing? Kevin wasn't facing really that much, nothing that he was afraid of. I mean, Kevin had, Kevin Keith had already done time in prison. He knew what it was like to go away for a few months. And, and you know, in talking to Kevin and other people who have dealt drugs in this way in my career, 
part of the game. They know that at some point they could get caught. You know, and what are they facing? You know, what are they facing? Well, they're facing, oh, I'll probably have to go away for 90 days. I'm probably going to have to go away for six months, a year and a half, whatever it might be. It's almost part of their existence. It's part of the hustle is knowing that you can get caught, right? That's the way Kevin Keith talks about it and other drug dealers, too, once they get caught. So he wasn't afraid of going to prison, especially for what would have amounted, if you look at the paperwork on that case, to a felony three. A felony three is, you know, it's not great. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not the best thing in the world to have a felony on your record, but Kevin Keith wasn't afraid of that. And he certainly wasn't going to kill Rudell over it based on what I've talked to Kevin about. Like, why would he? Why would he murder children who he babysat for? Women and children. In a, why would he do that? So the question then becomes, well, what about the alternative suspects? Theoretically, the Keith family drug dealings were not the only offenses Rudell could have known about and ratted on. There was other criminal activity happening in the area, and we'll get into that later. Let's take a look back on what we know. We've heard from the surviving victims. We've heard Kevin's alibi. We've established potential motive. So what about the other suspects? Did the police have any other names? When you look at the case file, it seems like they did. There's one police report from the night of the murders that seems inconsequential at first. But when you follow that thread, it brings up a lot of questions. In one of the police reports, um, a Sheriff Schauber, he said he advised that the night of the shootings, he was at the scene, he was sitting in his vehicle, and stated that a man named Rodney Melton was also at the scene and came over to his car and spoke to him. And, you know, again, you have to remember that the sheriff thought it weird enough to actually put it in a case file. Like, he actually went back and had to type this out. Back in 1994, it wasn't like he was cutting and pasting. He was actually typing it on a typewriter. So it had to be really important to include it, right? And he says that he found it curious that Rodney Melton made it a point of knocking on his window and telling him that his own car was broken down and that he had to get a ride from Mansfield to come over when he heard about the, the shootings. From the 30,000 foot view, it might seem like nothing. Some nosy guy knocking on a window and being like, hey, what happened here? I, my car's in the shop. Like, I couldn't get here, whatever. And Sheriff Schauber, again, these people know each other enough. And again, and I didn't, right? So I'm like, oh, that, that's kind of curious. Why would he put that in a report? Why would that be important? The police started investigating, well, who could be this large black man? They didn't know the name Kevin until hours and hours later. They have all night to start putting together the pieces of the puzzle, right? So one of the things about this case is that, is the car, right? Is that cream colored, light colored vehicle that smashes into the snowbank. So the surviving victim is Richard Warren, the guy who got up and ran to the restaurant. And you have Juanita and Quentin Reeves, the little kids who actually survive. The only other person, the only other eyewitness is a woman named Nancy Smathers, and she's one of the neighbors. She's the neighbor who heard the gunshots, who looked out the front door and saw the large black man running, getting into a cream-colored vehicle and smashing it into the snowbank and getting away. When that killer smashed that car into the front end, into the snowbank, it actually left an imprint of the front of that car, including an imprint of the license plate. So they could see three letter numerals, you know, of that license plate in the snow. So they had a partial license plate that night. They had a, a description, large black man, which could be anybody. What does large mean to you? What does large mean to someone else? Cream colored vehicle with a 043 specifically in the license plate. And that's what they had. They had, that's all they had. And they didn't tie Kevin to any vehicle 
at the time of his arrest to any vehicle ever being cream colored with those three numbers. How do you explain the license plate imprint in the snow that detectives say um, perhaps played a role in them fingering you for this as a suspect? I don't even have license plates on my car. There's a 30-day tag. tag on his car. You have a 30-day tag on your car? Yes. And you don't drive any other car? No. With your license plate on it? No. What kind of car did you drive? A Dynasty Chrysler, light blue. What year? 80, 88. Okay. When we get finished with the interview, I'd like the license plate number. Just so that we can hey, compare with you. Where is your car? Um, over Miss Babe's Park. Okay, it's parked there now? Yeah. Okay, it's not found. Okay. Can you explain the license plate, either you or your attorney? Well, uh, my understanding at this point in time is that the prosecutor is not pursuing that because the license numbers that they thought belonged to him, the numbers didn't prove out. But then in talking to him and him verifying the fact that he had 30-day tags instead of steel plates, there's no way a 30-day tag could leave an imprint in the snowbank or however they were uh, calculating that. Weeks after Kevin's arrest, they pull over Melanie Davison in her grandfather's car, which is kind of like a greenish, it's like a green car, it's a greenish bluish car. Just as a reminder, Melanie Davison is Kevin's girlfriend, a secret girlfriend, if you will. This is the woman Kevin went to visit in Mansfield on the night of the murders. She actually goes to visit Kevin in prison, in, in jail. He's, he's in jail at that, that moment. And um, Melanie being Melanie and bringing stuff into Kevin sneaks a joint in to Kevin in his, the waistband of a pair of sweatpants. But she happens to go and do that and takes her grandfather's car. And it's this green colored car that unfortunately has 043 in the license plate. It's a green car, 043. She takes it to the jail to go see Kevin and she gets stopped. She gets stopped because she brings in the joint, but then they're like, hey, wait a minute, this car has a 043 in the license plate. Maybe this is the car that Kevin used to commit the crime. Now, they do, they impound the car, they look in the car, Kevin Keith's DNA, nothing is in that car that matches to Kevin Keith at all. But still, now they have a light-colored car with a 043 that Kevin could have had access to. And they believe that's the car that he used to crash into the snowbank. This is something that sticks with you, right? It's like, and it seems impossible. Like, if you think about it, it's like, that's something that you really trip over in this case. You do, you trip over it. And the other really unfortunate part of it is that Melanie had the tires changed on the car. Now, why would she do that? Over the years that I worked on Kevin's case, Melanie Davison was difficult to get a hold of. Here's Rachel Troutman, Kevin's current attorney from the Ohio Public Defender's Office. She had at least on one occasion expressed that she did not want to be involved and to not contact her. Um, and then one day after Kevin's death sentence was commuted to life, I got a phone call from her and she agreed to talk to me and she agreed to do it under oath. My main question dealt with the tires because nobody knew why the tires had been changed. So in talking to Melanie, she was very, very teary eyed during the whole in, in conversation. She was um, clearly kind of embarrassed, seemed kind of traumatized. She talked about how she would use her grandfather's car on occasion. She had her own car, but she was having uh, multiple different sexual relationships. And some of the men she had relationships with were married. And so from time to time, her car would get um, messed with, as she put it. Uh, I think one time she noted that she thought her tank was sugared. So her car was not working and she needed to get to nursing school. And so she had borrowed her grandfather's car. In January, she said it was about January, 1994, she remembered coming out to go to school and her tires had been slashed. She used her donut and she borrowed a tire from a neighbor, somebody who lived around there. 
and she was able to get the car to Blevins Tires, which was nearby, got four new tires put on the car. And so she was very kind of assuming that the reason this was happening to her was because of her relationships. And she was really, really embarrassed about the idea that her grandfather would find out. And so she she didn't want him asking questions about who would possibly slash your tires. She mentioned how she was their first grandchild and, and kind of the apple of their eye. And I asked her, you know, if he ever found out the truth. And she said that after everything came out, you know, obviously at the time when she had switched out the tires, she didn't know that this car was going to be the subject of, you know, in a murder trial. But after everything came out, she, she told the truth to her grandfather and let him know what had happened. But she was adamant. I mean, she was adamant with the police at the time, and she was still adamant in 2010 when I interviewed her. Kevin had never been in that car, and he had never, certainly never driven it because you know, her grandfather wouldn't have permitted it, and she would not have uh, violated that rule with him. It was probably about three weeks after the crime occurred and, and Melanie was going to visit Kevin in jail. She drove her grandfather's car and she brought, I think it was a pair of sweatpants with a joint in it to go visit Kevin. And she signed in under the name Sherry Brown. Pretty immediately, I believe, she was um, identified as, you know, trying to smuggle in this this marijuana cigarette and that that was not the not a, a correct name. And so the person who was at the desk, they contacted the patrolman who was out on the street, gave him the description of the woman, and he was able to pull her over and, and he noticed the 043. That day, I believe they impounded the car and took it to have it be processed and, and examined for any single piece of forensic evidence they could find that would link it to Kevin into the scene. The police questioned uh, Melanie right after they picked her up uh, with the car. And she described the evening's events from February 13th. And she told them that Kevin you know, came over to her house. She told them about how they went to Gracie Keith's house and they ended up back at her house. Then they also asked her about the car, whether Kevin had ever been in that car. And she said, no, he had not had it that evening. She also talked about how the police never even asked her about you know, whether she had changed the tires on the car. And I asked Aunt Melanie if she happened to have a receipt still. It was 16 years after word, so she said, absolutely, I do not. I believe I tried uh, somehow to locate it, and I think Lori has also <laughs> tried to see if she could identify or find a way to get a receipt um, to prove that sale. That's one of those things that if I could go back in time, and if they had just asked her at the time, maybe th at that point, you know, they could have gone and gotten that receipt but nobody questioned her about it. Um, but regardless, she wanted him to have four matching tires. So then she went to Blevins and got the four matching tires. Here's Melanie. Well, he would have known and they would have wanted to know what was going on. I didn't want him to think that I wasn't taking care of the car. Right. There's a lot of responsibility I felt. I mean, nobody put this on me. This was what I felt that I needed to do. So. I said that I needed to go and get my grandfather some new tires. That's her story. It's flimsy. It's weird. I don't believe, I, I like, do you believe her right away? I, it's weird. Like the whole thing is strange. Like, so the 043 and now you just happen to change all four tires, ones that was used in a murder and they have tire track impressions of the actual getaway car. You know, and so I've talked to Kevin about the car a lot because it bothers me. And every time I talk to him about it, it's always the same answer. It's like, Lori, I never drove that car. I can't tell you. I have no idea. I was never in that car. I was never allowed to drive that car. I was driving Zena's car. I had a blue dynasty. I was in that car. Did they dust it for fingerprints? Go find it. They didn't. They have me in a car that I was never in. And he's consistent in this. So the first piece of the puzzle is, well, who is this large black man? And by the way, Nancy Smather said she saw a cream colored vehicle. And when they started looking at the imprint of that car, the 043, they started looking immediately into who that could be. So I actually have the original report of that. So they start looking into it. So one of the first things that they do is they run a report. 
right? Who in Ohio has a 043 license plate in this in this area and matches a cream colored vehicle. And they do that. And this is February the 14th, hours after. And you can see right from this, this is an actual police report, that Rodney Melton is the suspect that they have. Rodney Melton, cream colored, light colored vehicle. It's a 79 Impala. So he's already on their radar. So probably that's why Sheriff Schauber thought it important that he referenced that Rodney Melton not only knocked on his window and said, hey, what's going on? But he thought it really important to say, hey, my car is broken down. I had to get a ride from Mansfield. What car? You mean your cream colored car that actually matches, not only matches the description of the eyewitness saying the killer got into and got away, but actually has a 043 in the license plate? You mean that car? Why would he tell that? Sounds like he's making an alibi for himself. And why would a sheriff think that that would be important to put into a document for this case? And we know that Rodney Melton grew up and lived in Crestline, and the murders happened in Bucyrus, and that's about 30 minutes away, 30 to 35 minutes away from each other. So um, that's where he lived. Where, where he was that night, I can't tell you. I had no idea how, what the connection was to, to the Chapman family, but I can tell you this. Rodney Melton has a brother named Bruce. So the police had other leads, but the only person charged with this crime was Kevin. You can see these police reports for yourself by visiting the website hyperlinked in our episode description. We'll go deeper into this next time on The System. The System is a Spotify original series produced in partnership with Big City TV and Tenderfoot TV. I'm Kim Kardashian, your host and executive producer. From Big City TV, executive producer is Lori Rothschild and Saldi. From Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Lead creative producer is Meredith Stedman. Production, editing, and sound design by Tristan Bankston and Cameron Taggy. Additional sound design by Cooper Skinner. Production manager is Tracy Kaplan. Music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Voiceover work by Miles Agee. Associate producer is Jamie Albright, mixed and mastered by Cooper Skinner and Devin Johnson. The system contains adult content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Thirty-year-old Kevin Keith was arrested at his home in Crestline, halfway between Bucyrus and Mansfield, by both of those police departments. Police were led to him by the partial imprint of a license plate number left in a snowbank after the getaway car ran into it as it left the scene of the crime. He is charged with three counts of murder for allegedly... The car did not lead them to Kevin. How did he get in jail 15 days before you even found the car? And that started me to investigate and ask questions and everything. And when the car hit into the, the snowbank, it left a, an imprint of the plates. And those plates came back immediately to someone else. The same day of the murder, it came out Rodney Melton, 1979 Chevrolet Impala. They had the 043. There was never any mention of it. And once they got a hold of uh, Melanie Davison, the 043 just popped out all over the place. And they used that 043 to pin that on him and let the other guy go. And I just, I just couldn't believe all that. Why wouldn't they do a thorough investigation? I couldn't answer those questions. You know, I really couldn't answer those questions. I said, it's gotta be some mistake. When I heard Juanita, the little girl, come out and say daddy's friend Bruce, I immediately knew who Bruce was. And I know what Bruce does. And I also know his brother Rodney. Everybody was afraid of him. So how did the car lead them to Kevin Keith? It was, it's impossible. It's impossible. 
As we've heard before, seven-year-old Juanita Reeves identified the gunman as her daddy's friend, Bruce. And it turns out there was in fact a friend of her dad's named Bruce living in the area, Bruce Melton. Rodney and Bruce's names circle this crime in documents and police tape. Rodney was at the scene the night of the crime, saying his car was broken down so he had to get a ride from Mansfield. The name Bruce was brought up by one of the surviving victims. The numbers in the snowbank match Rodney's car. You'd think with all of these possible connections, investigators would have pursued these leads heavily. So did they? Is there more here? Or is it just a coincidence in a small community? I'm Kim Kardashian, and this is The System. Rodney and Bruce are brothers. We know Rodney Melton has a history of violence because he was found to be guilty of a murder at the age of 17. He shot a boy outside of a school dance. This is Lori Rothschild again, a TV producer and innocence advocate. I did pull the police reports and they were at a school dance and Rodney came out, there was an altercation. He got a gun and shot the kid. Rodney has a history with violence and it's you know, it's, it's, it, it's recorded. It's not like, you know, anybody has to make it up and it's not a suspicion. It's, it's true because there's, there's a murder that happens when he's 17. He's able to shoot someone and kill someone at the age of 17. And, and his affiliations with different circles of crime goes on throughout his life. Kevin, as we've covered, didn't have a particularly violent criminal record. He did have a robbery on his record, a purse snatching, where he knocked down a woman to steal her bag. But as we've just heard, another suspect in this crime did have a record of violence, murder to be exact. And that person is Rodney Melton. Of course, this isn't a reason by itself to believe the wrong person is behind bars. It's just context, perhaps important context that didn't really make it to trial or to the public eye. The murder Rodney Melton was convicted for was years ago, when he was 17. But Rodney was also involved in a crime right before the Bucyrus Estates murders, something that didn't come out before trial. In late 1993, pharmacies all over Ohio were getting robbed. All over, within an hour or two vicinity around Crawford County. But they were happening all over the state. And they were all basically being robbed the same way, where the robbers would go and cut the alarm lines. So that would be, you know, their first act was to cut the lines, make sure the alarm doesn't go off. And once they were able to access the place, they would just rob them of all the drugs. Every state has what they call a state board of pharmacy. And this guy, Bill Paget, who's at the state board of pharmacy, starts seeing how many pharmacies are being hit because it's a lot, it's a huge list. So he, he does a compilation of those pharmacies and there's a list in the, the report that he creates and he sees that it's all within this certain vicinity and he starts to investigate on his own. January of 94, there is a pharmacy that's robbed in a town called Frazysburg, Ohio, which is about 90 minutes south of Crestline. There was a witness, this woman watched at the, as, these, as these guys got into and out of a car. She's the one who called the cops and said, there's a really suspicious car that was outside and she had the wherewithal to get the license plate and she reported it. That information then went into the State Board of Pharmacy and they linked that car to a guy named Russell Gardner. And when Bill Paget contacts Crawford County, they're like, oh yeah, we've been, we've been uh, watching those guys for months now. And Gardner is known to the police as being involved with this organized group that were robbing the pharmacies. He, he was well known to the cops. Two people listed in that group was Rodney Melton and Bruce Melton. Along with the Meltons, there were a couple other names on the list that you may be familiar with, including Demetrius Reeves, Juanita and Quentin's father. Again, this was on the radar. The, this group of guys was already on the cops' radar. 
the ring is coming from Crawford County. And Crawford County had created a task force to follow these this ro robbery ring. And the quote from Crawford County was, they were actively working on felony cases against individuals in the group. And that was dated August of 1993. August of 1993. It's been going on for a while. It's now January of 94, right? Here we are six months later. Remember how I said we'd talk about the other criminal activity happening in the Crawford County area? This was the other big investigation going on right before the Bucyrus Estates murders. And it was a much bigger deal than the small time drug dealing being done by Kevin Keith and the other members of the Keith family. And the lead of the task force is a guy named Jerry Hickman, and he's based out of Galleon. Jerry Hickman is the guy who is now contacting Bill Padgett and saying, I'm the guy that's, that's doing the whole thing and gives lots of information to Bill Padgett. In fact, if you look at the report, Jerry Hickman gives daily updates to Bill Padgett, and he tells him he's from the CI that he's working with. By CI, Lori means confidential informant. So Jerry Hickman gives the first report, I think, on the 18th of January. He identifies his CI as being the driver for the ring. We now know that that woman's name is Lynn McKee. So Bill Padgett from the State Board of Pharmacy, anytime a, a CI is referenced, he believes the CI is Lynn McKee. However, we now know, based on looking back into what the task force was doing prior to the State Board of Pharmacy coming into the case, that Lynn McKee was not their CI at first. It was a guy named Rudell Chapman. So Rudell Chapman was the original CI, but when the State Board of Pharmacy came in, Jerry Hickman drops Rudell for reasons unknown and inserts Lynn McKee as his CI. Rudell Chapman was one of the two confidential informants for the police for this pharmacy crime ring. Remember, the murders were at the apartments of Marichelle Chapman, Rudell Chapman's sister. According to Richard Warren, when the gunman entered Rudell's sister's apartment, he said to the pleading victims, you should have thought about that before your brother ratted on me. From everything we've read and heard, it's unanimous that Rudell was snitching on criminal activity in the area. And maybe he ratted on the Keith family. But we can see from Bill Padgett's report that that wasn't the only thing Rudell told cops about. And the pharmacy burglary ring was a much bigger deal in the grand scheme. When I first heard about this, it sounded almost unbelievable to me. Confidential informants? It felt like something out of a heist movie. I asked Kevin's brother, Charles, for some context. So you're down there when you're an informant, all you got to do is tell on somebody. There's only so many black families, so you just tell on somebody and you can keep rolling. That's all it was, family, because, you know, I, we have mutual relatives and you're talking a very small community. So I can be upset and I can tell on you and I can tell on my cousin. It's not like, you know, you're talking as big gangs or like in the city, a big gang will come out and get you. You're down here snitching on friends and family and that kind of stuff. That's all. The 21st of January, this task force does a huge raid in a town called Crestline, where the Keith family, small time drug dealers, drug dealers, but small time, this is not heroin, this is crack, this is probably joints, things like that, but it makes the front page of the paper in Crestline. Huge arrest of these drug dealers. None of the men associated in that arrest were any of the people involved in the pharmacy burglary ring. So Jerry Hickman does like a, by the way, we did a huge, you know, a huge raid on the 21st in Crestline. We got a lot of these guys down. That's what it looks like in the report. And he gives like, again, daily updates from there. The 21st, the 23rd, the 25th, the 26th, 27th. All of these reports are coming in from Hickman about Rodney Melton and this gang of pharmacy burglars the 21st ha kind of happens. The Keith family arrest kind of happens. Kind of like, yay, we got these guys, but that has nothing to do with the State Board of Pharmacy. When Kevin Keith was arrested for the Chapman family murders, he was out on bail for the January 21st drug raid. If you remember, in episode two, Kevin described how he felt when he was being arrested for the murders. He says he was surprised when the police kicked his door in because he hadn't sold any drugs since his last drug arrest on January 21st. According to Kevin, he was laying low, 
waiting out the pending drug charges. The State Board of Pharmacy is like, who cares about those guys, right? And they move on. And then all of a sudden, on the 11th, everything goes silent. There is not one entry from the 11th until the 16th. The murders happen on the 13th of February. And in that next entry, in that next report, Hickman's surveillance, like I said, just went silent. And Hickman tells Paget that it was unrelated and that Kevin Keith committed the crime. That that was it. That's that's he said they caught the killer as his name is Kevin Keith. Kevin's name came up from a police officer by the name of Jerry Hickman. He, at the scene of the crime, was throwing around the name Kevin Keith as the possible person that did this because there was a case against Kevin uh, with Rudell Chapman, one of the family members, as an informant. So everybody already assumed, well, here's a new kid in town. He's a big guy. He hit the description. Uh, let's get him. Charles is right about this, and it's recorded in police reports. Lieutenants David Dane and Jerry Hickman were at the Bucyrus Estates crime scene on the night of the murders. Here's exactly what was written in the case file. Lieutenants Dane and Hickman returned to the scene. They advised that they had went to the hospital and spoken to Riddell, who was still there, but ready to leave and go into hiding. Riddell told them that Rodney Melton had come to the hospital and told Riddell in front of other family members that this happened because Riddell was narking on the people in Crestline. The officers advised the case involving Riddell involved Gene Keith Sr., Gene Keith, Kevin Keith, Demetrius Reeves, and Roy Price. They advised that Gene Keith Sr. had told someone that they were going to whack families in retribution for their arrest. When this police report and the pharmacy burglary reports were shared with me, I found them pretty shocking. The police maintain that there was a strong motive in this case. But the deeper I go, the more it seems like a gray area for me. There were so many people that could have had the same or similar motive. Did the police give all of these potential suspects the same due diligence? Kevin was arrested only two days later. The two police officers that first mentioned Kevin's name had relationships with people in the community. They're quick to name Kevin, but it seems that was purely based on local speculation at the time. Not to mention, Rodney was also in the hospital that night, being vocal about the same motive. At this point, I really wanted to know why. If there were other viable suspects, why was Kevin Keith arrested just two days later? Why would there be such a push to arrest him? Was there a reason law enforcement would be rushing to solve this murder? Thank you very much. So it turns out there was pressure. There was pressure on everyone in local law enforcement to solve this crime because it had received national attention coming all the way up from the White House. President Clinton spoke today at the Ohio Peace Officers Training Academy in London, Ohio, about his anti-crime initiatives. Last year, the Senate passed the so-called Three Strikes and Out provision, requiring life imprisonment for three-time federal felons. The other day, I flew into Shreveport, Louisiana, and the front page of the newspaper had a letter that a teenage girl had written to me. Two days after the murders, President Bill Clinton gave a speech in London, Ohio about his anti-crime efforts. And her letter said this, if I could meet the president, I would ask him to make his top priority crime. Crime is so bad, I'm afraid to go outside. I really didn't pay attention to crime until someone shot and killed my friend, who was one of my church members. My concern is, listen to this, my concern is, I won't have anyone to In that speech, he indicated his support for the three strikes concept, which would make it easier for courts to sentence repeat criminals to life imprisonment. He also endorsed a federal death sentence to killers of police officers. In that speech, Clinton cited the Bucyrus Estates murders by name. Over the weekend, four people were shot and a little girl was killed in an apartment complex in Bucyrus, not too far from here. When President Clinton came to London, Ohio to promote his crime bill speech, there was a murder that happened and he mentioned that murder. Well, they didn't have anybody in jail at that time. So mentioning the Bucyrus murders, they're like, holy shit, the, the president's mentioning this, we better do something. They went and grabbed Kevin while the president was speaking and boom, boom, boom. I thought they were gonna hold him for 48 hours. I said, they're gonna at least question him. They never questioned Kevin to this date. 
President Clinton gave his speech to the Ohio Peace Officers Training Academy at 12.25 p.m. on February 15th. Later that same day, Kevin Keith was arrested in Crest Lane, Ohio. Bill Clinton came out and gave a speech in London, Ohio. He just happened to be in Ohio and gave that speech. I really do think the atmosphere really changed where people wanted to help. I mean, you've got a president of the United States and he's talking about a case. It is in their small town. And I really do believe that's why they said it was me. We have to look inside too. Yes, there's a role for the Congress. Yes, there's a role for the police, but there's a role for the American people too. You can't make me believe that we can't take our streets back and give our kids their futures back. And we're gonna do our best starting with a crime bill. We want you to help us. Thank you and God bless you. The timing of President Clinton's anti-crime speech in Ohio is remarkable to me. It seems like just another one of these strange odds stacked against Kevin. trial beginning, me and my attorney was just going back and forth because I didn't have the money to pay the guy. I was making promises to him, and uh, that was the situation. I had no money for no experts, none of that. All I know, I didn't do it, and I was standing on that. Which is exactly. like why your brother is like so amazing and commendable that your brother has spent so much time. What's the thing about my brother Charles? He done went through 100 pair of tennis shoes. I mean, everybody I ran into that's from Canton, the first thing they tell me is, man, your brother, <laughs> I seen him walking on this side of town. I seen him here, and all he talks about is you. And all he talk So he's a little bit obsessed. You know, really, I would like to talk to my brother sometime, but he's so kind of caught up, you know, and that's my brother. I, but I want to, sometime I want to call him, and I want to talk to my brother, but he's been in this fighting mode for so long. When I talk to him, I'm always talking to a supporter mm -hmm. and an advocate. And I just want to talk to my brother sometimes. Like, I need that sometimes. So... I understand. Yeah. You also need that normalcy and that connection also, instead of just, like, focusing just on the case. Well, especially, especially with him, because that is my brother, my older brother. Yeah. And I can see it kind of, it's, kind of, it's kind of breaking him, you know, it's kind of breaking him, so... You know, I could tell. I mean, I could tell this. This kind of, you know, this, 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 it, yeah, it has affected him in a, a way that I just wish he could kind of go on with his life too. Because 28 years is a long time, and Charles has been at it 28 years. If I get on the phone with him right now, he's an advocate. He's not my brother. I got divorced. I don't even remember what year. It was a few years, it might have been five years after, but everything in our life had turned to Kevin. The floors were full packed with papers. There was stuff on the walls, and that's all we talked about. And, you know, she wanted to go have a good time. The normal things that a couple wants to do, well, all that had died with us, actually with me. And I didn't feel like doing any of these things anymore. She was helping me, and it just got to be too much for her. It wasn't her brother, it wasn't her passion. So, you know, we got divorced. Um, I never even thought about the divorce because that wasn't the worst thing happening, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it gave me an opportunity to really go mad crazy and dig, 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 dig. I could stay up all night. I could go anytime I wanted. I mean, I could do all the things that I needed to do, but had I had a family, it would not have gone like that. We actually had to fire the first attorneys that we had. They did nothing. They did not talk to me. I had all these documents, and every time I went down there to show them one, they would take and make a copy of it. I said, you guys don't have this stuff? And I found out that they didn't have any of it. Kevin says, Chuck, I'm not going to die with these attorneys, so he fired them. I think he went like maybe six months or more without an attorney. After that, the Ohio Public Defender's Office got involved, and they gave us Rachel Troutman. You know, and she told me that Kevin had no more appeals left, which those first attorneys made sure that they were burnt. There's no more appeals. And once you have no more appeals, they're about to set a date. The only thing that we can argue is actual innocence. 
And that was the first time I've heard of that. I says, well, he is actually innocent. I says, here, you can have all the evidence that I have. I brought boxes. And you can have it. It's not going to do me any good. So I went home. And about three, four months later, they called me. And they says, hey, can you come down here? After Kevin was convicted in 1994, Charles worked tirelessly with his brother on this case, even when it seemed like Kevin's legal counsel wasn't getting anywhere. In 2007, Kevin finally got represented by Rachel Troutman. She began researching Kevin's case, but it took until 2010, the year of Kevin's execution, for a significant movement. When they were getting ready to execute him and they were going to take him out, Chuck, they're getting ready to move me. That's the only time I've ever kissed a man on the lips. It was a kiss of goodbye. I can see it plain as day. I said, damn, man, it, take my brother out. And it didn't happen. He got no, he didn't even make the ride to Lucasville. He said, dang, man, I mean, the clemency came through. And I mean, I'd have bowed at Rachel's feet. I'd have kissed her feet for what she had done for me. Because, I mean, it was a nightmare. I was like, here we are. If she loses this clemency, it's over. There's no second shot. And that's one of the thing that scares me about this. You get one shot at everything. One shot. Everything at that time, it was just so kind of harried. It was like we were waiting any day now. He was supposed to get an execution date. This is Rachel Troutman, Kevin's current attorney. When I first you know, started to help out on the case, it felt very kind of not hopeless, but it just the odds of, of, of something good happening. It, it just felt very, it was very uncomfortable because it felt like everything was laid out there for the jury and there are all these these you know pieces of evidence that should have somewhere along the way caused a court to say this is the wrong person and granted a new trial but that hadn't happened it had been argued it had been presented it was it's laid out in front of how many judges and so when we when I first started to help on the case, it was like, what do we do here? You know, everybody's heard it and they don't care. One of my go to things was I would read through old newspaper articles because there are a lot of people who would speak to the, to a reporter who didn't end up testifying at, at trial. And so I was kind of curious to see what that looked like. And our office maintains kind of a database of, of old newspaper articles. And so as I'm going through these old articles, one of the witnesses that Kevin's defense attorneys had called was this guy, Rodney Melton. So his name was in one of the newspaper articles referencing Kevin. And also in that newspaper article, it referenced in uh, a pharmacy burglary ring that was um, that a bunch of people had just been arrested for, you know, their, their role in, in uh, robbing a bunch of pharmacies across Ohio. And it, uh, it listed the name of the pharmacy board investigator who had kind of put it all together. So I reached out to that pharmacy board investigator and I asked for all of his records concerning that, um, that investigation for the pharmacy burglary ring, starting from before the, the time that the crime occurred, the one that Kevin is convicted for, and ending after. Because the, this person, Rodney Milton, was the alternative suspect. And so if he was under investigation through that time period, even if that investigation had nothing to do with, with, with Kevin in this case, I thought maybe there would be something in there demonstrating where he was during the time um, that these murders occurred. And you know, I, I saw in those materials that two weeks before the murders occurred, Rodney Melton had told a, a confidential informant that he was paid $15,000 to uh, essentially commit this crime. When I heard this, I couldn't believe it. In the pharmacy burglary report, Rachel found documentation of Rodney Melton threatening to commit a violent crime. There's actually a paper trail of this, and yet it was never presented in court during Kevin's trial. According to the report, Rodney had told Hickman's confidential informant that he was paid $15,000 to cripple the man who was responsible for the raids in Crestline, Ohio last week. This report was logged on January 31st, 1994, meaning Rodney was referring to the Keith family drug raid. We've already heard that Rudell was the informant for the drug raid. And if you're putting two and two together here, that means Rodney would have been threatening Rudell with this statement. Rudell Chapman, whose sister was Marichelle Chapman, a victim of the Bucyrus murders. 
don't remember. The shooter said, you should have thought about that before your brother started ratting on people. Whoever opened fire on apartment 17B was looking for Rudell. When I started to investigate and when we first found that the pharmacy board file, the day I got it, the, the, the moment, I think, the moment I saw that quote uh, about Rodney Melton being paid $15,000 to commit the crime, I emailed my boss. I still have the email and said, I just became convinced that I'm going to win this case. And I was. I mean, even if you have Kevin as a suspect, you still have Rodney as a suspect. You have all those guys that Rudell supposedly snitched on, all nine of those. You have everybody that was involved in the pharmacy burglary. I mean, these are all suspects. Now, it's funny because as we sit here right now, we haven't said a whole lot about Kevin, who Kevin is. I mean, all this stuff, we're talking about everybody else because that's what I saw. I'm like, this ain't even nothing to do with Kevin. They just inserted him. That was it. Despite the possibility of other suspects, Kevin was the only one ever arrested and charged with this crime. Was this case investigated thoroughly? The more I hear, the more I'm skeptical. And the more I feel there's at least reasonable doubt about Kevin's guilt. If every avenue wasn't explored, who's at fault for that? Who's ultimately responsible for the mismanagement of a case like this? You know, it's really hard to say what the specific motivations of some of these police officers were, but I don't think it's too hard to imagine that some short-term gains related to power on a very small local level were enough to entice them to, to do what they felt they had to do. We'll get into this more next time on The System. The System is a Spotify original series produced in partnership with Big City TV and Tenderfoot TV. I'm Kim Kardashian, your host and executive producer. From Big City TV, executive producer is Lori Rothschild and Saldi. From Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Lead creative producer is Meredith Stedman. Production, editing, and sound design by Tristan Bankston and Cameron Taggy. Additional sound design by Cooper Skinner. Production manager is Tracy Kaplan. Music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Voiceover work by Miles Agee. Associate producer producer is Jamie Albright, mixed and mastered by Cooper Skinner and Devin Johnson. The system contains adult content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. I'll be the first to admit that this case can be confusing. There's so many players here. So I want to remind you what we've heard so far. In the months leading up to the Bucyrus Estates murders, there was a pharmacy burglary ring operating in Ohio. Pharmacies were being broken into and the stolen drugs were being sold. Members of the ring included Rodney Melton, Bruce Melton, and Demetrius Reeves, the father of Juanita and Quentin. This ring is well documented in the official reports by the State Board of Pharmacy. Demetrius Reeves was an accomplice of Rodney and Bruce Melton. He was also supposedly a friend of Kevin Keith. January 21st, 1994. Kevin and several of his family members were arrested during a drug raid. By the time the murders occurred, Kevin was out on bail awaiting pending drug charges. Though this is documented in the pharmacy burglary report, no one involved in the raid in Crestline was part of the pharmacy ring. The Board of Pharmacy and the Galleon Police Station were still monitoring the burglary ring when the Bucyrus Estates murders occurred. The Galleon police officers leading this charge were Lieutenants Jerry Hickman and David Dane. Rudell Chapman was one of their confidential informants during this time. The other was named Lynn McKee. It's believed that Rudell was the intended target of the shootings on February 13th at the Bucyrus Estates complex due to his ratting to the police. January 31st, 1994. 
Jerry Hickman reported to the Board of Pharmacy that an informant heard that Rodney Melton was paid $15,000 to cripple the man that was responsible for the drug raids the week before. The officers in charge of the pharmacy burglary ring investigation were aware of this reported threat, and it's documented in the report, though it's unclear who would be paying Rodney Melton the $15,000. Why wasn't the person who made these reported threats treated as a main suspect? And why didn't the police do more to protect Rudell and his family? Maybe they didn't take it seriously, but that threat was reported two weeks before the murders. February 13th, 1994. The murders at the Bucyrus Estates complex take place. That night at the crime scene, Lieutenant Dane and Hickman said they heard Kevin's name mentioned in connection with the crime while they were at the hospital with the victim's families. According to them, Rudell Chapman said Rodney was at the hospital that night, accusing him of being the reason why all of this happened. Rodney Melton showed up to the crime scene later as well mentioning his card broken down and asking about the kind of bullets used. February 15th, 1994. Two days after the murders, Bill Clinton gave his anti-crime speech in London, Ohio. That same day, Kevin Keith was arrested. Kevin Keith was arrested at his home in Crestline, halfway between Bucyrus and Mansfield. He is charged with three February 18th. Three days after Kevin's arrest, Juanita was interviewed by police at the hospital. She was shown Kevin's photo in a lineup and said it was not him. This is also when she mentioned the name Bruce. Though the pharmacy burglary investigation was happening in tandem with the Bucyrus Estates murders investigation, none of this information was presented in court during Kevin's trial. Despite the connections between the cases, it was never brought up at all. This case is messy, and the more you dig, the more complicated it gets, but also the more instances of negligence and possible corruption you find. If not all of this information was available in court, can you trust the results of the Bucyrus Estates murder trial? Remember, it's the state's burden to pursue all possible suspects to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Kevin committed this crime. Did the state meet this requirement? I'm Kim Kardashian, and this is The System. A lot of things don't add up super clearly in this case, but the more you talk to people, the more they do start to align. It's kind of like that classic idea of putting together a puzzle. My name is Eric Sandy, and I'm a Northeast Ohio-based journalist and editor, and I've been covering the courts and criminal justice-related stories for the past 12 years. I wrote this feature on uh, the Kevin Keith case in 2017, and that was for Cleveland Scene magazine. The official story is uh, about as open and shut as possible, according to the theory that the state put forth back in 1994. What I came to find out was that it's a much more complicated story that involves the interplay between local police, judges and courts officials um, and, and prosecuting attorneys, as well as a completely separate criminal case involving pharmacy burglaries that were taking place across the state of Ohio about a year before the murder. And thus the, the puzzle grew more complicated and, and more interesting because I started to see that there was a lot going on around Kevin Keith. When those puzzle pieces started interlocking, it started casting the murder in a completely different light. And once you threw all those puzzle pieces under the table, Kevin Keith as an individual didn't fit into that story so much as everybody else. Kevin Keith is kind of on the periphery of that in this community in, in Crestline, Ohio. You know, a, a murder case where someone's very quickly convicted and goes to jail is uh, a tragedy, first of all, but it's not explicitly a story. It doesn't 
tell us too much about what's happening in a community at a given time in the state of Ohio. Everything else around Kevin Keith, including what I just said, including the police and, and the local courts officials, that does tell a story about something that happened in the state of Ohio at a certain time that has ramifications that continue to play out to this day. And it further rots away at the system itself. In 1993 into early 94, there were a string of pharmacy burglaries where essentially narcotics were being stolen, mostly in like liquid form and, and pill form, and then inevitably sold on the streets in, in central Ohio. The State Board of Pharmacy was investigating this and had enlisted essentially a task force that included a few police officers from Galleon, Ohio. And that's very close to Bucyrus and Crestline. Those police officers were Jerry Hickman and David Dane. They were brought on to essentially investigate these pharmacy burglaries. In fact, Hickman and Dane had been tailing this ring for six months prior to the Board of Pharmacy getting involved. And one of the crucial documents that, that had been uncovered before I came around by the attorneys in this case was a State Board of Pharmacy investigative narrative that broke down day by day what this task force was doing, what they were finding, and who they were interacting with. That included informants, that included the actual pharmacies themselves. The reason that that's very interesting in this case is that the day-by-day -day narrative eventually catches up to February 1994, which is when the murders in Bucyrus take place. Captain Keith charged with murdering a Bucyrus family on February the 13th. The overlap between this investigation into the pharmacy burglaries and the investigation into the Bucyrus murders is uh, a pretty notable Venn diagram. Uh, the two criminal cases involve a lot of the same people, a very similar time frame. It's difficult to not notice that. Jerry Hickman is visible on, on both these cases in the police reports from the Bucyrus Police Department. Not only does Rodney Melton show up on the scene, but Jerry Hickman does as well, who again is not a Bucyrus police officer and, and was not at the time, but rather a Galleon police officer. A lot of a lot of departments and you know first responder agencies will certainly cooperate with one another across city lines. You see this a lot with fires or medical emergencies. There's certainly reason to suspect that a police officer who is investigating pharmacy break-ins would be at the scene of a murder that has explicit connections to the informant in that case who he'd been working with and potentially the suspects in those pharmacy break-in cases. Because again, the people who are murdered at the apartment that night were not the intended target. They were not informing on any pharmacy break-in suspects, but they were the family of that person. So there are explicit connections between the work that Jerry Hickman was doing investigating pharmacy break-ins and the people who were targets of a, a murder that had been set up that night in Bucyrus. Jerry Hickman was the lead on the pharmacy burglary ring case. Though he was based in Galleon, he shows up with Lieutenant Dane at the scene of the crime in Bucyrus. They provide the first mention of Kevin's name, which they supposedly heard at the hospital that same night. The pharmacy burglary ring seems to have nothing to do with Kevin Keith. He wasn't even one of the members of the ring, and yet his family's drug bust is documented in the pharmacy burglary ring reports, and the officers at the helm of the investigation named Kevin as a potential suspect at the scene of the crime. These are the same officers that were aware of the threats allegedly made by Rodney Melton in January. So if these officers were becoming involved in the Bucyrus murder case, why wasn't Rodney's reported threat ever brought up at trial? I kind of walked away from the initial reporting on this story feeling just far more disillusioned with low-level local police officers than I even had before. 
it becomes very clear how simple tasks that are being carried out by local police can very quickly spiral out into much broader implications, including other criminal cases, other communities entirely, other types of crimes, things like pharmacy break-ins and, and drug sales and murders. Again, not that the police officers are explicitly committing these crimes, but they're certainly, in this case and in many other cases, not preventing them and not discouraging these types of activities. And in fact, because they're often working very closely with confidential informants or the suspects in, in certain cases, they're very close to this kind of behavior. And by letting it go or by turning a blind eye, so to speak, and possibly even benefiting from the ramifications, these kinds of cases can very quickly get out of hand. My question is, what was in it for the police? What was in it for the police to just rush to close this case? Because to me, if we're uncovering these details years later, it seems this case was not handled properly and transparently in 1994. In cases like this, one of the questions that emerges, of course, is what's in it for the local officials? Because a lot of that is shrouded in darkness itself and is, is sort of contained within the individual police officer's own decision-making processes, my interpretation is short-term gains. You know, the freedom to operate on their own, away from the scrutiny of higher public offices or, or state-level offices, let's say, in this case. The ability to kind of be a big fish in a small pond, which is, I think, uh, a metaphor that we've all run into in one way or another. You see this a lot in the corporate world, but you certainly see it in the policing world too, where these little fiefdoms that exist all over the country, and certainly would include a place like Bucyrus or Galleon or Crestline, Ohio, police officers there, just as a general rule, have quite a lot of power. But I don't think it's too hard to imagine that some short-term gains related to power on a very small local level were enough to entice them to, to do what they felt they had to do. In any case that I've taken on so far, this is a common through line. Small town police rushing to solve something and sticking with their story no matter what, even when it seems like there's reasonable doubt. The thing is, the pharmacy burglary ring and the investigation around it was left out of Kevin's trial in 1994. As Eric Sandy said, this case is like a Venn diagram, and the burglary ring is one of those circles. But when Kevin went to trial, it's like that part of the story didn't even exist. I think Eric Sandy said it well. It can be hard to have faith in low-level police officers that are dealing with a case of this magnitude. There was pressure to solve this crime, especially after Clinton's anti-crime speech in Ohio. And it's believable to me that these officers doubled down on the version of the story that seemed good enough without having exhausted all options. To me, it seems, once they arrested Kevin only two days later, they did everything in their power to bolster that narrative, rather than explore other loose ends and make sure that Kevin was guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt. The police and the state knew that another man was capable of committing this crime and never brought it to trial. That's exculpatory evidence and that's a Brady violation. A Brady violation is a very serious violation of due process. It's defined as the government's withholding of evidence that is material to the determination of guilt or punishment of a criminal defendant. This withholding of information violates the defendant's constitutional right to due process. And not all of the information surrounding Kevin's case was presented to the court and made available to legal counsel before trial. That's Brady. That's a Brady violation. That should, at that moment, give Kevin a new trial because it was never entered into court. Kevin went to death row. They could have killed him. This was a death penalty case. No one would research this case. No one would give a shit. What they did, in fact, ran was Charles Keith. Keith's brother Charles helped deliver 10,000 signatures to Governor Ted Strickland Tuesday, urging him to stop next month's planned execution. The information found in the pharmacy board reports about Rodney Melton being paid $15,000, that was a Brady violation, but it wasn't the only Brady violation. 
This was a Brady violation among several that we'd found. This is Rachel Troutman, Kevin's current attorney from the Ohio Public Defender's Office. The state has the burden of proof, and because they're supposed to seek justice, if they have anything in their possession that is exculpatory, that, that undermines the state's case and, and is helpful to the defendant, they're required by the Constitution to turn it over. Exculpatory evidence is evidence that helps the defendant and that undermines the state's case. It tends to disprove that the person committed the crime. For example, with Kevin's case, since they were alleging that Kevin is the person who shot six people, then the fact that there was evidence demonstrating that somebody else said they committed these crimes, that is exculpatory to Kevin. Brady violations are very serious prosecutorial misconduct. It goes to the core of the trial and it goes to the job of the prosecutor. You know, we need to be able to trust that the people who are, are putting somebody on the stand and saying, you know, please convict this person, find beyond a reasonable doubt that they belong in prison or, or should be sentenced to death. You know, we need to trust that not only do they believe it, but that they are doing their job to the best of their ability and following all the constitutional obligations. When you find a Brady violation, especially one as significant as this, much less all of them together, it requires a new trial. In 2007, we filed our first motion for a new trial for Kevin, and we made the argument that the prosecutor had withheld from Kevin's defense the evidence that implicated Melton as the perpetrator. But the court said that Kevin had made this argument already, that Melton was the killer, and that the jury had rejected it, and that since much of this was already inferred at trial, it didn't matter enough to require a new trial. Kevin, we have requested a new trial on multiple different occasions for multiple different reasons, most of which being prosecutorial misconduct, and he has never been granted a new trial. He's never even been granted a hearing. Despite the fact that the pharmacy burglary investigation wasn't presented to the judge, the jury, or legal counsel during Kevin's trial, arrests had been made by law enforcement by May of 1994. They had uh, arrested Rodney. This is Charles, Kevin's older brother. He was arrested on the burglary, pharmacy burglary trial, so he was downstairs in the uh, Crawford County Jail, and they just brought him up and asked him a couple of questions. And when that lawyer had Rodney on the stand, there was a zillion and one questions he could have asked him because I was thinking of those questions. They asked him if he did it. He says, no. He says, if you did it, would you tell us? He says, I'm sure I would. Before resting its case, the defense called Rodney Melton to the stand. You don't recall asking the sheriff about the casings and jackets that night? No, sir. And you didn't have anything to do with these killings on February the 13th, 1994. No, sir. You would tell us if you did, wouldn't you? I think I would. During the trial, the attorney asked Rodney Melton about when he brought up bullet casings to the sheriff at the scene of the murders. Rodney responded saying he didn't recall that. But we have the police report that states otherwise. Here's what it says. At 1200 hours, I spoke to Sheriff Schauber. He advised that the night of the shooting, he was at the scene and remained in his vehicle. He stated that Rodney Melton was also at the scene and came over to his car and spoke to him. We found it curious that Rodney made a point of telling them about how his car was broken down and he had to get a ride from Mansfield to come over when he heard about the shootings. Rodney also asked him if the bullets used were full jacketed 9mm, which they were, and if they were, the shooters were probably from Detroit, as his son was killed in Detroit, and that's what was used to kill him. Now, why he was at the scene of the crime, I don't understand, but he had told them that the bullets used were jacketed bullets, and he talked to Sheriff Schauber, and then when the ballistics came back, they were jacketed. Rodney's brother, Bruce, was called to the stand, too. 
The defense was trying to link Bruce Melton to the crime, but he denied any role in the shootings. Where were you the night of February 13th, 1994? Columbus, Ohio. I have no further questions. Thank you. Demetrius Reeves was also getting ready to be a witness against Rodney in the pharmacy burglary. He was one of the, going to be the, one of the main witnesses. Well, you realize it was Demetrius Reeves' kids who got shot. If Demetrius knew more than he let on, why wouldn't he have said so? Fear, and then you're looking at incriminating himself. Um, he knew that they were not going to arrest Rodney. So it would have been him and Rodney out there. And he just said, I, just, I don't know who did it. I just want whoever did it to be arrested. He spoke to me years later, but he was at that point, he was, especially talking to me, convinced that Kevin Keith was the guy who shot his children. Convinced. There may be more to the story when it comes to Demetrius being vague on the stand. Demetrius was facing his own criminal charges, along with Rodney and Bruce, due to the pharmacy burglary ring. And it turns out the charges were quite serious. They were facing RICO charges, which are given in connection with racketeering activity and organized crime. The pharmacy burglary ring falls under this, and there's reason to believe the ring was facing life in prison. By May of 1994, when Kevin's trial was taking place, Demetrius had also been called to testify against Rodney in the upcoming pharmacy burglary ring trial. So months after Kevin's arrest conviction, and he's now on death row, the pharmacy burglary ring case goes to court. This is a very big trial for the state board of pharmacy. It's, a, it's huge for the state of Ohio. It's huge for Crawford County. Now this is, imagine, this is a 99 count indictment against the pharmacy burglary ring, which includes Demetrius Reeves, Rodney Melton, Bruce Melton. They're all on trial with a RICO charge. Now when you think about what these guys are facing it really speaks to motive as to why someone would want to go after the CI. So a RICO charge it was actually created back in the 70s and it's the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. It was like the mafia, that's what it was created for. And the idea behind a RICO charge is that only charging for the underlying crimes, it would, it would be inadequate. You know, it doesn't truly reflect the crime that has happened. If they were just charged for burglary charges, it's not enough. The fact of the matter is, is that they were a ring, that they were a group. So because they were a group and they were organized to do these smaller burglaries, those smaller charges aren't enough. So the, so the RICO charge allows a more substantial sentencing. Definitely Rodney and Bruce were facing RICO charges because we have a subpoena in the file where Demetrius Reeves is subpoenaed to testify against Rodney and Bruce on RICO charges. If Rodney thought that someone was snitching on them for this pharmacy burglary ring activity that they were doing, and they were the leaders of the group, he and his brother, that he was facing life in prison if he got caught. You gotta think about that as a criminal. Demetrius Reeves also took the stand but Reeves said he was in Crestline on February 13th, the night of the murders, and he denied having any part in the shootings. Did you, uh, did you shoot your children? No. Do you have any reason to believe that Rodney or Bruce Melton did? I don't know. I don't know if they did or not. I just, I just, whether whoever did it, I just want to did it car. Then they played the tape, and that's when Kwanita said, my daddy's friend, Bruce, and when using that word friend, man, that's key. She didn't just say it was Bruce, she said it's the friend. And then when the pharmacy burglary come out, and you look at Demetrius getting ready to testify and turn state's evidence against Rodney and Bruce, some kind of friend, isn't it? It sounds like Demetrius was a friend of both the Keiths and the Meltons, but he didn't take a strong allegiance to either family when he was on the stand. Remember, Kevin said in his media interview with Tanya Strong that he was sure Demetrius knew that he loved his kids. How did you know them? Because their dad and I spent a lot of time together. We're like best friends. They came over a lot of lot this summer and you know, I fed them and their dad was going through bad times with a divorce and I was there to comfort him. And Demetrius' two kids, I love them like I love my own and he knows that. I believe deep down inside, he really knows that. But that's not how it played out during the trial. 
Though there are several things that don't look good for Kevin in this case, the same could be said for some other players here. In particular, Rodney Melton's name is sprinkled throughout the police reports. He was attached to the license plate numbers. He was at the scene of the crime on February 13th. And also, as we've covered last episode, police reports state that Rodney was at the hospital that same night, accusing Rudell of being the reason this all happened. In fact, an article in the Bucyrus Telegraph Forum ran this statement, citing a source that wished to stay anonymous. The man said a mutual acquaintance met Chapman family members at the hospital shortly after the shootings and described the gunman before anyone but eyewitnesses could have known such details. How was Rodney Melton so involved to help implicate Kevin? Why was he at the hospital? If you look into most of the report, Rodney stated this, Rodney stated that, Rodney said this and Rodney did that. I, I just couldn't believe that. That's what I thought was the most interesting about his testimony. Like he said, they asked him about his car or whatever, and they just believed him. For the jury, it was almost as if, since the police believe him, then we should believe him. He's not, he's been cleared. I think the biggest question is why would they protect him, right? It's still the big question, right? If this guy was a viable suspect, why wouldn't they investigate and find the pharmacy board report? Well, when it comes to the pharmacy burglary investigation, there may have been some bad police work going on. And the first place to start is with a closer look at the other informant, Lynn McKee. She was the driver. She was the driver of the ring, admittedly. She tells the police that she's driving. And so she's exchanging that information for, you know, probably a lesser charge or immunity or something. I don't know. It's not listed anywhere as to what she was offered by, by Jerry Hickman. I don't know if they ever realized that Lynn McKee was acting as a confidential informant. They certainly knew that when they got arrested, once this information actually went out. And obviously during their trial, they realized that. And inside of that trial, it's revealed that Lynn McKee is the CI providing information to the police. And it's then revealed that she's sleeping with the lead detective, Jerry Hickman. Lynn McKee was the CI and, and lucky for them that Lynn McKee was because Lynn McKee strikes up a romantic relationship with Jerry Hickman. And because of that, it's a conflict of interest. And as soon as that comes up, the judge says this information is invalid. We can't None of this information that she supplies anymore is could be real because she's in a relationship with a detective. She could be making this whole thing up. She becomes a, you know, an ineffective witness, if you would. So the lesser charges, uh, there are some lesser charges that the burglary ring gets. They do serve some time, but not the 99 count and the RICO charge, which could have resulted in all of them going life in prison. So Lynn McKee saves their ass yet again, and she's still married to Jerry Hickman to this day. I was out there, I knocked on their door and saw her myself. Jerry Hickman ended up entering into a romantic relationship with one of the confidential informants from the pharmacy burglary ring, Lynn McKee. Lori approached Hickman and McKee's house in the pursuit of a statement for this podcast, but was turned away. Remember, Hickman was the lieutenant from Galleon who showed up at the Bucyrus Estates murder scene with Lieutenant Dane. They are the ones that first said Kevin's name, according to Bucyrus police reports. Lynn McKee is the one who reported Rodney's threat about being paid $15,000 to cripple the man responsible. She was the one who made the initial report that was withheld from defense counsel during Kevin's trial. When the drug ring was eventually tried later in 1994, I was told that it was Hickman's clandestine relationship that ended up costing that investigation. Hickman had played such a significant part in that investigation, so when his credibility was ruined due to that relationship, it just damaged their case beyond repair. Though the members of the pharmacy burglary ring were eventually tried for their crimes, due to the mismanagement of the case, they all just got reduced sentences. Ultimately, no one served that life sentence for the RICO charges. After the pharmacy burglary ring trial, Jerry Hickman just faded away from public service, and so did David Dane. 
In fact, David Dane retired from duty on June 1st, 1994. It was one day after Kevin was sentenced to death. Hickman had retired on February 27th of 1995, and it was only a few months after the pharmacy ring trial ended. An affair with an informant is a pretty serious breach of morality when it comes to law enforcement duty. To me, it's feasible that a man who would cross this line wouldn't think twice about not turning over evidence of another possible suspect. If Hickman would risk interfering with the case so much as to strike up a relationship with his CI, what else would he think was acceptable conduct? It may not have been a purposeful withholding of information, and maybe it was just an oversight, but the fact remains. This information mattered, and it wasn't reported. So what does this all amount to? This whole narrative about the pharmacy burglary ring, this is all exculpatory evidence that should have been available to defense counsel at the time of Kevin's trial. In May of 1994, this was not available information. Therefore, the omission of this concurrent case could have been a serious Brady violation and an infringement on Kevin's rights as a defendant. Had Kevin's lawyer, James Banks, known about this information, had they provided it to him, he could have brought up those threats that were made by Rodney. And to me, there seems to be reasonable cause to investigate others that had similar motives. There are a lot of people who were ratted on by Rudell Chapman. But again, Kevin was arrested only two days after the murders. At the end of the day, I just want to emphasize how imperfect the system is. No matter what you believe about this case, do you consider this due process? This mismanagement is enough to tell me that this case deserves a second look. But I assure you, this isn't the last twist of this winding road, and we haven't put the last pieces of the puzzle together yet. Another thing is that I had discovered was letters that was written during Kevin's trial. There was a letter written from Rodney Melton to Detective Corwin, you know, describing some things. And I think he wrote that letter on May 19th. Kevin's trial started May 10th. That's when they started their 40 year and putting together the jury and all that stuff. So I think it was, yeah, May 19th is when Rodney wrote that letter, two page letter and sent it to the police officer. And that was never turned over to defense. It was never turned over to anybody. And we have those letters. Here's an excerpt from the one Charles is referring to. May 19, 1994, Mr. Mike Corwin. Rodney Melton knew Michael Corwin from his youth. They grew up together in the same community. I'm sort of disappointed for various reasons, and I'll explain or try to. First of all, I gave my parole officer my word that I would help or try to. And he goes on to say, I tried to help you, Mike. And I probably would have been a total help if my car would have been running. I probably would have been a better help if I would have been awakened different. Mike, not all black men are totally going bad. It takes a little goodness of heart to not get lost in the madness and ignore all the rules. Mike, this madness all over the country has got to stop. And I pray it's not too late. So what was the nature of this relationship? And why did Rodney feel the need to write these letters to the lead detective? We'll get into this and Detective Corwin's correspondence next time on The System. The System is a Spotify original series produced in partnership with Big City TV and Tenderfoot TV. I'm Kim Kardashian, your host and executive producer. From Big City TV, executive producer is Lori Rothschild and Saldi. From Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Lead creative producer is Meredith Stedman. Production, editing, and sound design by Tristan Bankston and Cameron Taggy. Additional sound design by Cooper Skinner. Production manager is Tracy Kaplan. Music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Voiceover work by Miles Agee. Associate producer producer is Jamie Albright, mixed and mastered by Devin Johnson. The system contains adult content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Last episode, we talked about the pharmacy burglary ring. 
the informants involved with that investigation, including Rudell Chapman, and the threat that was recorded in the pharmacy burglary report. The one from Rodney Melton, where he reportedly told an informant he was paid $15,000 to cripple the man responsible for the drug raids. As we talked about last week, none of this information was presented to the defense before Kevin's trial. It could have been related. The pharmacy case involved many of the same players, and yet it wasn't turned over. And that's a potential Brady violation. The state failed to provide evidence that may have been favorable or helpful to Kevin's case. The information found in the pharmacy board reports about Rodney Melton being paid $15,000, that was a Brady violation. The fact that there was evidence demonstrating that somebody else said they committed these crimes, that is exculpatory to Kevin. When you find a Brady violation, especially one as significant as this, much less all of them together, it requires a new trial. But despite this argument from his legal team, courts have denied Kevin's motions for a new trial. We've also discussed some questionable investigative work, especially involving the pharmacy burglary ring case and its overlap with the murders in Bucyrus. An alleged threat from Rodney Melton was recorded in the pharmacy burglary ring report, but this reported threat never seemed to make it into the police files for the Bucyrus murders case. On top of that, Lieutenants Hickman and Dane, who were working on the pharmacy burglary ring case, mentioned Kevin's name at the scene of the crime as a potential connection to the murders. This was the first mention of Kevin's name in connection to this case. Lieutenants Dane and Hickman returned to the scene. They advised that they had went to the hospital and spoken to Riddell, who was still there, but ready to leave and go into hiding. Riddell told them that Rodney Melton had come to the hospital and told Riddell in front of other family members that this happened because Riddell was narking on the people in Crestline. The officers advised the case involving Riddell involved Gene Keith Sr., Gene Keith, Kevin Keith, Demetrius Reeves, and Roy Price. They advised that Gene Keith Sr. had told someone that they were going to whack families in retribution for their arrests. The officers reported Kevin's name at the crime scene because they thought his family might have had a vendetta against their informant. But they never brought up the possibility of Rodney's reported threat from two weeks earlier as being potentially linked to this case. No one from law enforcement or the prosecution disclosed this information. And these transgressions weren't the only instances of questionable investigative work happening at the time. I'm Kim Kardashian, and this is The System. Last episode, we talked about the letter that was sent to Detective Corwin from Rodney Melton during the trial. To be clear, this is not something that's prohibited. It's just strange. Three months after the murders, Rodney wrote this letter with his thoughts and theories on the case, all pointing to Kevin, and reiterated his intention to be helpful. But the trial was already underway and Kevin had already been arrested several months ago. I mean, it could be nothing but a desire to be helpful, but to me, it does seem that Rodney was just attempting to clear his name of suspicion. Perhaps because he knew his name was in the police reports about the Bucyrus murders, or maybe he thought being helpful on this case would help his chances in the upcoming pharmacy burglary ring trial. That's certainly a possibility, but the timing of this letter, well after Kevin has been arrested, is interesting. Why did Rodney feel the need to send this? Charles found another letter dated June 5th, 1996. This letter was from Corwin to Rodney. It seems to be in response to yet another letter from Rodney. Here's what Corwin said. Dear Rodney, was glad to get your letter and hear you got through your time in Ohio. I wish you luck in getting matters in Georgia taken care of. 
I hope that what you were telling me last time about learning your lesson and getting your life straightened out was true, and I would help you in doing this if possible. When you get out, stop by the station and see me, and let me know how things are going. This next part is the part that stands out to me. I will talk to you about the other matter you talked about in our letter. I would be willing to have your help in catching the other person. Good luck. Mike Corwin. Another person? Are they talking about Kevin's case? Did the police have reason to believe that there was more than one person involved? In fact, there is this moment from an earlier press conference, right after Kevin was arrested. Chief Joe Barron addressed the murders. This is what he said. Well, I didn't go to bed last night worried that we had the wrong man. Not at all. Not at all. I don't know that we've got the only man involved, but I'm very confident that we've made a good arrest here. But to our knowledge, the state never pursued prosecuting another person. Did they clear that theory? Or was that another thread left dangling? Corwin declined to speak to us on record, and he's no longer in law enforcement. After the Bucyrus murders case, he became chief for a while, and then eventually left this line of work entirely to pursue being a pastor. So, Rodney said his car was in the shop that night, out of commission. And coincidentally, Rodney Melton was the first name the police linked to the print in the snow once they ran the partial plate numbers. But did the police ever really investigate Rodney's car? That's unclear. Kevin was arrested two days after the murders, before police even linked him to a car that could have had those numbers as well. Kevin was arrested before police even set eyes on Melanie's grandfather's car. So how was this the thing that did Kevin in when he was arrested weeks before police even compiled that theory? Police were led to him by the partial imprint of a license plate number left in a snowbank after the getaway car ran into it as it left the scene of the crime. How do you explain the license plate imprint in the snow that detectives say perhaps played a role in them fingering you for this as a suspect? I don't even have license plates on my car. He has a 30-day tag. tag on his car. You have a 30-day tag on your car? Yes. And you don't drive any other car? No. With your license plate on it? No. What kind of car did you drive? A Dynasty Chrysler, light blue. What year? 80, 88. Wiseman also noted the testimony of a neighbor who saw the getaway car get stuck in a snowdrift, and he pointed to other evidence in the case. So this is the smoking gun in this case? The getaway car and the license plate print that could have matched another vehicle? There was also never any physical evidence linking Kevin to Melanie's grandfather's car. The car was examined for blood, hair, fibers, gunshot residue, glass, but there was no physical evidence found inside the car that linked it to the crime or to Kevin. But even that aside, there's a lot that's questionable about this as the smoking gun. Firstly, when the police ran the license plate and description of the car in question, they came up with Rodney Melton's name. Case number 9400315, suspect vehicle registration. Received a call from Galleon Police Department that a good match for the 043 numbers found in the snow is LIJ043, Rodney Melton, 79 Chevrolet four door, light colored. Galleon advised that our suspects would have access to this vehicle. During Kevin's trial, however, Rodney testified that he'd sold the car with the 043 license plate back in 1990, a few years before these murders occurred. Also, Nancy Smathers, a neighbor that made the eyewitness identification of the car, changed her story on what color the car was in subsequent reports. In episode three, we covered the fallibility of memory. This is another clear example. She described a, a, a yellowish, whitish colored car, a uh, four door. But that story changed several times and the range of colors she reported broadened. Here's Kevin talking to the media in 1994. Because um, a friend of mine's um, tires was changed, that don't mean I changed them. Exactly. <laughs> what about the and the evidence? 
that, they, they said it was a cream colored car. The car they confiscated from her is green. The pictures of the car were shown during trial. However, the problem is Nancy Smathers, the neighbor and witness to the getaway car, never actually identified the Davison's car as the one that she saw that night, before trial, during trial, or after trial. The official trial transcript shows that they never showed the getaway car eyewitness a picture of the alleged getaway car to check if it was indeed the one that she saw. And thus, Smathers never said, under any oath, that this was the car that she saw speed away from the Bucyrus Estates complex on February 13th. This is mind-boggling to me. The only person who saw the getaway car never actually identified the Davison's car as the car she saw that night? If this is supposed to be the evidence that did Kevin in, you'd think they'd make sure this part of the case was airtight. So there is a shaky foundation here for this theory about the getaway car being linked to Kevin, and this shakiness continues throughout the investigation. In 1994, there was an agent from the BCI, or the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, who made a report about the getaway car that really solidified law enforcement's case against Kevin. The agent's name was Michelle Yezzo. It was only later that some questionable reports about Agent Yezzo surfaced and her integrity in this case was called into question. Here's Rachel Troutman, Kevin's current lawyer. Michelle Yezzo was a forensic analyst and she worked with the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations. It's a subgroup of the Ohio Attorney General's office and essentially they're supposed to be independent. They're supposed to be this, this body for the state of Ohio that examines evidence and comes up with a conclusion only off of the evidence. They're not supposed to be, in theory, linked to one side or the other. BCI does forensic analysis and they do all sorts of different types, whether it be fingerprints or DNA or fiber analysis or ballistics. I believe every state has something like this. There are independent organizations as well that aren't linked to know that the state government but in Ohio BCI is linked to the state government and it's always the state that's going to go to BCI to get evidence tested I don't believe that a defense attorney could even go to BCI and have them test evidence Michelle Yezzo's job in this case was to examine the car that was brought in it was uh, Melanie Davison's grandfather's car and she was supposed to determine whether that car was linked to the scene, whether it matched the tires um, and whether the uh, imprint in the snow from the license plate, whether that could have come from this car. Michelle Yezzo's report concluded that the tire tracks in the snow did not match the tires that were on the car. However, she then received a brochure, a picture of a set of tires that had previously been on the car. This brochure had been faxed to her by Detective Corwin with a note on it that says, hope this does the trick for us. Hope this does the trick for us. Michelle looked at the brochure picture and looked at the tracks, the pictures of the tracks in the snow, and decided that that was enough evidence to match the tires to the imprints in the snow. She never actually examined the tire itself. Yeah, so used a faxed picture of tires that were no longer on the car to determine that those tires made the tracks in the snow at the scene. The second part of her analysis was the license plate and whether it could have made the imprint in the snow. And she looked at the pictures and I assume she looked at the car itself and decided that the imprint in the snow would have fit that car. And her testimony and her conclusions included the fact that the orientation of where the license plate was sort of off to one side um, was significant in how she linked it to that imprint in the snow. Alton Davison's car had a license plate that was off to one side of the car slightly. And her linking the imprint this way also, in essence, excluded Rodney Melton's car because Rodney's license plate was in the center of his car. And it wasn't until years later when we had an independent expert review all of that with the negatives um, 
who determined Alton Davison's car could not have left that imprint in the snow, not without making a further indent in the snow from the uh, shape of the bumper. This was the smoking gun from the prosecution side. They had, you know, an eyewitness who said it was her daddy's friend, Bruce. They had um, no physical evidence that actually linked Kevin to the crime. So to have a, a forensic scientist, a forensic analyst sit there and say from her purportedly independent perspective that the evidence is pointing towards Kevin Keith. I mean, that was that was huge. That's that's the clincher. Even when the evidence is tires that she never actually even viewed and matched to the scene and the half of a license plate print, you know, juries believe an expert when an expert says, my expertise led me here. So what should have been done in the case as far as forensic science goes? We talked to Cornell professor, Dr. Sunita Saw, an expert on conflicts of interest and behavioral ethics who has done extensive research on ethics in relation to forensic science. This was a particular case that was very fascinating to me that I decided to delve into a little bit further. Dr. Saw wrote a report on Kevin's case in regards to Michelle Yezzo's involvement. The law enforcement sent these items, the forensic evidence that they had to the lab where Michelle Yezzo worked. And so she was looking at that evidence. They asked her to look at this partial tire track impression. And so I believe it was a plaster cast of the, the tire track and then a brochure where there was photographs of the tires for the model of car. That is also very problematic that it was a photo and not the actual tire. This pattern recognition analysis has not been scientifically validated. There was a note from law enforcement on the brochure of the tires that the analyst was matching that said, I hope this will do the trick for us. And again, that degrades the independence of science. It shows that there's some type of collaboration between law enforcement and the forensic examiner. At the time that the forensic examination was done, the examiner was aware that law enforcement suspected that this person was guilty and that was communicated. They also communicated other aspects about the demographics of the suspect. So that was well known to the examiner. So what we know is for best practice, those irrelevant factors should not be there because studies have shown that it sways people. So one of the concerns about having this type of relationship with law enforcement is that it can lead to confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to test hypotheses by looking for confirming evidence rather than potentially conflicting evidence. Now you can't comment on one particular case and say they were definitely swayed by that. But what you can say is that there's a lot of studies that show irrelevant task information affects people's judgments and it's not necessary for forensic examiners to do their job. So the conclusion here is that the risk of bias is really high. In Kevin Keith's case, there's, it's a perfect storm of everything coming together. Right? First of all, it's a subjective opinion. Second of all, there's no peer review of the results. Third, the forensic science methods are not scientifically valid, nor do we know how reliable the analysis was. And then finally, there's these conflicts of interest that are there and lack of independence. So this leads to a perfect storm to really say there's a high risk of bias in this particular case. It's important to emphasize the focus is not just on this one individual, this one forensic examiner, there's problems with the methods themselves, the broader problems that are going on. It's just that in the Kevin Keith case, there was a perfect storm of everything coming together. But focusing on one forensic scientist is not going to alter the systemic problems in forensic science or the criminal justice system. We need to have an independent body really looking at how we can improve the reliability and validity of forensic science and coming up with clear guidelines. We need to put actual science in forensic science. It needs to be scientific to administer justice accurately and fairly. 
In 2016, I saw an article that was about Michelle Yezzo and actually the Ohio Innocence Project had obtained her personnel file and because I had a, uh, a Google alert for Ms. Yezzo's name, I immediately saw this pop up. And of course, I immediately reached out to the attorneys from the Ohio Innocence Project to access that evidence. Once I started to look through those files, I was pretty, um, pretty taken aback. There was a, a consensus. So basically all of the other BCI agents, it was a consensus of opinion was the, the language, the wording. They all thought that she would stretch the truth to satisfy police departments. This isn't one or two people. This was everybody. This was a consensus among other forensic analysts. And that wasn't the only thing. The files also showed the times that she would fly off the handle throwing a metal bar at her boss, I believe it was. The verbal abuse, her lack of, of being open to anybody reviewing her work, which in, in that type of field, like it is all about peer review, but she was strongly against it. And there were the racial slurs. I mean, they, they documented times where she was using racial slurs in, in reference to her co-workers. And it was over decades till she finally retired. And the reason cited for her retiring was that there was a potential miscarriage of justice if she continued on this job. Michelle Yezzo's personnel file strongly indicated a racial bias. And I don't just mean indicate. I mean, she used the N-word that was quoted in there. And if this was documented in the file, you wonder what else was said that wasn't documented. When we found this information, we immediately recognized that it affected that last piece of evidence, which was this purported license plate um, imprint in the snow and these tire tracks. So we went to the prosecutor and asked him to actually review this and, and recognize the significance it had on his own case. And um, he would not. So at that point, we filed a motion for new trial based on the fact that this was another Brady violation. This was, at the very least, impeachment evidence. And it showed that this person who had provided this very damaging testimony against Kevin Keith had no credibility. These reports from her personnel file predated her testimony in Kevin's case. Not only did they predate her testimony, but some of the, the incidences were noted just the prior year, just the year before she testified against Kevin. So on multiple levels, there were people who knew this information and were still fine with her providing her expert opinion to help get somebody sentenced to death. This type of evidence should have garnered a new trial. Kevin's legal team has argued that this is yet another Brady violation. However, this has not been ruled as such in court and Kevin has still not been given another hearing due to these findings. This was something that we filed a motion for a new trial on and um, another defendant who was in a similar situation, he was awarded a new trial based on the fact that Michelle Yezzo had no credibility and the state should have turned this evidence over. But Kevin did not receive a new trial, obviously, and this is part of the evidence that we want the governor to consider in, at the very least, commuting his sentence. 13 years after Mr. Keith's trial, we discovered new evidence that demonstrates his innocence. The evidence that shows Mr. Keith's innocence has never been heard by a court in its entirety. While we're on the topic of evidence, you may have noticed that we've never talked about the murder weapon. The murder weapon has never been located. The closest thing was a bullet casing. Barron says police found about 20 shell casings at the scene, both inside and outside the apartment. Barron praised the efforts of law enforcement officials and says he's optimistic the case will be solved. Also called to the stand was Tom Nicholson, an examiner in the firearms section for BCI. Nicholson testified that all 24 shell casings were fired from the same gun, 
along with a spent shell found by a South Walnut Street woman. I did find that the cartridge cases specifically, that the types of markings uh, were consistent with one type of gun. But defense attorney James Banks said the state lacks evidence, including the murder weapon. They searched the apartment where the crime was committed, and yet not one piece of evidence was retrieved that would point to Kevin Keith. The day after the murders, a casing was found outside of a woman's house. Allegedly while putting out the trash, she found it enclosed in fast food wrappings. The woman called to report this and she actually ended up testifying to it on the stand. Fernell Graham, who lives on South Walnut Street, said she found the casing February 13th, the night three members of a Bucyrus family were gunned down in their apartment. I had the trash all picked up and ready to walk back in the house when I looked down and there was a bullet shell, spent shell, to my left. Graham, who identified the casing in court, said authorities were contacted the next day. My daughter called and she was telling me what happened. And this is all a surprise to me because I didn't know anything about it. By what happened, do you mean? And I said, uh, that's strange because I found uh, a lot of trash out in front of my house last night. And I said, as I started in to take it in the house, I looked down, there was a spent shell. Though this casing was forensically linked to the case, there was nothing that tied the bullet to anything in particular, including Kevin. The only thing was the proximity of the woman's house to the GE plant the GE plant where Kevin picked up his girlfriend, Zena, from work that night. This connection was made by the prosecution. But again, like many details in the case, is this really enough? Or is this merely circumstantial? Who else could have taken that route that night? We've talked so much about Kevin's alibi and what he was doing that night. But what about Rodney Melton's full alibi? He said he had to hitch a ride from Mansfield. We've seen this in the police reports, but a broken down car isn't the only potential alibi Rodney gave to the police. Rodney's first alibi he gave at the scene when he saw the sheriff, Sheriff Schauber, and he told him that he had gotten a ride from Mansfield to the scene. Rodney had made a point to tell the police officers that his car wasn't working. But then later on, weeks later, he changed that or elaborated on it, if you will, when he spoke to Captain Corwin. And that's when he told um, Detective Corwin that he had been sleeping at home in Crestline and he had gotten a ride to the scene. He changed his location. He gave two separate places that he had started from. And for some reason, the police didn't seem to check those against each other. The only part that appears to have stayed consistent with his two alibis was that he didn't drive, that he had gotten a ride from somebody else to the scene. Later, he added more to this alibi, saying he was with his nephew that night. Rodney says that he was with Michael Cochran that night of the murder. Rodney says, I was with Michael that night. And he says, who's Michael? That's my nephew. He was 14 at the time. I asked Charles where I could verify this part of Rodney's alleged alibi. When did Rodney say this? Uh, the trial. You can see the documents, you can see everything when he said that. I've got it all highlighted. The following reading is taken directly from the 1994 trial transcript. This cross-examination is between Prosecutor Russell Weissman and Rodney Melton. Now you talked to Captain Corwin a number of times after the murders. You called Captain Corwin quite a few times after the murders, didn't you? Twice. And he asked you various questions about your whereabouts and the investigation and all that stuff? Yes, sir. You were at home at your mother's, Katie Melton's house? Me and my nephew was. Who is your nephew? Michael. According to Charles, the story doesn't stop there. After Kevin's 1994 trial, Rodney was tried for the pharmacy burglaries and he went to prison for a few years for those crimes. Now, when he gets out of prison three years later, three and a half years later, Michael Cochran's dead. In fact, they found him in the Melton home hung by the neck. And that's why nobody got a chance to ask Michael Cochran anything. I almost couldn't believe this. 
When taking a retrospective look at criminal cases, it's always harder when you're dealing with a significant lapse of time like this. It's hard to know what to believe when you can't go back and question people. But this is yet another bizarre and tragic circumstance that muddies this case today. That's where he committed suicide in the Melton home. When he committed suicide, it was he was 18. We've begged the question, are there other people besides Kevin that have similar motives? And the Meltons are on this list. But at this point, we'll never be able to vet Rodney's alibi. Nobody's ever done any any of this. Nobody's talked to anybody. I could not go back down there and talk to anybody because of fear of my life. And I wasn't just afraid of Rodney, I was afraid of the police. I said, they'll never hear me again. So I had a lot of help coming from the uh, uh, community down there. Charles was disappointed in how his brother's case was handled. And he feels that not every lead was followed and not every question was answered. After this case, Charles and his family's lives changed forever. Every time we saw one another, the Chapmans, the Keefs, or anybody down there, it was hugs, it was parties, it was, you could go to anybody's house and just show up for dinner, not be invited, show up, you know, and that's how it was. It's not that way anymore. I asked Charles about Kevin's trial back in 1994 and what he remembers the most. It, it was the building the building it was so cold i feel like our family should not be here uh, we were the only black family in there besides the chapman family there was maybe a couple spectators but it was like the hatfields and the mccoys and they were putting us against each other with their lies and then they would try to separate us and then they would tell the media that somebody had called into the prisons and was threatening people and you know all kinds of stuff i just want everybody to know that if this happens you will not only be banned from the courtroom you'll be banned from any county property surrounding the courtroom. I want to get this straight. This is a very important matter, and we're not going to let any of these petty uh, arguments or anything like that interfere with this trial. Charles had a lot of unpleasant memories from Kevin's 1994 trial. He also recalls that during the trial, something very strange happened. A break was called, due to some incriminating information being called in. In the middle of Kevin's capital trial, his defense attorney said, Ronnie Melton's family just called me. They think he is the person who committed these crimes. They also think that he committed these other crimes. And they have a full conversation, him and the prosecutor and the, the bailiff and the judge and the prosecutor, Kevin's prosecutor says, I don't wanna go forward right now. And then they continue to talk and he says, I want to send the jury home for tonight. But then they take a break and they go off the record. And the next thing I, you can see is they just continue on with the trial. So whatever happened in that break when they all went off the record, I guess they decided to just continue. According to trial transcripts, someone from Rodney Melton's family called to suggest that Rodney was actually the shooter that night. Initially, the prosecutor wanted to look into it, and he suggested sending the jury home. But this didn't happen. Instead, there was a brief break, and then the trial proceeded as scheduled. So if you guys have picked up Kevin Keith, you got to have some definitive evidence. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting for something definitive, and it never happened. Now he's convicted, and I'm like, oh my God, what do I do now? They still convicted him. And if you look at Kevin's statement, he says, I'm shocked. They convicted a man with no evidence. So it didn't matter. They were going to convict him any way you look at it. Some of the people that I knew that had doubted me for so long, once they saw I got progress, they said, well, you must have something here. The hardest people to convince is your ignorant public. They are not aware of all these things that happen. The public usually trust their government, they trust their judges, and they trust their police. So they're ignorant to a lot of things, and that's why we have the word corruption. That's a, that's a bad word. Nobody wants you to use that word, but it's the truth. Or we wouldn't be sitting here. So even when the lawyers told me, you know, you, you might not want to do that. I'm not a lawyer. You might not want to say it. I'm a victim. I'm his brother. And that's exactly what I saw. I didn't go to law school. I don't know all the rules and regulations or whatever it is that you guys have to do. But all I can do is tell you what I know. And I did that. In this case, I think it all comes down to a discussion of due process. 
was Kevin Keith given a fair trial? Were all persons of interest cleared? Was a thorough investigation completed? And if not, are there enough holes here to at least warrant another trial? Especially considering how quickly Kevin Keith was arrested and how unprecedented it is for a capital murder trial to commence in just three months. We've heard a range of things that look both good and bad for Kevin. We've heard Richard Warren say in a post-surgery police interview that the shooter was someone named Kevin, but he couldn't remember his last name or be 100% sure about his identification using the lineup. Your exact words were, what is that guy's name I picked out? So you really weren't sure who that person was that night based on the picture, the prior telephone conversations about names, you really didn't know, did you, Mr. Warren? I wasn't sure of the picture. We've heard the confusion about a nurse calling in to report Kevin's name as well. James Banks questioned Bucyrus Police Captain John Stanley, who interviewed Warren from his hospital bed about the phone calls. And nowhere in there does Richard Warren mention that Kevin is the shooter. It's you that mentioned it to him. Isn't that a fact? After I had been told that by the nurse. Well, I'm not talking about what you were told by the nurse. I'm talking about Richard Warren, what you were told by him. That is correct. So two of the people that you knew from Crestline that fit the description, you only focused on one in the lineup. That is correct. Nothing further. We've heard seven-year-old Juanita Reeves say that the gunman was her daddy's friend, Bruce, and her interview wasn't conducted until several days after Kevin was already arrested. She knew, and she knows. And you listen to the tape, and then you decide what the truth is. We've heard expert opinions suggest that the lineup was heavily biased towards choosing Kevin's picture. We've heard that the gunman had a partially concealed face, supposedly like a turtleneck pulled up to their nose. We've learned that it's hard to pin down the first mention of Kevin's name, but that it seemed to have come from two officers working on the pharmacy burglary ring case in Galleon. We've heard about the reported threat from Rodney Melton that was recorded in the pharmacy burglary ring report, but never entered into evidence for Kevin's trial. We've learned that Alton Davidson's car was the smoking gun, but that car wasn't even in the equation until weeks after Kevin's arrest. It wasn't linked to Kevin by any sort of physical evidence, and the BCI agent who gave the deposition for Kevin's trial had a track record of questionable ethics. And now we've learned that there was a call mid-trial from some of Rodney's family members, claiming he was involved in the Bucyrus Estates murders. The prosecution suggested the trial not proceed that day, so an investigation into the claims could occur. However, after a private discussion between the defense attorney, the prosecutor, and the judge, the trial proceeded as scheduled. My personal takeaway, this case is just much more complicated than the news clippings and the headlines suggest. But frankly, it doesn't matter what my opinion is on Kevin's guilt or innocence. What matters is that the evidence suggests there was doubt in Kevin's guilt, or at the very least, in how the crime was investigated. Remember, Kevin's sentence was originally death, and that was commuted in September of 2010, which means someone, namely former Governor Strickland, saw enough weakness in this case to override the jury's decision. It might be tempting to feel strongly one way or another, but the truth is, we can't go back to 1994. People have passed away. Evidence has been stored improperly. We may never get the answers that we want. So I think the most important question to ask here is, is there reasonable doubt? Because the way that our justice system should operate is innocent until proven guilty. Guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So what do you think? Is there reasonable doubt in this case? Is our system working as it should? Or can we do better? Next episode is our last episode. 
we'll hear from a lot of new voices, people that can offer perspective on our justice system and Kevin's case in particular, some that really have power within this system. We'll look to the future and ask what's next. Kevin's team has submitted an application for clemency. Is there hope for them? What difficulties does post-conviction have in store? And I'm going to call on several important people that I've been wanting to speak with, including a Supreme Court justice and the person who has probably impacted the case the most. My name is Ted Strickland. I was governor for four years. People have asked me in the intervening years, why didn't you commute his sentence? Why didn't you set him free? At the time I commuted him, it was, I think, 11 days before he was scheduled to be executed. I didn't have the information that I think I have now. That's next time on The System. The System is a Spotify original series produced in partnership with Big City TV and Tenderfoot TV. I'm Kim Kardashian, your host and executive producer. From Big City TV, executive producer is Lori Rothschild and Saldi. From Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Lead creative producer is Meredith Stedman. Production, editing, and sound design by Tristan Bankston and Cameron Taggy. Additional sound design by Cooper Skinner. Production manager is Tracy Kaplan. Music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Voiceover work by Miles Agee. Associate producer producer is Jamie Albright, mixed and mastered by Devin Johnson. The system contains adult content and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. I was driving down the street and I was taking my kids to a drive through Starbucks on Topanga and at the gas station on the left, there was a man being arrested, handcuffed and like thrown on the front of his car, being handcuffed. My daughter said, oh my gosh, look, you know, and my son, they were all looking out the window and they said, what did he do? Oh my gosh, look at what that man just did. And I said, or he could have done nothing and they have the wrong person. So we don't know what he did. We have to, you know, it has to be proven there are bad people out there, so we have to be careful. But their immediate response was, what did he do? And I said, well, what do the cops think he did versus what he did are two different stories. He could have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. They could think he's someone else. No, I wasn't trying to like put uh, you know, all these pressures on them, but I wanted them to just think differently. They just kind of looked at me like, okay, mom. But I like having these conversations with them. This gets to the root of why I wanted to do this podcast in the first place. Innocent until proven guilty. Our justice system is supposed to be here to protect everyone. And that includes those charged with crimes. And from everything I've learned about Kevin Keith's case, I have to say, I think there's reasonable doubt here. There are so many odd circumstances throughout this case and the forensic science presented at Kevin's trial had questionable origins. Not to mention Kevin was arrested, charged, and sentenced to death in the span of about three months. As we've covered, that's unbelievably quick for capital murder. Keith is charged with three counts of aggravated murder, which carry death penalty specifications, and three counts of attempted murder. He said from the beginning he's innocent. So what is at stake right now for Kevin? In 2010, his sentence was commuted from the death sentence to life in prison without parole, thankfully saving Kevin's life. But that is not the commuting sentence Rachel had hoped for. For the past 13 years, Kevin's legal team has worked tirelessly on this case, even collecting new evidence, such as proof of Agent Yezo's misconduct and racial bias. Now in 2022, just a month before this podcast launched, Rachel Troutman filed for executive clemency and is hoping to get Kevin released or at least life with parole. Kevin's case has gotten the attention of people like the Ohio Supreme Court Justice Mike Donnelly, who we interviewed for this podcast. And he says it better than I can. Kevin Keith's case should concern anyone 
who is concerned about the integrity of the system, whether you're a prosecutor, a defense lawyer, or a judge, because he has never been granted a hearing to demonstrate evidence has accumulated that completely undermines the theory of guilt that was used to convict him. The single worst injustice that can take place in our criminal justice system is having an innocent person convicted and stripped of what we value the most in our democracy, and that's our freedom. I can't think of anything worse. And in some states, like the state of Ohio, not only can they still take away your freedom, they can take away your life. I'm Kim Kardashian, and this is the system. My name is Justice Mike Donnelly. Since 2019, I've served as a associate justice on the Ohio Supreme Court. When you have a system that is run by humans, it is very prone to be plagued by the same flaws that all humans share. And that can range from having tunnel vision, believing with absolute certainty that you've arrived at the correct decision, there is evidence of judges being overworked, falling into the trap of being neglectful of pending matters, which results in systemic delay. Unfortunately, as any system run by humans, it can be affected by outright corruption. We just got the opportunity to speak with Justice Mike Donnelly in the last couple of months, and his stance on Kevin's case and post-conviction reform in general is a powerful one. Post-conviction litigation for people who claim that they are innocent is the single area of the criminal justice system in need of the most reform. The system seems to value finality over the truth. And I say that because I saw firsthand the hurdles that innocence advocates go through. On the back end of the system, the prosecutors become defense lawyers. They are trying to defend the integrity of their conviction and the finality of it. They come to believe that the jury got it right and they see the innocence advocates as just defense lawyers looking for a second bite at the apple. That's a, a huge problem in our system. I began my legal career way back in 1992. After practicing a total of 12 years, I ran for a common pleas judge as a trial court judge. So I served there for 14 years, presiding over both a criminal and a civil docket. ACLU data shows one out of six people executed in Ohio have been innocent. The American Bar Association found our system so flawed, it recommended it be suspended for review in 2007. I was appointed to the Ohio Death Penalty Task Force, and the charge was examine how the Ohio Death Penalty operates right now, and if it's going to be kept, how do you make it the fairest process possible? I was invited to a numerous speaking events in the state of Ohio to outline what those recommendations were. One of the speakers for the evening was Kevin Keith's brother, Charles, and he was talking about Kevin's case. I had no awareness of it. After listening to him, what struck me was I'm not aware of anyone who has been granted some form of limited clemency by the governor, Governor Strickland, because of the belief that he may not be the right person and had his sentence commuted from a death sentence to life without parole with the promise to at least revisit it at some point in the future. But unfortunately, 
for Kevin, unfortunately for him, he has never had his case revisited in the sense that he hasn't been given an opportunity to have a hearing in open court and demonstrate what he claims he can demonstrate. Have a fair hearing where the prosecution is invited to be there as well and to challenge whatever allegations they are making if they so believe that the theory of guilt that was used to convict him remains intact, then so be it. But he's never had that opportunity. And so I contacted Kevin's attorney, Rachel Troutman, and I asked her if she would provide me with data on not only Kevin's case, but other cases where people were receiving what I think they're entitled to, and that is hearings. Kevin Keith came very close to having his life taken away from him. But for the governor stepping in and commuting his sentence, he decided that there was too much doubt about the truthfulness or the integrity of that conviction that he decided to overrule a court order to carry out Kevin Keith's execution. If there's that much doubt about his guilt that we couldn't carry out the sentence that was recommended by the jury. Why be as a system satisfied with someone serving a life sentence without parole? If you have new evidence or claim to have new evidence that would undermine the theory of guilt that was presented against you, judges are not required to hold hearings to air that allegation out. They can make those decisions on just reviewing the written briefs alone. What Justice Mike Donnelly is saying is that judges are not required to hold hearings when new evidence is presented. This is a part of the struggle Kevin's legal team has been up against. After 28 years, Kevin has never had a hearing. Even when his sentence was commuted, that was entirely done by Governor Strickland alone. This means much of this information that you've heard during this podcast has never been presented like this to a court. Let's say the innocence advocate put forth a motion for a new trial. They believe that the evidence that was presented against the defendant couldn't pass scientific scrutiny. That allegation might be true, it might not be true, but the judge is not required to hold a hearing to air that out. We're trying to change that in the state of Ohio right now. One of the recommendations in the subcommittee that I worked on was about maintaining the most transparent record possible. When I became a neutral in the adversarial process as a judge, I began to question, why do we have these discussions back in chambers with the attorneys off record in resolving these cases, which often have profound effects on the defendant's life? And if there's a victim in the case, they're not being made aware of what's taking place to resolve the dispute. So one day, early in my judicial career, I decided to do what no one else in the courthouse was doing. And that was, I decided not to have any more backroom discussions and to have every discussion on the record with the court reporter. I can't describe how revelatory that experience was. I never look back and I'm convinced that every judge should do this, and there's really no argument against it. No one, including the judge, should ever say anything in the back room in chamber off the record that they wouldn't repeat verbatim out in open court. That's how I operated until I left the trial court for the Supreme Court in 2019. This is especially relevant given what we've learned from the last episode about how there was a break during Kevin's trial. Per trial records, someone called during the trial to report they suspected Rodney was involved. This disrupted the trial, but it resulted in Judge Kemmerlein, James Banks, and the prosecutor Russell Weissman going off the record for a while. After a small break, the trial proceeded as normal. And as far as we can tell from court documents and records, nothing was ever done about this phone call. Apparently, after the state had presented its case in chief, the defense counsel had a sidebar and with the prosecutor alerted him to the fact that he had received new information that a different suspect may have done it. 
And the prosecutor said, well, perhaps we should send the jury home or something to the effect of that. And they took a break to verify that during the trial. I've never heard of something like, like that occurring. According to Justice Mike Donnelly, the post-conviction process is an area of our legal system that is in dire need of reform. It's nearly impossible for convicted individuals to get a new hearing. Motions are denied repeatedly, and if not denied, they often sit in limbo for years. Oftentimes, these motions for new trials, they can languish on trial court judges' dockets, sometimes for years, without a ruling. The hearings would benefit prosecutors, too. If a prosecutor has a good faith belief in the guilt of the defendant, they should be able to demonstrate that at a hearing. People value finality, and a lot of times prosecutors, and even the judge that tried the case, become firmly convinced in the truth of what the jury rendered. And they become close-minded to the possibility that the system got it wrong and the jury got it wrong. Charles Keith has been deeply frustrated by his brother's experience with the post-conviction process. He also has a lot of thoughts on the people that were involved in his brother's conviction and how that experience skewed out of Kevin's favor. So you got a, a jury that's a, a, a convicting jury because you can't sit on a jury unless you're for the death penalty. So that was already a setup. Charles believes that essentially a death sentence was inevitable from the start. He is referring to the fact that the jury for Kevin's trial was a death-qualified jury made up of people that were screened for the exact purposes of not being opposed to the death sentence. Then after the trial was over, then Wiseman, they give him prosecuting attorney of the year for this case. And then he later becomes a judge. Charles is speaking to the fact that court officials are rewarded for their work on cases like Kevin's. James Banks, he was not certified to even handle a capital murder case. Before Kevin Keith, James Banks had never represented anyone in a capital murder case. We even filled out an affidavit of indigency, letting them know that we could not afford this attorney. Had they honored that, Kevin would have been given two or three qualified attorneys. Well, why didn't you guys fill out an affidavit of indigency? We did. The judge didn't honor it, and he allowed Banks to continue. Not to say that you're not incredible, you yeah, are, but it's not for you to investigate your brother's right. case. It's not for any of us to investigate your brother's case. And if Kevin was considered indigent and actually that, that motion was allowed to go through, Kevin would have gotten two yes. certified attorneys, yes. which really could have helped his case. Kevin's advocates believe that there was too much value placed on finality. Kevin was arrested, tried, and then convicted very quickly considering the magnitude of this case. And Charles personally believes factors such as Kevin's indigency or need for financial support weren't taken into account. The whole journey has been painful for Kevin and his family, but Kevin was open with me about his time on death row, and I wanted to ask him about his experience from the inside. What was death row like? where you are at? Well, when I first got the death row, I went to Lucasville. And Lucasville had just had a riot in 93, which is nationally known about. And so the atmosphere was kind of, uh, well, first of all, there was no contact at all. Uh, but the atmosphere was kind of um, harsh. Because when I got the death row, I'm still in the, the, the shock of, you know, trial and all that. And so... And it happened so uh, like, fast. It, it's so quickly, so I'm like, you know, in a days. I was there six months, and when I first got there the first day, it was a CEO who took me down the range. The range is the common area space that all individual cells open up into. And so he, when he walked me down the range, the first cell I went to, the guy was talking to his cell. The next range, that guy was talking to his cell. The next range, that guy was talking to his cell, and his TV was on static. And so I was like, um, okay, um, I was there six months and they transferred death row to Mansfield, Ohio, Mansfield Corrections too. And once there, you know, I got there, I fell into a state of depression, and, but I fell into a state of depression because the appeal process seemed so hopeless. And the guys there 
um, seems like they were in a hopeless situation, I kind of started contemplating suicide. And so in prison, a guy tells you, if you cut across, you're just looking for attention. But if you cut up, then you're trying to commit suicide. So in my mind, I'm planning out how to cut my wrist up. And so I'm, I'm looking at my cell and, you know, that's why I was for about a week. That's what was going through my mind. I've worked with death penalty cases before and with individuals on death row, but it never gets any easier to hear their stories. I've been executed tens of times in my dreams. In this dream I'm having, and they're taking me down to the execution chamber and I'm just professing my innocence and professing my innocence. Nobody's there. My brother's not there. Rachel's not there. And I'm just waiting for one of them to come around the corner because I know this is not about to take place and nobody's there. I know people out there who don't believe in me and say he should have been executed. They don't have to worry because I've been executed tens of times. So, I remember when they brought me the um, papers to fill out, you know, your last meal. They brought me that scenario. They give you two pieces of paper. What size shoes you wear, pants. If they want to dress you out to be executed. And then they bring your sheet, fill out your last meal, anything you want. And so when the guy bring it to me, the case manager, I call him St. No Whack because he really had a heart for death row guys. He'd do everything for you. He'd been over backwards for you. And so he brought the paperwork to me. He said, keep, I need you to fill this out. I said, I'm not filling that out, Mr. No Whack. I, you're a good guy and everything. He said, no, I need you to do this for me because they sent me up here to get you to fill this out. I said, no, I still got the, I still got the blank papers. What I miss the most in, and I would want is my mom's fried chicken and her banana plate. Okay? So that's what I miss the most, my mom, because I really love my mom. And I spend my time with my mom. I got two daughters, uh, seven grandchildren. And that's what I miss the most. I miss the most the simple things, you know, simple things. That's what I miss the most. I have my own personal feelings about the death penalty and what I think is right. But I've learned a lot about death row over the last few years while doing this kind of work. And I want to hear from someone who's been studying the discourse on the death penalty for years. My name's Ngozi Ndalue. I'm the deputy director of the Death Penalty Information Center. Ngozi works at the Death Penalty Information Center, a hub dedicated to providing background, context, and analysis for media and the public on what's happening with the death penalty today. Our executive director often describes us as the press secretary for the truth about the death penalty. We don't have a moral position on the death penalty, but we're often critical of the way that has been applied. Race and the death penalty is one of the most studied aspects of our capital punishment system. And with these studies, it is really consistent that one of the biggest determining factors of whether somebody will be sentenced to death is the race of their victim. The studies of state capital punishment systems have found over and over again that if you kill a white victim, you are much more likely to be sentenced to death. Another common finding, not in all studies, but in many, is that if there's a black defendant and a white victim, that really increases the odds that you will be sentenced to death. It's interesting to think about this in connection with Kevin's case, where the key witness was victim Richard Warren, who also happened to be white, and who testified against Kevin in front of an all-white jury. One concern that continues to come up in death penalty cases is whether people can be wrongfully convicted. Can innocent people be convicted and sentenced to death? And the answer is unequivocally yes. Since 1972, 190 people have been exonerated from death row. If we think about that, and if we think about that as an error rate, and we compare it to the number of people who have been executed, 1,550 people. For every eight and a little bit executions, we've had one exoneration, and that is significant. I just want to take a second to highlight this horrifying statistic. 
And Guzzi is saying that for around every eight executions, there's an exoneration from death row. That's the error rate. If you ever had any doubt that wrongful convictions happen, particularly wrongful capital murder convictions, this statistic is pretty sobering. One thing to note just about what is happening in Ohio right now is that there is an active conversation about whether Ohio is going to abolish the death penalty. People don't see abolition as a bipartisan issue, but the way that it showed up in Ohio has been very explicitly bipartisan with some of the leaders who have been calling for abolition being very conservative. And so I think that the question about kind of where Ohio goes next is something that a lot of people are watching. I think it's yet to be seen. The question I ask people who are pro-death penalty is, what percentage of innocent people is it okay to execute? Because it's never going to be zero. This is Jason Flom, a veteran of the music industry, philanthropist, innocence advocate, and host of the podcast Wrongful Conviction with Jason Flom. I don't think we can talk about Kevin and this case without talking about the fact that the death penalty, aside from the fact that it's, you know, barbaric and it's the definition of cruel and unusual punishment, it's also true that there are a huge number of people on death row to this day in America who are innocent. Their, you know, best estimates are that about 10% of people on death row are innocent. Now, I believe it's higher. We know that there have been many innocent people executed in this country, even in recent years. Liddell Lee, who was proven after he was executed to have been innocent. Um, the state fought the DNA testing right up until the day he was killed and murdered by the state. Nathaniel Woods, last year, I'm getting the chills thinking about that one. No one even ever claimed that he killed anyone. No one. Just that he was in a room when it happened. There is nothing good about the death penalty. States that have the death penalty have higher murder rates than states that don't. And there's no deterrent effect. They've known that for generations. So why do we do it? We have to, I mean, we, we have to stop. Why do we, as the old saying goes, why do we kill people to show that killing people is wrong? We asked Jason about how he got involved as an advocate for Kevin's case. I see these stories too often, every day. But it was abundantly clear that this guy never got a fair shot, never got a fair trial. So I was able to get in touch with Governor Strickland. We sat down with the governor and we had a sober, sort of, you know, thoughtful, trying to think of the right word, meeting. And I begged and implored and cajoled him to set Kevin free, which I thought was the only logical remedy. You know, I have, it's so bittersweet, you know, because um, he did grant him clemency, but he commuted his sentence to life without parole. I think that today, if you asked him, he would probably say, at least in private, that he wishes that he would have done what was then the right thing and is still the right thing to do, which is to grant him a full unconditional pardon. That being said, I believe that as Governor Strickland found out and I think would tell you, who knows, maybe we get the opportunity to interview him. I think he would tell you that he, looking back, regrets that he did not use his power to its fullest extent. And I'm not diminishing the fact that he, he saves Kevin's life. Look, I know that the governor in his last days and weeks and months in office had a million fires to put out. And even as loudly as I was protesting, you know, I was just one voice. And I believe that any person, including the governor of good conscience, could and should look at the basic facts and just acknowledge that the system made a terrible a mistake is too generous, but the system fucked up. It hasn't been easy to get people to talk to us during the course of this podcast. And I understand. I mean, this brings up a lot of pain for people. Or maybe some people don't want to go back and admit their mistakes. However, we made our best efforts to get as many people on the podcast as possible. 
Lori even took a trip to Ohio to try to track down some individuals in person. One person I really wanted to speak to was Rodney Melton, and I tried. I called every number I could find connected to him. Should I start and say, hey, it's Kim Kardashian? Yeah. Is Rodney there? Yeah. Okay. How many women? Okay. Go. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out right now. Get out. It's an emergency. No. All kids out. I'm sorry. The party you are trying to reach has not set up voicemail on 7 Should we try one more time? Kardashian, I was calling to see if Rodney was available. Hello? I think they hung up on me. Hello? Hi, I was calling uh, for Rodney. This is Kim Kardashian. Is he available? belongs to someone else now and finally I messaged Rodney on Facebook and I asked if we could talk and to my surprise he responded saying yes and he gave me a number to call you reached from Cornerstone Marketing Realty I'm sorry to miss your call Please leave your name, phone number, and a brief message. But when I called that number, it actually belonged to a real estate agent in Canada. Another dead end. I messaged Rodney again, asking if the wrong number was possibly a mistake. But he never answered me again. Lori also tried reaching out to Bruce Melton, and he never returned her call, but left this voicemail. <laughs> Yes, my name is Bruce Melton, and Lord, you called this phone. Do not call this phone again about that killer. Do not, I repeat, do not call this phone again about that killer. Bye. excited to speak to you today what got you there's a short list of people I really wanted to talk to when I was first looking at the case and although not everyone was open to talking with us I was able to sit down with some of the most important players in Kevin's post-conviction process you know when you become governor you are made aware of the pending uh, death penalty cases that are likely to come before you this is former Ohio governor Ted Strickland the governor who commuted Kevin's sentence in 2010. I was faced with Kevin's case and it was scheduled. And I got my chief attorney, a guy named Marcus, to really start digging into the case, to look at all the circumstances. Kent Marcus said, there seems to be some problems with this case. As I recall, the parole board had advised against commutation. The parole board, as it was composed, I think, was more a mouthpiece of the correctional system than actually an organization that was committed to fairly and sufficiently looking at cases without having a preconceived idea as to what the outcome would likely be in their decision making. The most compelling thing for me was the way the evidence was presented to the jury by this forensic analyst. Former Governor Strickland is referring to Michelle Yezzo, the BCI agent who solidified the getaway car as the smoking gun for the prosecution's case against Kevin. Last episode, we discussed her problematic record. I mean, even her colleagues had indicated that they thought she had serious problems of competency and, and other kind of personal issues that could have really discredited her findings if the jury had known about those issues. 
Her testimony, I believe, had a, a great deal to do with the jury's decision to convict Kevin. There's so many things that I feel like if people heard now, there'd be absolutely no way that they would be okay with this decision to not only give Kevin this lifelong sentence, but the death sentence. The prosecutors, they are under tremendous pressure to try to bring closure, to identify the guilty party and so on because they're always facing the next election and wanting to avoid charges of being soft on crime, especially when the crime is a, is a very public crime that involves the taking of a life. And it just looked to me that the death penalty is final and it never should be carried out if there is any little hint that the trial may have been not conducted fairly. So I commuted his sentence from death to life in prison. If there was enough to feel like you can commute a sentence to life without parole, what would stop you from either maybe presenting an innocence investigation or something further that could completely commute his sentence? At the, at the time I committed him, it was, I think, 11 days before he was scheduled to, to be executed. I didn't have the information that I think I have now for, from my perspective. If I were doing it now, I would want to commute his sentence. And I've, I've expressed that to the current governor, and I've expressed that to the prior governor, Governor Bob Taft. In fact, I just talked with him two nights ago about this case. And I've, you know, I've talked to you know, our current governor, Governor DeWine, about this case. If your feelings have changed, why can't, you know, Governor DeWine look at all the facts, look at all the new facts, look at everything that we found from when this case first started? This trial happened so quickly. I don't even believe that there was enough time for them to even investigate thoroughly all the people that were cleared. Well, we ought to humble ourselves and acknowledge the fact that as good as a criminal justice system is, it is not perfect. There is a percentage of the people who are incarcerated in this country who are totally innocent of the crimes for which they have been incarcerated. There are innocent people who are languishing in our jails and our prisons. It's, it's tragic when that happens. It is unbelievably tragic when that person may be executed for a crime, for any crime, but for a crime they did not commit, certainly is unthinkable. The death penalty is something that I wish we didn't have, but if we're going to have it, we ought to make damn sure that there aren't any stones unturned in, in terms of trying to determine whether or not the convicted person is actually guilty and if there are flaws in the, in the prosecution. It never should be carried out if there is any little hint that the trial may have been not conducted fairly and so on. I've heard so many stories and it just makes me so sad because no one is fighting for these people and everyone just throws them away. Even in situations where I thought I would never have an open heart, how could I not try to help or be a voice for some of these people? Yeah. In my earlier life, I, I was a United Methodist minister. I went to theological seminary. And then I, I became a psychologist and, and I worked in a maximum security prison for a number of years here in Ohio, working with mentally ill, incarcerated persons. I believe, as a result of my experience as a psychologist working in the prison system, as well as my political experiences, that we incarcerate too many people and we incarcerate them for too long a period of time. If you take a, a 25, 23, 22 year old person and you give them a, a 25 or 35 year sentence, that really can destroy their you know, their hope for having a better future. I really appreciate your time talking to us and voicing your opinion. 
Hopefully I'll get to come down to Ohio and meet with uh, Governor DeWine. And I'd love to just hear your stories, even just off record. I love hearing this stuff. I'd love to connect. I could talk to you all day. I've enjoyed talking with you. Yeah, if you come to Ohio and you see Governor DeWine, you give me a call and I'd be happy to uh, have lunch or dinner with you. Hearing from Ted Strickland about how if he were to do it today, he would completely commute his sentence. That just literally gave me chills and makes me so sad for Kevin. I mean, people can change. People can have differences of opinion and grow and evolve from those decisions that they make. You know, it's kind of like the Clintons. They put this crime bill in place and he regrets it now. It just was so heavy knowing that if he knew then what he knew now, he would have made a different choice. And that could have changed Kevin's life. Hello? Hey, Rach, it's Lori. How are you? Oh, good. Just sitting here working. Yeah, what is the uh, story for today? On August 15th, just a month and a half before this podcast launched, Kevin's legal team submitted a clemency application to get Kevin released from prison. If not immediately, then at least in the near future. The application is based on all of the evidence collected by Kevin's team over the years, and it also focuses on the positive impact he has made on the incarcerated people around him. Yeah, I was just going to say, it sounds like it could be, um, it could be a long wait. This is Innocence Advocate Lori Rothschild talking to Rachel Troutman, Kevin's attorney from the Ohio Public Defender's Office. At the time of this conversation, Rachel is prepping to submit an application for clemency to the Ohio Parole Board. So, you know, Kevin has, I'm just putting together all of his prison, the things that he's done in prison and the programs that he's put together. And I have these just overwhelming amount of letters from um, some of the other inmates who just, he's helped them with recovery from drugs. That's incredible. Because there's, you know, in, in, in prisons, there's still a lot of uh, drugs available. And I mean, it's just, he's got this, this skill set that yeah. I can see a future for him outside the prison walls. You know, I, I'd love to have some options for him and, and to be able to demonstrate to the, to the pro board and into wine that there are people who will, uh, you know, take a, take a risk with him, you know, that, that they see the value that he can bring. But yeah, that's right. Thing. So it would have to be some. It would have to be either local to Ohio or some sort of remote work. Absolutely. That maybe he could do if we could just make sure he has a computer and all that stuff. Today, by the time you're listening to this episode, Kevin's legal team has submitted the application for clemency to the Ohio Parole Board. It's my hope that this podcast, this story, reaches the right people, and that they seize the opportunity to give Kevin at least a hearing. Because family is so important to me personally, I think I got drawn into Kevin's case. I always go back and think about Charles and think about the family dynamic and how their family was so affected. I mean, I'm, I'm happy. I'm here. I can see the progress. I can measure that. And mm -hmm. that makes anybody happy when you can measure your progress. Mm -hmm. And being here with you and uh, looking back at 19 because right now my mind's in 1994 mm -hmm. and you are my 2022 wow wow and no money i don't have any money i don't even have a bank account i don't have anything because people always talk about what they can't do without money mm -hmm. and i thought that too I had to give of myself. And I think I gave everything I had. And it'll relate and resonate with all the poor people out there, the lawyers, I mean, anybody that feels American, the story will touch them. And those are tears of joy. Yes. Every case especially after working on Kevin's case. It just opened up my eyes to really 
have a lot of empathy for all the families that are involved. This doesn't just affect one person. No matter what side you're on, families are torn apart and it's heartbreaking. And, um, you know, I always think about the victims and their families. And I'm sure this is really painful to bring up for everybody involved. My goal is not to bring any more pain, but to just bring the ultimate closure. And if the story has been told in the wrong way, to just write that and make sure that we get the right person behind bars. When I work on cases and I see all of the corruption and everything that happens, it makes me keep my motivation going, keep working at school. I have a few years left. I get, you know, discouraged sometimes, but then I work on a case and it really gets me focused and just pushes me to fight harder. Hello, you have reached Marion Correctional Institution. To continue your call, please listen to the following options. Hey, how are you? I am so overwhelmed with joy, and I've been hearing a lot, and I am so grateful to you. How does it work? Do they allow you to listen to podcasts in? No, Rachel's going to bring them down. We ain't got that kind of um, system here, but Rachel's going to bring her laptop, or we got laptop down, and and a week and a half or two weeks, and we're going to listen to some of them. Oh, good. I asked Kevin how he feels, waiting to hear the results of this latest submission. And after 28 years in prison, does he still allow himself to feel hope? As you know, you know, Rachel filed a push for clemency. How do you feel about it? Well, I'm always hopeful, even though I had those moments. You know, I, I seized hope. That's what I did. I made hope my own. Because keep in mind, I was, I was 13 days away from being executed. <laughs> I could have been dead. But I do have, still have hope in humanity, too. Uh, because I have seen humanity inside these walls. And through individuals like you, I've seen it on the outside. So I'm hoping this is a point right here that they will have something like the growth that Governor Strickland had. I told Kevin that I spoke to former Governor Strickland, and I told him what he said. I got on the phone with Governor Strickland, and he said he wished he had done things differently, and that he wished he fully commuted your sentence, and he wanted to help us and speak up with us. When they initially gave me clemency and sentenced me to, um, I don't like repeating those words, but to life, at the time he, he did that, I really wasn't grateful at that time because I was more, I'm like, I felt like he, it was another death sentence. Uh, but after a while, I thought about it and I was like, no, he gave me breath to fight on. So I'm grateful for that. Definitely grateful for him. Yeah. Believe me, it was election year, Kim. So you know what's going through my mind is election year. Okay. And <laughs> he had everything to lose and nothing to gain. <laughs> Granted me clemency. It took me a couple of weeks to kind of you know, really think about that and, uh, you know, appreciate that. Uh, not the life sentence, but appreciate that he did uh, because a lot of that's not going on right now, okay? Especially yeah. with political figures. So I am grateful to Mr. Strickland and um, hopefully I'll look forward to visiting him soon. I heard that might be a possibility and I'll probably yeah. be full of tears. I'll probably be full of tears. Understandable. Yeah, so... I mean, it was just like good. We, we were on a Zoom, so I was able to see his face and we connected and just hearing what he like advocates for now and how he lives his life now. It seems like this would have been such an easy decision for him. And it, it does kind of sit with him that he didn't, you know, completely commute your sentence. You know, this could be just as more about you than it is about me. And I mean that because... You happen to be one of the people that you would like to see um, those political figures be <laughs> to make those decisions. I mean, look, you could be doing a million things right now, okay? It's, but you're on the telephone with a guy who was sentenced to death for a heinous crime. I just see God in that. Every time I work on something different or even every time I talk to you, it's like so inspiring to me to want to just do more and even if I think oh my gosh like I really just need to finish school and I need to do this and 
time has become an issue of, you know, being able to help more people. It just makes me definitely not want to stop. You encourage other people and other people will make those sacrifices too because that's a sacrifice. You know, serving is a sacrifice. Yeah, hopefully that's that's what I'm that's what I'm telling you. The last couple of nights is all I've been thinking about. I've been thinking about, Lord, I know this is bigger than me. It's about Kim. It, we talked about Strickland. It's about Strickland. It's about other people out there are hearing the story and probably encouraged to get involved with mm -hmm. activism, especially during these the time phases that we live in right now. It's more important than ever. I'm so amazed by Kevin's spirit. I can only imagine what that time in prison can do to your sense of hope. And I'm here for you, Kevin. We're gonna, we're no, gonna, no. we're gonna do this. We gotta, no, no. we gotta do this. All right. Thanks, Kim. You're welcome. All right. I'll talk right, to you soon, bless. Kevin. Okay. You okay. too. Bye. Bye, bye. I do have more hope for Kevin's case now. I feel like people that are in real positions of power that have looked at all of the facts really do believe in him. And I hope that we can make a real difference. You have to think if there's a Kevin, there's thousands of Kevins out there. And that is what I want to change. I absolutely would love to do more stories in the future. I think it's really important to tell the stories of people that don't have a voice. There's another case I have in mind. We'll see. The System, The Case of Kevin Keith is a Spotify original series produced in partnership with Big City TV and Tenderfoot TV. I'm Kim Kardashian, your host and executive producer. From Big City TV, executive producer is Lori Rothschild and Saldi. From Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Lead creative producer is Meredith Stedman. Production editing and sound design by Tristan Bankston and Cameron Taggy. Production manager is Tracy Kaplan. Music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Mixed and mastered by Cooper Skinner. With additional support by Devin Johnson. Additional sound design by Cooper Skinner. Associate producer is Jamie Albright. Voiceover work by Miles Agee, Tristan Bankston, Jamie Albright, Cameron Taggy, Meredith Stedman, and Joshua Hennigan. From Spotify, executive producers are Julie McNamara and Liz Gately, with support from podcast executive Leela Benaisa. Senior program manager is Jessica Dow, with support from program associate Matt Green. Special thanks to Don Ostroff, Tracy Romulus, Christy Welder, Ollie Ailing, Travis White, and all of the cross-functional teams at Spotify that helped bring this program to life. Visit the link in our show page or in the episode description for more resources on this case. 